a dot? Well, it says live on the screen. Does it, in which case it must be true. And I've got the screen which says it's not quite live. So we have that awkward bit. What I love to do is try and edit this bit out. It's done, it's done, this is good news. So, good morning everybody. I'm gonna do very little bits of this. Um, welcome to an R Circle live stream. We're here all day. We're here from 9.15 until three o'clock. Um, why don't you introduce yourselves, Elizabeth and Jim, why I could faff about? I love it. Well, hey there, everybody. I'm really excited to greet you. I am Elizabeth uh, Lemke or Elizabeth at R Circle and uh, happy Unite Against Violence Against Women Day and Debbie Day. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Jim Barrett, or Jim B, uh, Jim at our circle. Uh, come to a number of hats, many names, many disguises as well. So yeah, <laughs> really looking forward to today. Um, I'm going to apologise, first of all, my dog is going crazy in the background here, throwing his bone around. So if uh, you hear lots of noise and jumping and barking, it's uh, it's not actually me um, at all. But yeah, thank you. Thank you to Martin as well for bringing and getting us all together. Thank you to all, uh, every, the, the guests, the hosts, the co-hosts. Uh, the people running shows and uh, everyone. Wow, from a, as you said, the Elizabeth on a post, from an idea we had to here yeah, today, uh, the day of Debbie, really. So, brilliant. Great. Martin, have you faffed around? Are you ready? Are you ready oh, yeah, we're all, I'm yeah, we're all live. I was making sure we're live. I thought you were going to do carry on seamlessly, like, you know, like a, like a poor man's um, Holly Willoughby. Um, but we'll do that in a bit. So, why don't we whisk through who we're going to see today? Because that might be really useful. So we've got us wittering for the first few minutes. And if anybody's watching live now, this is the dull bit. This isn't the real bit. This is just to make sure the thing worked. Um, <laughs> everybody needs a, sort of, a little bit of a buffer in the, in the morning. Um, awkwardly, at half past nine, we're launching with uh, Good Morning Our Circle. We still stuck with us um, for a little bit longer, but we've got some great guests. We've got Sam Warner, we've got Charlie Martin, we've got Toby Milden. Um, I know some of them are even here because Sam's actually live on the thing as well. Hi, Sam. Um, 10 o'clock, we've got uh, Vanessa Roth and Lerato. I never had to say a second name. I'm really no, apologetic. I don't want to cock it up. <laughs> Just leave it Lerato. Um, and she'll be meeting, they'll be meeting with um, Elizabeth. Yep. Um, why don't you tell me what you're doing at half past 10, Elizabeth? So I'm going to be talking with Nofar and Adva. Um, we're going to be talking about the situation of cybersecurity and the lack of women and what can we do um, once noticing that that's happening. So we're going to take us, they're going to take us through their, uh, their best practice and their next practice as to changing the situation in Israel. 11 o'clock, it's you, Jim. Who are you talking to? See, I was like right. the daytime host thing that was, wasn't it? Uh, hey, Jim, who are you seeing at 11? Well, actually, Martin, I'm glad you said that. So uh, I'm actually uh, having a chat with the fantastic Emma Freivogel and uh, Alicia Bob. Now, we're going to be talking about the work they do at Radicals, uh, Radical Recruit, um, and how they're working to place 100 candidates in 100 days, uh, working with homeless charity, St. Mongo's, and more. So, yeah, that's will be us at 11 o'clock. I think, to me, it also demonstrates the, the broad nature of today, isn't it? There's... there's, mm -hmm. there's the obvious diversity issues, but there's also some other bits and pieces which I really like about what's, uh, what's happening. Um, half past 11, we've got Theo Smith, who's going to be talking about neurodiversity at work uh, with some guests from the BBC. I'm saying the BBC. Uh, he probably teach me how to speak. Um, at 12, we're going over to Dan, who's going to have a hour-long session about uh, what's the big idea, looking at um, a true plan for diversity and inclusion for 2021. Yeah. One o'clock, we're seamlessly through technology, bouncing over to uh, Louise Triance and her uh, working lunch. Um, why mess with a good thing? Let's just go and do that. Um, we'll be back here live at 1.45 with Inclusion Through a Global Lens, and then wrapping up with a, uh, a third instalment of In Conversation um, with you, Elizabeth, at half past two. Um, those are all UK time, should anybody be watching. Um, obviously, it's available, the full rundown's on our website, rcircle.co slash Debbie. Um, we will be talking about hashtag Debbie as often as we possibly can. Um, and today is also about uh, our support for Fair Share in the UK, who are doing lots of work with um, children and families to, to make sure that people get to eat. And there's been lots of stuff in the press recently around them, around their work with um, school meals, etc. But outside of that, they've been going for a number of years trying to operate uh, a more sophisticated method of food bank, um, which actually you know, gets to the gets to the people that matter. And at some point, I'll probably press play on a on a video over there because it'll be a nice filler for everybody uh, for a couple of minutes before the um, before we go to the next thing. See what I did there. Um, 
Jim, Elizabeth, Jake, man, what, no. you talk. What are you looking forward to today? What's your favorite bit apart from the bit when I disappear at 10 o'clock? <laughs> hey, man. Um, so I am actually really looking forward today that we're changing up the conversation, that it's not just about the DNI and looking at it out of the lens of compliance, but really looking at it to say, how are we talking to one another? How are we just um, looking at changing the conversation of talking to rather than not just about? Um, and diving into a couple of very different examples as to where people saw a situation and said, okay, how can I separate myself from uh, the expectations that are being placed upon me from the outside and then finding my own voice, finding my own power as to what can I do to make things different? So we're gonna be looking at that basically through a lot of different viewpoints and different situations. And I think that that really is the beauty of Debbie is how are we looking at equity and fairness? So I'm really excited that we're coming at it from so many different angles and going away from the simple KPI and compliance type of conversation to really saying, how are we um, helping moving this ball forward? Yeah, I think the conversations you're having today, Elizabeth, and, and the guests that we got on are just just amazing. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful that mm -hmm. the cross community that we're trying to bring together, the different people from different places, um, mm -hmm. to include that equity and belonging yeah. element in, in the Debbie really will actually start to share some knowledge, um, make a difference. Um, and we all learn something. I think that's yeah. the key thing, you know, we're... We're in our little micro bubble sometimes, busy doing our own little things in our own mm -hmm. sectors. And if we can cross over those sectors and start to learn from each other, because we're all going through similar sort of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, but this big learning piece on not just the DNI bit, but the equity and belonging element to it. And as you said, Martin, bringing in other aspects, other areas that, that yeah. perhaps people haven't thought about, um, including allyship uh, yeah. and how we can work on that side as well. So, yeah, it's going to mm -hmm. be a good day. The good news is uh, people can join in. They can watch. If they're watching mm -hmm. this, they can be watching it on the live um, stream to YouTube. Um, they can, uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, you can email in. So uh, email into hello at rcircle.co. Um, with any questions you may have, there's a button on the website though to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you want to join in um, one of the panels, just pop, mm -hmm. into, pop in the button again on the website, rcircle.co slash Debbie. Um, you will be able to uh, find the link there so you can join actually live and in the room. Um, obviously some of the shows that works really well with Jim, because he loves having loads of people on the screen and other people that won't work at all and they don't want to see you. Uh, but, hey it's now. To, <laughs> but it's true, <laughs> it's your opportunity to ask questions live on the thing. For me, I would just say, I would drop a comment in the on the YouTube stream uh, or I'd email a, a question in and we'll certainly pick that up. So we're here all day to do that. So why don't we do a filler, he says, hopefully. Uh, to see if this thing works and also it demonstrates a little bit of later on if we can do something later. Let me do that, everybody. Shockingly, over 2 million tonnes of food a year is wasted within the UK supply chain. Fair Share is tackling this problem in a strikingly simple way. We work with farmers, producers, distributors and retailers to save good quality fresh food from being wasted so we can get it onto people's plates instead. In practice, it's a huge logistical feat involving hundreds of volunteers working tirelessly to unload the produce, unpack and sort it at any one of our network of food warehouses across the UK. The food might be surplus, but it looks and tastes just like the food you'd eat at home. Most of it arrives well before it would have hit the supermarket shelves. Food becomes surplus for all sorts of reasons. A glut of courgettes from overproduction or a lack of demand as unpredictable weather plays its part. Incorrect packaging and labelling, wonky fruits and veg and cancelled orders. Wherever it comes from, with the support of our team of volunteers, we prioritise the incoming food, itemising it for traceability and breaking it down into smaller quantities for redistribution. Fair Share gives nearly 11,000 charities access to food, all of whom are onboarded safely and meet all food safety regulations. These charities and groups range from food banks, children's breakfast clubs and homeless centres to small local community groups. 
Not only does this food save charities thousands of pounds on their food bills, it means they can offer the people they support more fresh, healthy fruit and veg and a wider range of food in general. New innovations like the Fair Share Go app have seen direct pickups from the supermarkets, meaning perishable goods like fresh bread and fruit can quickly be redistributed. Fair Share is more than meals though. Food brings people together. It helps local organisations tackle loneliness and isolation within their communities, or help connect struggling families with the services that can support them. It's such a simple concept. Food that could have been wasted is instead used for good. So that actually worked, everybody, which is very exciting. So we'll do that again in the future. Note yeah. to self. Um, and I think it's very important to, that we said so we cover off what uh, what Fair Share are doing. So we're going to be talking about them um, every now and again. There's a boat. If you go to, um, I have to make sure I've got the right. If you go onto our website, you'll have, there's a link there where you can just mm -hmm. click the button. I think it takes you through to the donation page if you want to uh, contribute to the good work that Fair Share do. But I make it 26 past, he says awkwardly. And what Bill, day is the day? What the 25th? That doesn't line up. <laughs> actually, actually on, the, on, the, on the fair share, on the food side of things, the, the backlash that's come on recently from Sainsbury's and the adverts on Twitter, um, I mean, that's something that probably we'll be able to chatting about today, but, you know, people standing up for things and how people are still uh, horrible comments and those kind of things. I don't know whether either of you have seen that or picked it up at all. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I live in Manchester, so um, there's been quite a lot of football talk. We love a, we love a good footballer. Um, and obviously I've got kids at school as well. And you have this sort of real, real um, debate about food. I mean, so it's fo focused primarily isn't it, on, on children in school about whether mm -hmm. they should still be given free school meals if they were entitled to school meals during the holiday times. And lots of backlash, lots of resistance, wasn't there, around certainly from, from some certain banks of MPs just saying this is outrageous and we shouldn't be doing this, et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking about two pounds, I think it's two pounds 30 per child per day. Um, if you work out the big cost, it's about that much compared to what we spend on everything else. It's a tiny drop in the ocean. And of course, for some kids, that's the only hot meal they get. That's the only proper food they get in a day. So for me, it's really important that we should continue to do that. Um, Tim Marcus Rashford has done lots of really good work, hasn't he, around promoting mm -hmm. that. He's done some work. Funny enough, he opened the, the new uh, warehouse in, um, in Manchester here for their food bank. Um, and I guess for me, the fair share bit is broader than that, which is really useful as well. You know, we, we've got some... Mm -hmm. You know, difficult times. We've got a pandemic still. Um, people are finding it difficult to survive and do whatever. And so Fair Share's work has done amazing things to help people just find good food. Um, but I guess it's also the means of distribution. They've treated it like a sort of industrial level you know, distribution capability. As perhaps in the past, I've seen you know, uh, good intent, uh, mm. but without that sort of broad capability. Whereas then, you know, they've got purpose-built warehouses that look like the ones that Tesco's and Sainsbury's and all the big safe markets have got. Um, they've got delivery structures. They've got infrastructure to get things to people. Um, and I think that's really important because it keeps the supply chain good as well, doesn't it? It means that the, when the people aren't mm -hmm. receiving that slightly sort of sloppy seconds bit of old milk. It's actually, it's fresh, it's good. It's, it's arrived when it should be. So yeah, amazing, amazing work. Um, definitely there's lots of other charities out there that are doing good stuff as well so yeah and I think as you say Martin there's the, the link there if people want to donate but also they're, they're looking for volunteers and I'm sure they're yeah. always glad of help at any point any time wherever you are so um, yeah follow the link there brilliant well we are rolling in and our guests are coming in we've got one minute now before we're supposed to kick off and everyone comes in do you have we got people in the background there martin i'm not very I'm, good at multitasking and looking not, at so why don't, so, no, so here's, the, here's the deal here's a little private moment between me and jim jim you just talk and i'll bring some people I'll in talk. you bring them in and i do want to i'll introduce them as you bring them in how about that we'll do that as you bring them one in time. and on the set nice. brilliant so fantastic we should have any second charlie martin we should coming through. Charlie's coming through. There we go. Morning, Charlie. Hi. Good morning, guys. How are we doing? Very well. Charlie Martin, professional racing car driver and aiming to be the first transgender racing car driver to complete the Le Mans 24 hours. Mm, exciting. Yeah. Ooh, exactly. <laughs> we have Sam Warner joining us. Any second of two. This is, this is great. This is where it's live and you're joining people in and they're not quite ready. There we go. Morning, Sam. Ready. Ah, excellent. Sam Warner, the autistic interpreter, leveraging the talents of autistic employees. Hi, Sam. How are you? 
I'm groovy, thanks. How are you doing? Yeah, really good. And here we have Toby Milden. Morning, Hiya. Toby. Hi, Toby morning. Is, Toby is the author of Inclusive Growth, and he has a book on Amazon at the moment, and we will be getting a link to that at some point. And he also hosts his own podcast. Morning, everyone. Morning. Thank Lovely you for joining. You. Yeah, and yourselves. So kicking off this morning, we're having a little bit of a chat. We've obviously had the, the fair share chat here. And as Martin said before, it's not about us. Um, you know, we are looking at this diversity, equity, belonging and inclusion or hashtag Debbie for short, as we're calling it. Um, and our idea is really to chat to you all about that. We, we were just talking about the backlash there on uh, on, on the social media um, and on the Sainsbury's, the, the Sainsbury's advert as well that went out. Um, and Charlie, I'm going to pinpoint this to you in, in the racing car front. I'm, as a massive car fan, racing car fan, as we've had a few chats about, um, the backlash with Lewis Hamilton as well. There's been about that in, in the motorsport. Your thoughts yeah. on that? I, I, I mean, I I don't know if sometimes in motorsport um, there's a, you know, motorsport is a very traditional sport, which hasn't really changed in a lot of ways uh, in, the, in the last hundred years or so. And um, I think that certainly while we've seen other sports uh, perhaps embracing inclusion and diversity and, and these you know discussions around that and how they can become more more inclusive um, motorsport perhaps has a bit of catching up to do I think it's fair to say and mm. I know from my own personal experience that some of the negativity I've experienced has been from people saying look motorsport's about racing it's about you know this and this and you know why are you speaking about being transgender and all this thing it doesn't I don't really you know I don't care about that I don't want to hear about that if you're fast you're fast and, and I, I think on a obviously on a much wider level perhaps is an element of that 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 Lewis is is up against because people have an issue with somebody especially being so iconic Mm -hmm. uh, as, as him using their platform to do something other than go out and be a racing driver so yeah I mean it's it's, it's sad to see because we all understand the, the impact that that role models and that people can have through sport sport is something that unites us and brings us together and fundamentally yeah we love sport because of you know we support our teams we, we follow the people that we look up to but also that there's a lot of social impact and good that, and positivity that can come about through uh, through sport. And so I, I think it's sad that that people are shooting loose down for trying to, uh, you know, trying to do some good, basically. And it is a weird thing, this, this aspect of you need to stay in your lane. It's like, OK, as long as it's within that that brand or whatever we're, you're supposed to be doing, what is that kind of common culture? Like, oh, then it's fine to talk about. But as soon as it goes out to say, OK, here, what is our social impact? What is our you know, we're uh, yes, we're in sports, but we're, <laughs> we're in the world. And so how are we using um, what we're experiencing and talking about it openly? Um, is that that piece of how are we fostering connection and that that realness of it, it takes all types, it takes all different types of people. And how are we looking to that as something positive rather than, oh, you need to stay in your lane now. That 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 goes beyond what we're talking about in terms of your brand. Yeah. yeah. So I think for me it's about widening the conversation uh, mm -hmm. into inclusion because yeah. quite often I think some people get um, get the wrong end of the stick quite frankly so you have somebody high profile like Lewis Hamilton talking about diversity and in his case you know it's it's within motorsport and I think it's great that he's using that platform you know we need high profile people to to, to get the message out but I think what often gets missed out is the conversation around inclusion because I think so, there are some people in the world that find diversity um, uh, a, a fearful factor because it really is kind of highlighting differences. Now, mm -hmm. you know, we all know that difference is a good thing that, uh, you know, it helps um, build high performing teams um, by having, you know, different perspectives, lived experiences, backgrounds, all that kind of thing. Um, but actually one thing that we need to be focusing on as well is the inclusion side of mm -hmm. the DNEI. Um, 
so and I always like to link it back to kind of what is the core essence of a particular organization so in the in the in the case of motorsport or you know formula one it's it's about having high performing teams Mm -hmm. to to win um and you get high performing teams by being more inclusive so you know that that that's the kind of the quote-unquote business case for that particular industry there's also a deep layer of ego um, yeah being ruffled yeah and nobody likes that (laughs) (laughs) And for all those people who are not particularly self-aware, they won't understand why their feathers are being ruffled. They'll just have a feeling, an emotion, a gut reaction to it instead of analysing it and thinking about why am I reacting like this? Is this rational? Is this, Mm -hmm. no, is this really me? Do I want to be that person? But so many people don't question, they don't reflect, they just exist. So Mm. helping our people to stop existing and start living and thinking is what we do. I couldn't agree more. And I think that that's, that's beautiful. And it it goes back into what Charlie was saying is, you know, like, I, I'm not interested that you, you live your your truth and that's fine. But, you know, here we're talking about motorsport rather than saying, is it, you know, like you're saying, Sam, is it putting a mirror in to say, okay, it's not all overt. What are those subtle things and how are you, giving space that someone doesn't have to hide or code switch just because you don't want to deal with the situation to say okay here that plurality that diversity that inclusivity as to how are we even just taking the time to understand the different perspectives absolutely even just those three letters blm can Mm. spark such ferocious arguments people falling out blocking each other on the internet yeah and you think, do you know what? We can all have an opinion and we can all disagree and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's part of that, that aspect of how am I learning? You don't have to know. It's that how are you going into a learning that you're curious and want to know? And it's not an affront that you, know, you don't know and it's a block. It's that, okay, you may not be aware. How can we learn? Yeah, and people do like the whole sense of that staying in your lane or stay mm-hmm. in your box as I describe um, to lots of people who, who can't quite grasp the concept because it's a bit abstract. And it's humans like to put people in a box or a lane because then I know what to do with you. I know how to talk to you. I know what language I might use, how to behave with you. And that's comfortable. That's not mm-hmm. a discomfort. But mm-hmm. as soon as someone gets out of their lane or box, oh, I'm not really sure what to do with you now. You've become something different. So how because I don't know how to operate with you I want you to get back in your lane or back in your box so I can get back into my comfort zone it's really fascinating I think it's one thing one reason that illustrates perfectly why it's so important to 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 constantly challenge uh, our own perceptions our own ideas uh, and, and not like say always be open to yeah to other viewpoints and just never think never think that because I'm here and this is this is where I'm happy that that you know tomorrow I'm not going to have some experience that's going to completely shift my whole viewpoint and and you know just just admit it or, or just suddenly thinking oh actually I was really wrong about that and you know I've changed my changed my mind it's it's uh it's just so so important that we have that self awareness mm-hmm. and open to uh, to challenge challenge our own belief systems. I think, uh, and not I to say, to, yeah, not to say, oh, I think everything I know could be wrong, but but just to be <laughs> open to, to, to yeah. those other right. those other point opinions. And yeah, if you, if you if you see toddlers playing, you're so right, Charlie, because yeah. toddlers when they're very little, before they've had influence of school, <laughs> say. Um, they're in that zone of constantly being curious they mm-hmm. have that childlike wonder they're not mm-hmm. afraid to make mistakes you know if they say something wrong and a child says oh that made me cry oh sorry i won't do that again then and that's it it's done <laughs> but they've learned something there's no kind of grudge felt for the next 45 years it's, it's, it's really simple layers yeah. and somehow we lose that and i, I i'd love to I don't know, there's a lovely big study there waiting to be done where we could explore where that switch gets flipped. Um, I'm sure I read at the same time. I'm sure I read something that is it by the time 
I can't remember if it was to do with learning new things, but when you reach, I, I think at some stage in your 30s or when you're approaching 40, that, that they found that in terms of the ways our brains develop and, and absorb new information and learn new skills, that there's a, there's a kind of marked shift around that point. And, and, it, and in terms of attitudes uh, to, to new things, concepts as well, you, you could clearly imagine that there's some correlation between people saying well actually you know a point in their life where they're suddenly like no I feel like I I know what I know now and I'm I'm just right (laughs) I I think you're right Charlie but and I think what's concerning is it it happens on such an unconscious level Mm, so you know we know we know the impact of unconscious bias on our decision making and how that's hugely influenced by the the way that our brains are wired, which we have very little control over, or it takes a lot of practice to basically create some new neural pathways in our brain. Um, And also how much we're influenced by social conditioning, stuff Mm -hmm. that we see on TV growing up that just goes into our, you know, retinal nervous system straight into the back of our brain Mm. and is hugely influential on how we interact with other people and and how we kind of make decisions. Um, So, and it's really interesting that when you look at the qualities of an inclusive leader, Mm -hmm. you know, Sam mentioned um, curiosity. I think those, those are one of the traits of an inclusive leader, somebody who is um, curious about your background, about your strengths, uh, about what makes you, what keep, makes you motivated, what makes you tick. Yeah. Um, and we have to, I think it's almost like inclusive leaders have to be a bit childlike perhaps. You know, they maybe they need to go back to their seven year old self when they were playing with kids in the, in the sandpit, you know, to be, to be more inclusive leaders within the adult workplace. Oh yeah, how many people have been in a situation where there's been an assumption made? I mean, crikey! When I worked in corporate, it was about twenty-five times a day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And those are the ones that you're aware about. You know, think about all of the ones you know that you're not aware about because it's on it's your other than conscious self that that's kind of uh, that's receiving those stereotypes. Well, and it's, it goes back to, you know, when we go into situations, what's that social judgment of, can I trust you? And then um, can I respect you? Or do you have credibility? And quite often when we go into a situation, we know our intentions and we just go immediately into the credibility aspect rather than saying, how are we, you know, in order to actually be trusted and be able to get into a relationship, you have to start with that warmth. You have to start with the, how am I getting to know you as a person, like you said, with the, with the curiosity and not assuming just because you look like X, Y, Z, or you went to school PQD, that this is what it says about you, but to, to say, okay, let's, um, let's dispend those assumptions and actually go in and have a conversation with someone and get to know them and who they are in their experiences, that that is in no way a judgment as to who you are. And I think that going into that space and entering into that world of someone else is so important as we look to not all experiences have to be the same. And that is a good thing. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So as we look to, you know, um, broadening the, you know, the diversity, I think it's really good to say, okay, going away from just the KPI discussion which I think has been so limiting where we're talking about each other as if we're in a zoo or this group and that group, Um, it divides us more than it does to say, okay, how are we coming together? What's that inclusivity about being inclusive? And then also being included. How am I finding my own voice? How am I, you know, articulating and taking the time to do my own self work to understand how do I want to show up and what do, what do I need? And quite often we talk about the environments or the, the larger macro scale things when quite often that, that self work as to how am I stepping up for myself and understanding who I am first that that's also a really important part of this discussion and so creating the norms creating you know the Lewis Hamiltons the the Charlies the Sams the Tobies to talk about it and to show that there are different ways of being is huge because it also enters into that 
here, how are you seeing yourself and showing up for yourself as to who you are? And, and traditionally, people aren't very good at asking for what they want, unless they come from Scandinavia or Germany. <laughs> um, or maybe South Africa as well. Um, all the sort of Germanic countries. Uh, they don't have, seem to have any trouble at all at saying, I want this. <laughs> Um, but particularly in Britain, we're a rubbish at it. <laughs> it's like a mountain of fluff before we actually get down to asking for what we want, if we ever do. Um, and, and that lack of directness, um, mm -hmm. means that we, this wool lives in our head sometimes mm -hmm. and we're unable to get that right. But is it any wonder because the messages we get yeah. as we're growing up are so mixed? School, sit down, shut up and do as you're told. Mm -hmm. university now you're supposed to immediately behave like an adult and call the lecturers by their first name huh uh what but i've just come from sit down shut up and do as you're told and then when i go into a, a working environment wherever that is let's call it an office for the sake of argument i'm now told i need to stand up speak up and show my initiative which is the opposite of what school trained me to do yeah. so but you still want me to tow the political line play the game you still want me to be the corporate robot and know my place and not get ideas above my station and not get an mm -hmm. idea that's better than yours because you're my leader and I'm showing you up so it's uh, yeah. <laughs> so many mixed messages going on how can we realistically step up and go do you know what I want this <laughs> yeah it's really interesting point I, I'm glad you so well eloquently put it that way Sam I never really thought about how I suppose like the transition from you know school to university to adulthood and when we look at what makes an inclusive culture one of the key things that we need to look at is empowerment and it just struck me that when if, if school is um sit down shut up and read your book um that's not particularly empowering is it and so actually if we're not training kids at a young age if we're not empowering kids at a young age of course they're going to have difficulty to to create as a leader in an organization to create that empowering culture for other people in the organization which is more inclusive mm -hmm. yeah and i think that that whole thing that we're talking about here you know having a childish mind empowering people mm -hmm. you know and the learning that we're going through relates to the fact as you as you grow up and you're in situations and when in your heart of hearts you see something that isn't right and you want to be an ally and stand up for it, you're looking around the room and people are fearful. I think, Toby, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, earlier, people are fearful to say something. People are fearful to challenge what they see and feel is wrong, mm -hmm. but everyone around them feels it's the normality to do. Do you, do you know? I think that, and that, that kicks in at age 14. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that fear goes back to something quite primal, actually, because um, in my experience, um, sort of my personal experience is that people are afraid of saying or doing something that might make them look stupid. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair and people are quite anxious around dealing with me. I think it goes back to Sam's point about, you know, what's what, what lane are you in? And it's like, you know, what language do you use around disability? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I say something that might offend or upset him, it's going to look, reflect badly on me. And I think that kind of primal fear mm -hmm. is um, really driving behavior in the workplace. And some of the most inclusive managers that I've worked with personally have been the ones that have not be, that have been unafraid to have that conversation with me, mm -hmm. to go, I might get it wrong, but you know, what is it like being a bloke in a wheelchair? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and also looking at the intersectionality of things as well. Mm -hmm. But what is it like being a gay bloke in a wheelchair? Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, well, actually, don't get me started on that. But I can tell you about how inaccessible, you know, the, the LGBT scene in London is, for example, how the majority of, um, you know, clubs in Soho are not wheelchair accessible. So then we get into a really interesting conversation about the intersectionality between something like disability mm -hmm. and sexuality or you know race and mm -hmm. sexuality or all sorts of things. I think that's such a good point as well, Toby, that um, and something that I've encountered a lot continually as well, going into organizations and, uh, and speaking, um, I think people so, so frequently are, are afraid of, of making mistakes Mm -hmm. and causing offense that that it can really create a kind of a kind of paralysis sometimes in terms mm -hmm. of people's own um 
yeah, they, 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 there's opportunities. I always think, you know, my experience going through transition was that the vast majority of people I met had never met anyone who was transgender or never knowingly met anyone who was transgender. And so it was so new to them. <clears throat> and that th more often than not, people were, from a, a kind point of view, fundamentally, afraid of saying the wrong thing and causing mm -hmm. offence. And so people often said nothing, which yeah. I think, Sam, you know, it's getting back to your point of, of English people not being so direct and just the way we are culturally. Mm. But um, unfortunately, that can really stunt sort of progress and, yeah. and, and moving things forwards, because if you're not having those conversations, people do need to be brave. And, and I mean, equally, you know, just because I feel very confident talking about my own experiences of, of being LGBTQ, there's a lot of other nuanced areas around diversity that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert on. And I sometimes have the same problems where I trip myself up, but I would always try and learn from my own experiences and use that as an opportunity to think, well, I would always prefer someone to ask me a question, even if it's a really silly question or they use the wrong terminology, because providing the intention is good. It's an opportunity to to maybe you know to start to open a dialogue mm -hmm. which is which is point number one and mm -hmm. point number two is to you know to to improve and further their their understanding of what they're trying to learn about so it's uh, it's just critical that people do take those first steps and don't hang back because otherwise then you interpret it's very easy to interpret that as as passive aggressive behavior mm -hmm. when you're on the receiving end of that it's it's not so fun really i mean it's yeah yeah, it does. It does certainly stunt progress. Or, and my experience is that people do some really daft things. So, like, people have like patted me on the head like a dog. Now, if anyone pats me on the head, I just bark back. By the way, um, <laughs> very good response. Very appropriate response. <laughs> That's the only the response I can think about. <laughs> but you know, people do those daft things. Um, yeah. So it's either paralysis or end up doing some daft things. Oh, yeah, and crazy. I, I've noticed that when I reveal that I'm autistic to people, mm. the, the mood changes in the room. It's like, you know, like when people talk about a ghost coming into the room and it goes cold. It's not quite a heat thing, but the mood <laughs> changes in the room completely because mm. all the people over 30 are thinking, oh, my God, Rain Man's here. Mm. And the, all the people under 30 are going, cool, someone who's a bit different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's yeah. this dichotomy going on. <laughs> yeah. It's all those microaggressions that can build up over time and really impact the the person on the receiving end of it and then you end up questioning yourself it's like mm -hmm. well maybe it is something to do with me maybe I'm the one that has to change in order to fit in um and then that you know if you allow that to happen in an organization it really harms the culture of the business exactly well, and I think, you know, you, you brought up a really important point is you're dealing with the people's assumptions of what do they know about that of, you know, here, okay, this is cool. This is how we've been raised. So the socialization aspect, rather than saying, okay, how are we going into curiosity out of a, um, an honest point of view is we are we are colored, so to speak, in our frames of thinking by, you know, what's that little tidbit? What's that shemata that I can know? What's that, that little bit about that box that I'm aware of so I can start to put it in there rather than saying, okay, um, this is Sam. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're meeting Sam. Sam had told us something. How are we going into a conversation about that? And, and kind of releasing ourselves from those little boxes that our shematas are trying to build and, and go into those experiences of meeting someone. Because Sam, you, you go into businesses, your role is to go actually into a business and um, <laughs> enlighten them um, <laughs> and I'll say educate them probably on, on, on the situations and, and around working with autistic individuals. And it's predominantly in the IT sector. That, that can be challenging, I'm sure, um, at times. Oh, absolutely. And, and the age thing wasn't a joke earlier. So when you've got people who are over the age of 30, 35, um, most, I shall generalise here, most have a very set idea of what they think an autistic person is. And mm -hmm. if I had a pound for every time someone said, oh, you don't look autistic, uh, I'd be quite wealthy. And, <laughs> and, and oh, the, other, the other response is, oh yes, I've got a cousin or a nephew or something, or I've got a friend who's got an autistic son or something like that. And I'm like, that's nice. <laughs> that's another different person to me. We're just all different. 
Mm. People who are not autistic wouldn't like us to lump them in a big old box and go, look, you're all the same. So why would they do it to us? It's just mm. not gonna work. No. Um, the, 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 the exercise of getting together, again, traditionally training is done to the team. Mm -hmm. you know the the team leader or manager will say my team needs to be trained on x mm -hmm. and I say no 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 team leader you have to be in the training as well yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can't carry on with the stereotypical behavior you have to come along for the ride <laughs> and yeah. that's what I'm trying to change so that the whole team evolves together so it's, it's important. And it's, it, I think that goes to a lot of things that it has to be, you talk about inclusion, it has to be the whole company. You know, there's no one bit of the company yeah, that, that yeah. can work because you've got the yeah. whole company and the whole company culture and the culture ad that you want to do to that company and, and make a change. It can't be just one person shouting in, in, a, in a business. They need that support all the way through. Toby. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Toby. Go. I was going to say, yeah, you're right. You're right, Jim. It has to be in the culture and the processes and systems. So, yeah. organizations often when they start looking at diversity and inclusion um, or frankly they've been doing it for a while um, but they've picked up bad habits um, the, the their approach is to fix individuals um, so it's like you know they, they look at something like okay so we don't have enough women working in our technology department for example so what we're going to do is we're going to create this career development program for women and it's going to be about boosting their confidence uh, you know opening up a net mentoring network and sponsorship and stuff like that and it's actually no it's, it's no that's not you don't need to fix the women <laughs> to get mm. into the technology what you do need to do is look at the the business processes that are preventing people from getting through or slowing them down. Um, so for example, if you've got a recruitment process that insists on having face-to-face -face interviews, now somebody who's autistic might struggle with doing a face-to-face -face interview. Yeah. Now, perhaps there's a, a, another better way of assessing their ability to do a task or a job. So be flexible, you know, flex your recruitment process. And, and then what, once you've looked at the kind of processes and systems, it's about looking at the culture. Mm -hmm. How do people feel when they show up to work in the morning? Mm -hmm. Do they feel like they really belong to the organization? That if mm -hmm. they choose to, they can they can express as much as themselves as they want to. Um, and they see themselves sticking around in the long run. Yeah. Or are they looking for the exit? Mm -hmm. So those are the key levers that an organization needs to focus on. Not this kind of tokenistic, short-term... Um, tactical stuff that organizations often kind of put in as a knee-jerk reaction it's like oh you know uh you know a couple of months ago it was it was all about black lives matter and it was about uh, you know a knee-jerk reaction to what was going on rather than something that's really systemic yes, and, and long long lasting yeah and, and there's something about a couple of steps back from all that toby said which is absolutely nailed um and it that's the advert in the paper or online advertising the job because mm -hmm. as soon as someone writes an advert <clears throat> it will have a male or a female flavor it is mm -hmm. traditionally it will and it might be because of the person writing it or the type of person they think they're looking for they imagine in that role mm -hmm. but also if they put something on there like must have a minimum of two years experience then most women if they've got 23 months experience won't respond because they don't have 24 months experience which is what was asked for and autistic people will often take that very literally and go I don't fit the bill I'm, I don't have that requirement mm. so you've now excluded <laughs> autistic people and women <laughs> so now you're just going to get guys <laughs> apply for that job which is if that's what you wanted you well done <laughs> that's what you're gonna get but also okay. I don't think positive discrimination is the way to do it either it's about how do you make it completely neutral? Mm. I'm looking for a human being that satisfies these things. Exactly. Neutral and welcoming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Open, open, open and inclusive as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. guys, this is amazing. Qu quickly, because I think we're coming, we're getting close to time, Martin here. So um, Toby, you've got a, a book out on Amazon at the moment. We'll get the links to share on that shortly we'll get the links sam for you on linkedin about how you can uh, interpret the the place for inclusion uh, for autistic individuals charlie you're uh, got a new racing season coming up as well um so we'll get the links and supports on that as well so yeah, we are really looking forward to to that um 
mine. I think we're coming up 10 o'clock to the next. What a marvellous thing then. And so this is my entire job. This is the last you'll see of me all day, which is a lovely, lovely thing. Deliberately quiet. Um, thank you, uh, everybody, for, uh, for joining us today. We're going to move over seamlessly by, by dropping the three people off and Jim. And then Elizabeth is going to take over. We've got Lorato and we've got uh, Vanessa waiting in the wings. Um, so thank you, everybody, for this section. And uh, we'll move seamlessly on. So let's see if I can be a magic, magic thing. Jim, Phil, uh, sing, dance, do something. So, <laughs> thank you, everyone. And good luck Bye. in the months. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Always. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, Martin. Thanks. Right, good right, luck, thank Elizabeth. You. Uh, Chat you soon. Pendy. Oh, to that look at that seamless Brilliant. seamless right it's like a proper it's it's like we're on this morning and it, it's you not, know is it, though? it lacks something it needs, <laughs> it needs to be expert somewhere and it needs um we need a prize where you could win a million pounds and if and if you text in uh, a text that cost you 15 um yeah can... i think we can do that text to vote well actually to go straight on and donate to uh mm. to, to fesher i think that's the thing to do i'm going to drop off here guys i will see you all at 11 o'clock uh, elizabeth good luck i'll be listening in the background um mm -hmm. hi to everyone just joining um we'll see you soon all right hey, hey so hey. wonderful to see you my dear good morning good morning likewise good morning <laughs> i love it hey vanessa Yay. good morning how's everyone excellent so good to see you so good to see you thank so you good to be here so before we get kicked off, so this is a total commitment of the wonderfulness that these two ladies are. So Vanessa is um, moving her parents today. <laughs> <laughs> so I do apologize. My hair is tied up. I have managed to put on a fresh t-shirt and all of those things. It's 32 degrees here. It's like the hottest day of the year to be moving my parents uh, who, shame, are in their mid-70s and can't pick up a box. So my brother and I and our partners are grafting hard. I love well it. Well done, Brad. Well done. Thank you. Exactly. Hi, Lorato. Very well. You, my friend. Good, good. Nice to see you, buddy. Likewise. So I am so excited. So these two lovely ladies, um, I met um, Vanessa. We've been in this weird kind of circle of uh, recruitment and sourcing and talent acquisition because that's the group that randomly adopted me, Elizabeth. And uh, we have a common friend, um, Sophia. And she said, after sort, um, you guys were in Seattle, sort of, like, you have to meet Vanessa. There's no two words about it. You have to meet Vanessa. And so since then, she has been my sister in another country and we cannot believe that we've never met face to face. Unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> but it, uh, it has been that, that magic. And, um, and then Vanessa was speaking at our l and Cares Career Growth Summit and uh, was talking about her experience. And then also at the Sourcing Summit talked about here the, the uh, sourcing and diversity and mentioned one of her really, really good friends, Larato. And then I got the pleasure of experiencing Larato doing a keynote at the last Sourcing Summit virtual talking about her experience and her viewpoints on how she grew and creating that understanding of just because you see it is not necessarily what you believe it. And so as we were talking today as to how can we change the conversations moving forward? How can we not just say, okay, this is my assumption and this is what I believe it is. What can we do to really move the needle forward around creating a more inclusive, more belonging, more awareness around how are we being? And so that's why I was ecstatic that these two ladies said <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, against much ad adversity and, and <laughs> challenges and all of those things. But no, it's an absolute pleasure to, to be here and to, to proudly represent South Africa. I know Lorato and I are passionate about the country that we come from. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to share, sharing with you. I love it. So, and then let's dive in exactly to that because I think, you know, what's interesting about both of your keynotes. So uh, your keynote, um, Vanessa, back in July and then your keynote in um, October, they started out very similarly in terms of what is this historical context of South Africa 
and what is that South African experience? Because I think oftentimes people have assumptions about South Africa and it was interesting, both of you started with the historical kind of embedding this. So can you both perhaps talk us through as to why is it important to talk about the history of, you know, how did, what the South Africa experience journey has been and how that has also framed as we look to what your individual experience, how that's important and relevant before you even dive into the topic of how are we seeing and showing up for one another. Over to you, Lorato. You take yeah, this one exactly. away. Lorato, <laughs> so, <I just> <laughs> <you>, exactly. <laughs> All right. I think I think both both Vanessa and I, the reason we start the journey with um, kind of our our history interlaced with our stories mm. is uh, number one, we, we quite enjoy telling stories. That's the first thing. And secondly, we're quite, um, we're quite aware of the danger of a single story. Mm-hmm. So we're very much aware that through you experiencing South Africa, either through the media or having been here, you'll get a snapshot or a point in time. And this country mm-hmm. has done quite a lot in a very short space of time in terms of creating you know, harmony where there was once you know, discord mm-hmm. from a law perspective. So, uh, I mean, with her and I being friends and, and pretty much navigating the world together and experiencing it from two completely uh, different sets of eyes, it's allowed us to then be able to look at the same issue from multiple angles mm-hmm. and realize that my story does not invalidate anybody else's. Mm-hmm. So we've grown up in the same South Africa, breathing the same Johannesburg air, or she started breathing uh, KZN air, um, we, we're living in the same place and we're going through the same experiences. But because of our purview and where it is that we come mm-hmm. from, our lenses are fundamentally different. So you walk into a store, you see something, I'm going to be attracted by different things to anybody else. And I just want that to become the seminal message when we start to talk about diversity and inclusion. My perspective is influenced by how I've grown up, the messages I've received, um, I mean, I was doing another keynote mm-hmm. yesterday and I was talking about kind of the influence. Where does bias come from? It comes mm-hmm. from the stories we hear, our experiences, etc. But bias isn't necessarily always bad and it's caught a very bad mm-hmm. reputation. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just about being able to understand where I start and end and where the next person starts and ends so that we make sure that we, we don't infringe on each other's spaces and we don't invalidate each other's stories. So mine is in fact correct because it's my lived experience but anybody else's is absolutely um, correct as well and valid. So the bravery that we need to be able to have is in you know, the awareness of our own story and the comfort to be able to share it without feeling like it'll be judged or compared to or, or anything of the like. Very well said. True. Yeah. Yeah. So, so valid. So just to pick up on that is that, you know, Lorata and I had to go to the other side of the world to meet each other. We were both ended up at the same conference in Seattle. I mean, it was just crazy. Um, and uh, that's, that's where, where we met and we started, you know, forming this amazing friendship. And Lorata and I hang out a lot in South Africa and we've got a little business idea for next year. And so pretty much watch this space. But the, the sad reality of it is that, you know, me at 43, Lorato is only one is is one of my very few black friends and I want to explain to you why that is Mm -hmm. you know being born in South Africa 43 years ago I was born under the apartheid government which means that the 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 country was ruled by a handful of white gentlemen who made up the minority of the country they made up less than 10 percent of the of the entire population so they dictated things about where I could live where I could go to school I only went to school with white children only in my final year of school, when I was 17 in 1994, was the first year that people of color could be in my class at the same time as me. So there was no opportunity to mix with people of color, to you know, have friends of color. So what I've really enjoyed about getting to know Lorato better over the last two years is that we've been able to discuss our childhoods. We've been able to discuss our different perceptions. And the reason why I mentioned this, Liz, is that, you know, you, you mentioned in the beginning of the conversation is that, you know, how do we deal with inclusion and why do we need to have a history lesson? Well, you need to have a history lesson because you need to understand about our backgrounds. 
Mm-hmm. And, and that's where the difference comes in. And I am so eternally grateful to have a friend like Lorato. And as I say, we'll meet for lunch, we'll meet for dinner, we'll whatever, it's happening, we're there. And we can have these honest conversations. And I can say to her, like, seriously, why do people of color or why do black people do this? I don't understand. Is it a cultural mm-hmm. thing? And she'll say exactly mm-hmm. to me, she said, white person did this to me the other day. What does it mean? I don't understand. And for me, those conversations yeah. are so crucial to the way that we understand each other. And people, yet people are too petrified to have those mm-hmm. conversations. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, is the crux of the matter. Yeah, uh, that's so well said. I think that when we were just talking about that in the, in the opening conversation with Sam, Charlie, and Toby, is this piece of, I'm afraid to say something wrong. So this sort of like self paralysis of, you know, like I'll hold back because I don't want to step on a toe. Or or even worse, you don't want to be accused of being a racist or, you know, completely doing the wrong thing and, and, you know, offending a a whole demographic of a a nation society just because you don't know better. Mm -hmm. It, it, It is scary. Yeah. And so, and, and deal, and to say, okay, how do we proactively say, it's a curiosity. Are you approaching it? What's your attitude in terms of loving and empathy to saying, I want to understand. It's not to say coming from a place of judgment or saying, okay, okay. this is better than the other. It's really coming from a place of how, you know, what are the differences of understanding? And I'm sure quite often Morato has said, I have no idea. Or you, Vanessa, I'm like, Correct. I have no idea. No, it's true because I mean, I can't, I can't represent the whole white population and she can't represent the whole black population. Correct. Like, I wonder why this happens, but at least, at least the two of us can have those discussions. And, mm-hmm. you know, just something else that, that I wanted to talk about, Liz, is mm-hmm. I was thinking about it while I was, you know, charging back home in order to be here. Lorato and I went out for dinner probably about a month ago now. So Lorato means we do for another catch up, my friend. And mm-hmm. while we were sitting at the table, there was a, an elderly white gentleman who walked past and he looked at Lorato and he dismissed her. He then looked at me and asked me if I knew where the ATM or the bank was. Mm-hmm. And then as he walked away, Lorato and I had a conversation about what had just mm-hmm. happened. And for me, it's amazing because it's definitely a generational thing. I mm-hmm. first of all think that, you know, he, doesn't, he didn't know how to approach a black female. He was sitting at the table to maybe ask. We maybe thought that, oh, I'm going to ask the white person because I know the white person otherwise. But for me, it was just like the most bizarre situation that he looked at her, you know, almost was about to ask the question and then turned and directed the question to me. I mean, I was like, I'm going to know where the bank is probably, you know, we were in Lorato's hood. So, I mean, she's going to know more than more than (laughs) I would. But it was just a very, very bizarre situation, which I don't think would have happened if that happened to be, say, myself and my husband sitting and Mm -hmm. having dinner. And it just shows that, especially in that elder generation is that they don't have the opportunities to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. We do. And and we need to ask them. My my reaction to that was he's just looking for something that he recognizes Mm -hmm. and he wouldn't have ordinarily understood. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So he chose to go a particular way. And I think if, if I was uh, almost, uh, overly sensitive I probably would have attached much more negative connotation to that and I was quite open with Vanessa to say like I hope he doesn't think that I don't have money therefore I won't know where the ATM is I'm just hoping it's the fact that you know he's choosing something of familiarity um, because he literally looked at me as if he was just trying to flag Vanessa's attention whereas Mm -hmm. he could have asked the question and if I, if I didn't know, I would have asked Vanessa myself because I was facing him. So again, going back to this paralyzing fear, et cetera, mm-hmm. um, it actually just comes from the internal awareness that your story is not the only one that exists. So that's, when we start, that's mm-hmm. why in every single conversation that we have in keynotes, in speaking to companies, whatever, we always try and reinforce that message to say, don't think that your story is the only one that exists. And every single person needs to realize that yeah. because in sharing your story, then there is validity in it because it doesn't mm-hmm. have to represent the entire black uh, population. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to represent the entire LGBT as I was hearing in the, in the previous session. Mm-hmm. So I can speak on that. I can speak on my own lived experience yeah. and we can openly ask each other questions because another thing which I keep repeating to Vanessa is that there's no way that you'll know something if you never ask it. Precisely. Yeah. You're not going to get it by osmosis. 
Um, you know, so ask me the question. And because your intent is always good and clear and we've established that level of trust, I can then understand that there's no malice intended. Precisely. But again, there's this whole conversation around microaggressions which also came up in the previous session mm-hmm. because some people's intent isn't in fact good. Yeah. Um, when somebody says to me, especially when they say, oh my goodness, you're so articulate or you speak so well, I feel like it's an attempt to other me because what mm-hmm. they're saying is other black people don't speak this well, therefore mine is notable. Yeah. Whereas if I was making a good point, then address the fact that I'm making a good point. Oh, that's a great point. I really appreciate how you put that. And that gives me an insight that I was never aware of, as opposed to just the way that the words are coming out of my mouth. Precisely. Instead of minimizing, saying, oh, for a woman, you're articulate, or oh, that's for it. this, that, and the other thing, you know, and it's, it's weird that there's like a qualifier. It's like, why is the qualifier necessary? Yeah, so, that's right. <laughs> it, it's, why can't uh, it just be? Yeah, why can't it just be, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, I agree. <laughs> For an American, that's what I get a lot. <laughs> but it, it, it's very bizarre out of, you're outside of my stereotype. And so therefore I see you and I see the, the wealth you bring rather than, okay, why is that necessary? And you're Correct. Exactly right, you know, to say, how are we even aware of our microaggressions and that we're trying to we're trying to reinforce our own stereotype by calling attention to an exception. Correct. And, um, and as we, we look to those, and that's why I think, you know, this aspect of only looking at psychological safety of saying, okay, how is the environment? How is it? Um, For me, it's, you have to also look at the, what is the psychological bravery to, to say, okay, how are you willing to open up and saying, okay, why was that disclaimer or the disqualifier necessary? You know, to say, okay, how are we standing up for ourselves in a positive aspect? Because that can also help people kind of question and perhaps reflect a little bit differently. And as you say, each of us have our own story and oftentimes we're not aware and mm-hmm. going into different situations to say, okay, here, um, you know, um, I know where the bank ATM is, or I was trying to purchase a refrigerator and the gentleman kept talking to me rather than to my husband. I'm like, <laughs> we both cook. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> we need to put our beers somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love it. Exactly. So, but it's this weird kind of instance association bias of what is that code? What is this shamata that I have in my head as to, you know, what are those traditional roles? What are, what is my past experience? And so that's where I go into the situation. And when I'm confronted that, okay, this is not exactly in that shamata that I'm used to. What are those small pieces of familiarity that I'll connect into? Because there's a slightly more comfort level in that. And to say, okay, that might be natural on the first level, but then to open it up and say, okay, is that really necessary? What am I doing on on some of these pre-perceived notions that are limiting and put someone into a box? Yeah. Absolutely. So so there's a thing that happens um, with with minorities in general. So Mm -hmm. um, depending on what the environment is, this notion of emotional tech, yeah. And that's, that's really around constantly gearing up to protect yourself. Yeah. yeah. So if you go into a, a generally, you know, a heterosexual environment as a homosexual, you're waiting for that comment or the microaggression. Yeah. Can you imagine ever being able to bring your whole self into yeah. a workspace yeah. where you're consistently ready for a fight? And can you imagine what kind of small thing need to trigger you because you're always ready and gearing up for a fight. And this is, this is why I say creating psychological safety is on two levels, on the personal level, but Mm -hmm. it's also on the organizational level. So I don't come ready for a fight because if I'm a hammer, then everything will be a nail in front of me and I'll just go for it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's like you're waiting to be caught out and to defend yourself rather than being relaxed and saying, hey, I'm meeting up with my buddies at work and we're going to do some cool things together. It's a frame of mind. Yeah. Mm. For for me, it's, 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 um, 
you know, I, I, I am part of a minority, you know, due to from more of the neurodiversity side. I mean, I suffer from uh, severe ADHD. I, I do take a lot of Ritalin in order to be able to be this calm and be able to string a sentence together. Mm-hmm. But it's something that I found that once I embrace and I got more comfortable talking about it, I'm mm-hmm. more comfortable. So I understand what Lorato mm-hmm. is saying is that yeah. you always seem like you're on the back foot, you're waiting for the comment. I almost will just talk about it now, you know, so if mm-hmm. I know that if I'm having a bad day, my brain's working too fast, my words are not coming out and they're not sounding correct, I'll literally put my hand up and say, look, apologies, you know, this is, this is what's happening today. And I just find that, that that goes a long way in order to be able to almost like not break the ass with people, but to put them at ease too. Because yeah. as we discussed, you know, people are, are quite nervous. So I try mm-hmm. to mention these things first and foremost up front before they start thinking, oh, jeepers, you know, what's going on? Is, is she on speed or, you know, what is the, the situation that, that, that's happening? Um, that seems to work for me, but I know a lot of people are not always that comfortable with it. And a lot of people don't want to disclose, you know, about them personally. And I, and I completely get that too. So I think it goes along with having um, a lot of self-confidence in, in, in mm-hmm. the space. And also just, I mean, it's, I've dealt with it for 43 years. I've worked through it, you know, so it's, it's something that uh, comes quite naturally to me now. I don't, I don't know how you feel about that, ladies. That's quite interesting that you say you've worked through it for 43 and counting years. Um, and I found this, uh, probably the, the, the clearest it ever became was when I was starting to be quite confident and comfortable in myself. Mm-hmm. And I was quite, I was then becoming open with regards to my sexuality mm-hmm. because there was work functions galore and I used to rock up alone because I didn't want to have to answer the questions, et cetera, et cetera. But I started saying that, you know, if I, if, if anybody's brave enough to ask the question, mm-hmm. then I'm going to commit to being brave enough to answer openly oh, and honestly. That's beautiful. Um, that's, a, that's a good way. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, 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 and then the second thing is if anybody had an adverse reaction to that, I would come back to the point that you just made, Van, to say, well, I've been dealing it for a few years now and I've been trying to come to terms with it. How can I expect you within 15 seconds of hearing it to then be able to snap Absolutely. into it quite constantly and move mm. on. Yes. But I'm not excusing the mm-hmm. biggest, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just saying if somebody's having a genuine, I, you know, I had no idea now I, I, it's exposing all the curiosity that I have. Can I ask a question? You know, how does it work? Uh, and having, you know, just come from, you know, uh, having a, this beautiful baby bouncing girl, uh, people are now, can I ask a question I've been dying to ask and I've not, mm-hmm. I've not had anybody close enough to me that I could be open and honest with and expose my, my own ignorance. You, I know, you answer the question with care. Yeah. So it's about then, you know, I, I, I can only look at my, my own sphere of control. So the people that I've, you know, you build the trust with and you build the bravery with, those are the people that you can approach and be able to, to share openly. But yeah, it all has to do with bravery. Your own to be able to Absolutely. come to me and my own to be able yeah. to, to answer or humbly decline answering because I'm not comfortable. You know, because not, I mean, it's not going to be every time that I'm asked, I then just go into a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Let's find a seat. Yeah, absolutely. Here's a whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> you it out of your self care moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. People start glazing over soon and start looking for the box. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, uh, yeah, but, but that's so well said because it is that aspect of you know how are we showing up for ourselves and how are we accepting ourselves and I think it is a huge part of confidence because as we grow up there is that aspect of how do I fit in how you know the you know what's you know the socialization process of this is what I'm exposed to this is what I experience these are the messages that I hear and what I'm and at some point and this is you know in the teenagers in particular that's when I break away and I start to ask more questions go deeper what are my values i think you know as we go away to college you're saying you know that first experience your first job you're learning so much about yourself outside of the environment that you grew up into and so as and that doesn't stop just because we're no longer going to school it's that every situation that we come into Mm. it's another opportunity to say 
opening but but is this not something that happens your whole life hey Liz to be honest like I mean it's something that doesn't stop I look at my parents now in their mid-70s and my mom actually just said to me this morning I don't know what I would do without you children like I'm so lost you know Mm -hmm. and she's really had to face you know the thoughts now that um she's not as physically capable to be able to do things Mm -hmm. and organizationally so she's now like depending on on us and I feel like you know I'm the parent but it's so interesting because she's just got to that stage of her life where you know things are starting to change it's it's so interesting that you just raised it now yeah absolutely and I think that aspect of being aware that how do we unlearn some of our assumptions yeah. of what is oh, so key yeah so yeah. key yeah and so so key. Key. i mean i always mm. i always liken it to say having a jug of water you can't put more water in unless some water comes out <laughs> yeah you know yeah. i'm not gonna yeah. ask for a refill with my glass at all yeah. so i'm gonna gulp it down and then I can ask for a refund. Oh, and she does. <laughs> exactly. She does. Exactly. <laughs> I'm totally with you, Lorado. I'm no, like, I'm okay. constantly like, okay, when's that person coming back? <laughs> exactly. So, so I mean, it's it's the same with learning. Um, mm-hmm. If you completely close yourself off and you consider your glass perpetually full, then there's no way that you'll invite people for for you know open and honest discussions or even create opportunities for yourself to learn and grow. You know, so, um, yeah, here are some lessons from drinks. Exactly. <laughs> lessons from drinks. I love it. Well, and I think, you know, here, as we, as we continue to learn and grow, and Vanessa, you said this at the beginning, that you guys have a little bit of an inception of an idea. So I want to, like, <laughs> uh, take the opportunity and say, okay, what's, what's, the, what's the inception of the idea you ladies partnering together to bring something different to the Oh, I think we've. Li- oh, is Liz yeah, or Liz back? There we are. So let's 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 take it from here while Liz is frozen. So yeah. pretty much, Lorato and I have been in in conversation. As you hear, we we catch up quite often, and I just think that if the two of us were, you know, to get together and we've discussed this at length, uh, to look at you know working with uh, big corporates, talking about diversity and inclusion. You know, especially tackling the South African or the African market, because I come from a very different perspective. We've discussed our childhoods a bit. Lorato comes from a different perspective, mm-hmm. is that it will hopefully appeal to more people in the room to have open and honest conversations, because Lorato and I can have those conversations and we can have them in front of an, of an audience. And hopefully this will encourage people to do the same. Lorato, what do you think? Yeah, I think, um, as I totally agree, um, the, the aspect that we want to also tug on quite a bit is just the notion of here are people who look different from each other mm-hmm. and one will look like me and the other is different, but look at them able to have created the space. Yeah. So we want people to be able to find themselves in us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, we're also looking forward to also the dynamic of people finding themselves in the person that they didn't anticipate to find themselves in because diversity sits more than just kind of the identity components like I've discussed. There's the cognitive ones, there's the the, the neurodiversity components. So somebody might think, oh, there's Rato, she's a black female, I'm a black female, so I identify with her. And then they hear something from Vanessa that resonates with them actually a lot more. And now they'll sit back and be like, well, hang on, what's going on with me? And that, mm-hmm. that's kind of the joy that we want to unleash uh, within people to say, what brings us together is infinitely stronger than our differences, whether that differences are on the outside or on the inside. You know, so, uh, so that, that's kind of the angle that we're going for, just be able to create spaces for people to be able to have conversations and then also help them to remediate. So if there is a culture issue, what are the steps that they should be going through in terms of being able to to come back? So that's that's about the idea in the nutshell. Awesome. So I just want to point out that it wasn't the two people that are presenting from third world South Africa who've had data and connection (laughs) issues today. It was the the ladies that have stood God. (laughs) For a change, (laughs) infrastructure's like, you know, it's it's run a little bit of coppery, wiry, whatever. So I just thought I'd better stick my face in there. I mean, actually, as luck would have it, and it's it's about time, isn't it? Um, it is. This is it where is we're really going to wing it because if she's not back for the next session, which has also got Elizabeth in it, it's going to be really awkward. 
It um, is, it is. But you've got Nafar, so I mean that's great. Nafar will just carry your conversation at any oh, given yeah. moment. Uh, she's wonderful. Yeah, let's, let's assume we that she's going to be on the line. Above. Let's assume that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, Excellent. I think I can't remember if I ever said this, Vanessa. I uh, I was born in Hillbrow. Uh, in Johannesburg, and, and you can tell that by my accent. So obviously, every, I related to everything you said. Wow. Um, going, oh, yes, yes that's, I understand that. I don't remember any of it, of course, clearly. Um, wow. I think Excellent. we're there, aren't we? With the, with the, was that, is that a lovely point to finish, or was that a bit awkward? That's a, that, that's a lovely point. That's so I'm going to start a love and leave you, because I need to go and finish unpacking boxes yes, now. Yes, exactly. Finish <laughs> I want to just thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. It's been fantastic. And as you say, demonstrates so. that, 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 um, that you can be, well, you're six and a half thousand miles away from me. Um, six and a half thousand miles away from Elizabeth, but it's actually Elizabeth's bit of string that's fallen apart. So, um, yeah, I think I so it's, what I'm going to do is slickly move awesome. you into the attendees bit. Um, if you disappear, you disappear. But Thank you so much. Uh, cheers, man. Cheers, 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 bye. Cheers, bye. Bye, bye. bye. And look at that. There we go. Oh, there we go. So, obviously, if you're joining us now live, you'll realize that I'm not Elizabeth. Um, which is the, the power of, of the internet. Um, I am going to bring on our next guest and I'm going to wing it. So I'm reliably informed uh, based on um, Vanessa that it's going to be okay and that they're going to be um, uh, really good stories. Um, let me bring in our next two guests and uh, we'll take it from there. Let's do that. And let's do that and Elizabeth's back. Look at you yeah. there, you cheeky thing. You, you, just wanted to, you wanted to see if I was actually listening. They're awkward. I, luckily, I just finished my piece of toast. Um, Love it. Otherwise, it would have been uh, been really, really awful. Let me think. Think. Hello, Nafar. So lovely to see you, my dear. I'm so glad to see you unfroze. I know. <laughs> For the occasion. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with our Wi-Fi in like a major metropolitan area in Germany. I mean, why would we need stable Wi-Fi? <laughs> why would anyone, right? Uh. Exactly. So, so hi. Hi, Edva. Hey, Edva. <laughs> hi, hello. Hello. So wonderful to have you two ladies here. So I am excited. Hi, I'm Liz Lemke. Welcome to our circle. So I am joined today by my uh, good friend Nofar and um, Atva, who are going to be talking us through uh, a little bit about their experiences as to um, seeing a situation, experiencing a situation, and then saying, okay, this is not good. What can we do to proactively change this? And so I would like you two to please just kind of shortly introduce yourselves as to um, who you are and, uh, and uh, what are you doing here in terms of a topic? Okay, um, I'll start. Uh, so I'm coming from the realm of uh, recruitment. I'm uh, far located in Israel, but working uh, kind of globally. Um, I've been recruiting for years now. I'm not gonna go into that, but I'm gonna <laughs> put it in context uh, uh, in, in a minute. Uh, so I've been recruiting for R&D and cybersecurity. Uh, I've been a freelance. I'm working with this really great Ukrainian company, Matcher. Um, but I've also been recruiting for the cybersecurity um, industry, mainly in Israel. Um, and well, uh, along the way, you know, there are many challenges in, in uh, recruiting anyway. But one of the biggest one has always been um, finding, uh, finding women candidates. Even if yeah. there isn't that, you know, the, the, the employer usually doesn't even say it, you know, it's not even politically correct to say, you know, I want a woman for this role, although some do. Uh, but even, even if you do want to recruit women, you hardly find uh, the number of candidates. And once you do, and you start interviewing, you reveal a lot more than you, than you thought. Um, and this we'll go into in a second. Um, but yeah, bottom line, I'm here as a recruiter in cybersecurity. And, you know, I'll tell you more in a second. Uh, let my friend Adva take it from here. Right. All right. Well, Adva is so excited to have you here. So welcome. And um, we just um, want Thank to you. get to know you and to know a little bit of your perspective of how are you coming into this conversation of seeing a situation and saying, what can we do to change this? 
Uh, so first, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Um, so I've been working in cybersecurity for three years now. Um, started as a SOC analyst, um, currently working for an American company. Mm -hmm. And since I got started in cybersecurity, I kind of um, got always those little people that you're a woman. That's very unusual to see you here. Mm -hmm. um, always felt like a little bit of a minority, you might say, in the, and got those annoying little every now and then, sarcastic comments from people. And it's always kind of bugged me a little bit, uh, but nothing that I've ever done. You know, it's kind of like some things you say, well, you know, it is what it is, and we just accept it. Mm -hmm. um, it's growing me, and, and as I grow, um, a bit more mature, I, I started saying to myself, why is it like that? Why is it the way that it is and just accept it? Why not try to do something about it? Um, so yeah, so I just started talking with Nofa one day and you know, we both started, what sparked a small conversation, uh, started this uh, great, amazing project that we've been working on that uh, we'll be happy to tell you in a little bit about. I love it. Oh, so excited. And I think, you know, what you said was a, was a great kind of insight to say, okay, here, there are these little like side nudges of, you know, here, what's going on? Why are you different? Um, and, and just kind of taking it on the chin um, until at some point, it's like the, 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 the glass becomes so full of these little side nudges. It's like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> There's plenty to drink here. There's some more people who could be sipping some good tea that we can change the situation. So can you ladies and perhaps Nofar, you, you two were working together to say, okay, we have a, a cyber recruiting role mission and we're noticing, okay, there's these little side nudges as to what are you doing here as a woman um, that you ladies said, okay, all right, let's take these nudges and make them into a different proactive kind of approach. Yeah. Take me through. Um, so it wasn't even just the, the numbers or the mm -hmm. uniqueness of seeing a woman in a team. Um, we've actually, both of us been interviewing. We're actually uh, trying to recruit together for a role. Uh, this is how we got the conversation going. Mm -hmm. And we started sharing, you know, Adva with her experiences. Uh, and I, I've been talking to women candidates you know, mm -hmm. why are you leaving? You know, it's one of the questions you ask as a yeah. recruiter. Mm -hmm. Why Why are you uh, currently searching for a new job? And the stories were unbelievably painful. I mean, uh, women that are already in a team uh, have been experiencing, uh, you know, they've been talked down to, they've been uh, ignored. They've been, uh, some women just, uh, you know, got requests for being a woman, a woman, you know, serve tea, serve, uh, service food and like really extreme stuff that you really don't you don't expect to find in such high quality companies you know yeah. it's not uh it's, it's very unusual you won't see it in an r&d team you won't see it in marketing uh and these are the kind of stories that got to both our tables you know mm -hmm. advise somebody from the inside and for me just talking to candidates that you know get me out of here get me a new position yeah. because this team is is not for me i want somewhere to feel like i belong yeah. Uh, so we figured it's not just about spreading the news, you know, get women into cyber. It's also about connecting the ones that are already in the industry to know mm -hmm. that they, they belong. Yeah. And if their team doesn't acknowledge it, then you, you belong to this big group called women in cyber security in Israel. And, uh, and this is how the idea started. This is a, has been a dream of Adva for a while. And I'll, I'll let you tell about it because <laughs> this is nothing new. It's, it's her dream. <laughs> Love it. Tell us about your dream. Um, Love it. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of been um, uh, picking my head a little bit for a really long time now. I think ever since I got started, I got uh, ever since the first comment I got was that the only reason I was hired is because I'm a woman and women settle for less money. So oh. it's more financial for the company to hire women because we settle for less. That was the first one I got. And that was the first, you know, those little nudges we discussed earlier. So yeah. that was the first one that kind of bugged me. And since then it just started growing and growing and growing. And I've noticed that any woman that I've talked to that's in the industry that has a position, 
kind of all feel the same. Mm. We just, we can't talk about it as we're in private, unless it's just us, the women in the room, then we can bring it up because otherwise we get those weird, well, what do you expect? Mm -hmm. and there aren't any women. So, you know, it is what it is, you know, just accept it. And we're not doing anything. It's not coming from a bad place. We're just putting things as they are, you know, that's the situation. And I don't think that's right. It's not the situation and it's not something to be discussed as something to be accepted. Yeah. Um, the difference in pay, uh, the fact that there are so few women in teams, it's not something to say, well, you know, say, okay, this is not a good, this is not a good uh, point to be in. So I started thinking, well, we women are so, we have such solidarity to, to each other, mm -hmm. yet somehow it's not, uh, you know, shown so mm -hmm. why don't we have our own place not just inside the team but inside the whole country this is a big industry especially mm -hmm. in israel yeah and so many good women mm -hmm. <laughs> um they need to have a place we need to have a place mm -hmm. of our own where we can ask questions and not be afraid to be um like belittled or or ignored or make fun of uh, where we can be confident to share our thoughts and not be afraid for someone to take credit for them. Um, and we can share our knowledge without being afraid of being, um, you know, oh, you did that wrong. Oh, oh, you stole that from someone else. Or, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that kind of what brought us up and talking to Nafal about it kind of made it come to life. I always had this idea in my head, but nothing practical to do with um so just talking about it with Nafal kind of brought it up um we joined another partner her name is Nafal. she's amazing we've worked together in the past and uh stayed friends ever since mm -hmm. and she's been my shoulder to cry on when, <laughs> when I had difficulties yeah. so we joined her in the team and it's been growing ever since and we're loving it I love it and it's so important it's and it's funny what you said, you know, here that support and the solidarity of feeling like I have a space and that there's other people that have my back and I can ask these questions and it's not the situation you just accept it. It's okay. It's a situation that many of us are experiencing. What can we do proactively to address it? Because it doesn't have to be this way. Exactly. And I think that that you know, oftentimes we're only limited when we're only looking at our particular situation. You ladies saying, okay, there's something here. What was that trigger for you to reach out and, and to meet your partner and to say, okay, here, what can we do together? What, what was your personal kind of trigger to say, yeah, no, I've had enough <laughs> of this accepting the situation. So I thought, what was for you? What was your enough point? Because that first one of, I got you on the cheap because you're a woman, you're not willing to negotiate. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> so what for you was the, the to say, what can we do? Um, it's actually what Nafal mentioned before. Um, the one that Nafal mentioned before is that we started recruiting together. Um, and, and when you start recruiting, you, you get those resumes and I've noticed I'm not getting resumes from women yeah. almost at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that kind of opened my eyes a little bit. I started looking around mm -hmm. all the women I work with there, there's always this like one, two in every aspect I work in, mostly it's men. Mm -hmm. So that started the whole what's going on, you know, kind of opened my eyes. Um, and then I asked Nafal, just yeah. like out of a basic conversation. I said, hey, so how many resumes do you get from women in general? Um, that spark up a whole <laughs> conversation. I love, I love it, I love it. And seeing these things a little bit more out of that perspective of let's, let's raise it up a level of what are, what are those trends? What are those things that we're noticing that seem weird? And like you said, Nofar, like, okay, this doesn't happen in marketing. This doesn't happen in R&D. What's right. going on here? Yeah. Yeah, actually, we, we actually know each other because I was I recruited Adva to, uh, to her uh, first position and, and she, she grew in it. Now she's a manager. 
Uh, but I recruited her at the time and I couldn't believe how lucky I got, you know, to get a woman candidate. And they have been praising her ever since. I mean, she went in there and she just, you know, <laughs> she just did her thing and everything is so much more in order. And, and I think they're so great and they're such a good, a great team. Um, so this is kind of how we started it. And now we're recruiting together. And the unbelievable thing is that the, um, the responses that you get, you know, you can't unsee something. Once yes. you see it, it all, it's, it's mm -hmm. there all the time. So yeah. suddenly you see, you know, you, you see like conferences and they're like 12 uh, men speakers and one keynote woman. And you're like, what? <laughs> So that, that's the mm -hmm. first, that's okay, maybe this one time. And then, you know, we have this WhatsApp group and every time I advise like, okay, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. Um, so this kind of became a, a, a thing that we probably should be touching upon and talk to these conferences and see, you know what, there are women. We're not, not a lot of us, hopefully mm -hmm. there'll be more. Um, but that's one thing. And when we started to get, to get the uh, things going, uh, and advice building this amazing website mm -hmm. and we're all kind of writing and Shahar, she mentioned Shahar, which is our third uh, partner in crime and she's also this amazing cyber lady very very experienced and she has been experiencing uh, a lot of things uh, in her career um, uh, so there's a website and there's going to be uh, you know social media is so ripe for it I mean, so this right. is the right time mm -hmm. for a community. This is like the right time. The channels are there. The stage is there. You just need to grab it and, and you know, do something with it. And Adva's been talking to uh, uh, to women in her line of work. And I've been talking in Shara. Like every woman that you talk to her about this Women in Cyber project, uh, she's like, oh, my God, I'm so in. I'm, uh, you know, Everyone's just excited. tell me what to do. And I'm in. <laughs> They're like thirsty for it. It's unbelievable the, the, the responses we get. Actually from men too, is that right? Mm -hmm. Men men here yeah. probably than uh, you, you've been talking to a lot of cyber people since. So <laughs> the, it's, it, people are ready for it. It's like it's been waiting to happen. Well, and, and I think you bring up a really important point is this piece of, you know, allyship of, you know, here, we want to help bring these forward and, you know, and here, how are we finding our allies? How are we finding our friends to say, hey, we want to proactively change the situation because it's not good. It's not good for anybody here in terms of how are we even also finding our own self-value? It takes a lot of confidence um, and it is very hard when you're constantly getting nudged down to have that self-belief. So saying, oh, here, hey, we see you, we want you to grow. It's not only with women, it's also with the men and saying, hey, this can be different. How do we address the machismo? How do we address the systemic um, pieces that are working against us and what can we do to, to proactively show different paths and give real solutions that we're coming up with together because it's not something where we can just say, okay, plug and play because we said it needed to be changed. It's gonna be changed overnight, boom. Um, but to say, okay, how do we address it? And then also address it on the own personal level of how am I growing? What are the things I want to do to take my career rather than saying, okay, I, I'm okay with being the token. I don't think any of us and the way I've met, uh, particularly the women in Israel, that's not how I've met you. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be uh, some very powerful women in there, uh, which I'm so excited about. And to say, okay, what can we do about this? We're not accepting the, this status quo. What can we do? So if you ladies were to say, okay, what would your, be your dream? What would you be really looking to, to make in terms of a social impact? What's the social impact that you're looking to, to make? By, by addressing, just starting with this aspect of cybersecurity, what's the social impact you ladies are looking to make? And I'm gonna let you take this one. Um, so talking about those things kind of got to start to think, where's the problem coming from? Mm -hmm. uh, where's it starting? Yeah. And Israel, Israel cyber community is uh, heavily impacted by military. Mm -hmm. um, 
a lot of uh, cybersecurity uh, startups and employees come from uh, cyber related positions in the army. Mm -hmm. uh, you're selected to, do, to go to those uh, in, a, in a relatively young age, around a teenager when you're in high school. Mm -hmm. And how many women in high school do you know that love cybersecurity, stay at home, do hacking, gaming? Um, I'm not sure it's, I'm pretty sure there are a lot who like it. And mm -hmm. if they had the opportunity, they would love it and mm -hmm. they would be very interested in it. I just don't think they all have the same opportunity and it's not very well accepted mm -hmm. as much as for uh, mm -hmm. men. So I think that's kind of like one starting point that yeah. our goal and our like, faraway dream is to have more women coming from in, in that time, in high schools and uh, universities, mm -hmm. give them the opportunity to experience it and understand if they like it or not. Yeah, exactly. Um, and our second goal is kind of for the women that are already in it, mm -hmm. level up, um, move up, be more assertive, um, have more um, executive positions mm -hmm. and kind of like leave a better mark. And of course, make more women uh, come and join this amazing community because we have so much to contribute. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the bottom line is really what advice said, you know, for women who are already inside to find their voice mm -hmm. uh, and not be, do not fear of, uh, uh, of uh, saying what they think and, and expressing what they want to achieve. Um, and I guess uh, I would think another goal would be other, other than just, you know, grow the exposure and, and reach younger women, younger girls. Uh, which is, as, re as Adva said, is, it's the starting point of this whole process. That's how usually people get to cyber. Um, so it's about growing the exposure. Um, what I mentioned before about conferences and professional events, that's mm -hmm. another thing that I, I hope that if, uh, that not if, when we have this strong community going, um, we'll have an influence, we'll have a say on that as well. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll be able to have, uh, like, uh, you know what, we have uh, keynote speakers in our community uh, because sometimes the, the mm -hmm. answer you will get is, you know, I would love to put a woman on the panel, but I don't know any. I mean, this is the kind of mm -hmm. answer that yeah. you, can, you can find <laughs> usually. Um, so that's another point of influence that I would love to see happening. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely that. And, and yeah, we, I think... The whole thing is is getting women in cyber to be heard, and mm -hmm. I think the numbers will grow as a as a result. You know, it, it will be a, a more uh, accepting place to um to join if some are if some fear it and some don't feel like uh, it's the right thing for them because they're such a minority. Uh, so they will know that they have a back that they you yeah. know they they actually do belong to this strong group of women in cyber, and uh, and hopefully that will engage the companies as well. You know, they will mm -hmm. have somebody to talk to. They will have communication with us as, as a group. Yeah. Um, and that should be something that the company should want to do, you know, to be in touch, to, to, uh, to see how they can support it on their end. Uh, so this is a really important influence that I, 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 for one, would like to see happening with a community like that, to have a say with the employers as well. Because you remember diversity and inclusion, the inclusion part should definitely be dominant here. I could not agree more. And I think that that goes back to what you were saying at the beginning, Nofar, about, you know, what were you getting response in terms of the exit interviews? And I think if we're really looking at what is that employee experience, what is that experience of being in this role as a woman of cybersecurity to say, okay, it can't be, can you get me some tea? It's that piece of, you know, we're getting each other tea, okay? So here, how are we really feeling as part of the team and that your voice matters? And that comes back to, like you said, the companies of, is our talent brand, is the employee experience, is the leadership experience to that aspect of how are you leveling up? How are we making sure that systemically we're looking at these things and saying, how are we looking at performance reviews? How are we looking at um, promotions? How are we looking at just sharing learning opportunities and et cetera, that that is, it's a whole, it's a whole view of, it's not just an individual experience. It's how is the individual experience within a context? And then how can we as a broader community um, really help bring that forward and bring the conversation forward? 
and then give really concrete recommendations as to how can this be done and some real approaches and success stories to say, and this is how we've had that in the past. Word. <laughs> <laughs> what she said. <laughs> what she said, exactly. Our- <laughs> You're welcome anytime. <laughs> well, and, and I really love also that you address the, because if you look at who are the most gamers and you ladies know this probably a lot better than I do, it's, it's more women. And um, so women, what is it? Women age 26 are the ones who are the biggest gamers, but ironically, we're so underrepresented. So this aspect of this is an opportunity for you. This is, you know, this, um, how are you recognizing patterns? What are you doing? How are you taking that empathy and putting it into a different way, into activities in different ways to really play upon those strengths and that network community? It's, it's really opening up those minds as to what is a good job for someone and challenging those paradigms to say, hey, there's, there's different opportunities for you here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I love it, I love it. So for your website, once it comes out, um, we will definitely be sharing it here on, on, on our circle. Um, in terms of what are the things that you ladies are looking forward to in terms of next steps, what are those for you? I, I owe an article to Adva. I need yeah. to write another one. <laughs> That's my next step. I'm going to complete my article. The, the <laughs> writing is big right now. We want to we want to have as much content as, as possible, you know, to have th- something going. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of for me like Adva the boss. <laughs> Uh, so I'll, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to next steps. Um, next steps. Um, I think it would be first to get, like Nafal said, more content in mm-hmm. and start spread the word. Because uh, yeah. the women that we've already talked to um, were so into it and they were like just waiting for it to happen. Just send me the link already so I can sign up. Um, and to bring value, uh, kind of mm-hmm. like to hear back from them for the ones that are like started, uh, first one in the community, to hear what they have to say, what do they want to improve and what do they want to like see, uh, what is missing. Mm-hmm. So, and that I think would be like our, our next step to be to kind of match it to what they're looking for, Beautiful. what the community needs, mm-hmm. um, and then to actually uh, bring it up and spread the word with you <laughs> as far as we can and get more as much women as we can uh, to join uh, it's funny because everyone said there aren't a lot of women in cybersecurity. since we started this I've been hunting women in LinkedIn just adding them <laughs> to my connections I love uh, to it. start spread the word when it's ready and there's so many um, yes so <laughs> exactly <laughs> If you open up those floodgates, they the water will come in. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know the the ironic thing, and I'm 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 also uh, this is another issue. You need to do something. You need to do a revolution, but you ni- you need to be nice about it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? There, mm-hmm. I mean to, to uh, do a real revolution here. If you really need to do, you know, it, it can get bloody. You need to criticize everyone, and you need, you know, what this you did this and that, and that now this is the situation. But you have to be smart about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was going to say that the the women in the process in the recruitment process are doing so much better. But I don't want to uh, to irritate anyone. <laughs> <laughs> everyone um but yeah it's actually amazing how well women fit in cyber like the cyber thinking the the methodology uh mm-hmm. the whole uh, uh you know this whole realm is so so good for women for women they can they can do wonders uh so it's really ironic how we got to this situation you know in the world i think mm-hmm. it's about 20 24 25 percent women in cyber security like a quarter yeah, and in Israel, it's ten percent of the whole cybersecurity. Wow. Wow. It's it's crazy, and we're so good in cybersecurity. So why not? Yeah. Uh, maybe they're afraid to give us a chance, and I will take over. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's a risk that we'll have to take. You know, a positive but, uh, risk. A positive risk. I love it. Well, exactly. I think- exactly. I think you ladies are awesome. I think it's exactly the right track to say, okay, how are we noticing the things that are floating up? 
systemically putting those different patterns together and saying, okay, how can we make that impact starting early, being consistent, um, and then showing that this is a great community to be part of, to level up and to co-create. And I think Adva, what you said there was perfect to say, okay, what does this community need and how can we all come together to say, how let's, let's get this together, um, what can we do and how can we address the different topics? Um, because together we're stronger. Definitely. Definitely stronger. All right. So ladies um, and everybody listening and watching today on our circle, you have met the wonderful Adva Hadwash and uh, Nafar Shmafani, who are two of my favorites. Um, this woman, um, Nafar, she's part of my coffee clutch. So um, <laughs> you will hear more about these ladies I know moving forward. And I wish you all the best of luck. And you know any support that I can offer you. I have your back, my ears. Thank you, Liz. Thank you Thank for you having us. Awesome. That's a lovely you. thing. That's a wonderful thing. So uh, without further ado, we're going to move on to the next show. We've got uh, Jim, so I'm going to shut up. I'm going to get rid of these two lovely ladies uh, and bring in our guests. And they've gone. That was interesting. They just dropped off. Even better, they just disappeared. Um, so why don't I bring in Emma and then um, I'll disappear again. Look at that. Uh, let's bring in Emma. Let's bring Alicia in. Dun, 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 dun. Just feel, just hum, sing, dance. Great chat, Elizabeth, there. A nice save earlier on, Martin. I know your, your <laughs> Wi Fi there in Germany is dropping in and out a little oh, bit. Oh, so. German Wi Fi is the worst. Third world what? infrastructure. Magic. Hi, Alicia. Hi there. How Hello. you doing? I'm well. How are you guys? Good, good, good. Yeah, we were just listening to some amazing chats that we've had this morning and, and the conversations that have been going on. And of course, there's lovely technology that works perfectly every time. For <laughs> every time. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the middle of people having deliveries, and as I said this morning, I've got my crazy dog running around in the background, throwing his toy bones and bits and pieces all over the place to try and, try and avoid <laughs> meeting silly things. Uh, he's now asleep, but I'm sure he'll join in, in a minute. Um, so yeah, great. Yeah, Hello. lovely chat. Uh, Kim, I'm, hi, here. Emma. How are I'm here. I just here. can't. I don't know why my video is not working. Speaking <gasps> of technology and it failing us, um, oh, I that. even I even put my makeup on today. So <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> think it would work, work actually. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what I can do. So shall we carry on without my oh, face? Oh, Jim, I'm going to disappear and leave you to it. Good luck, Jim. Enjoy the enjoy your show. I should sit back and watch. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, yeah, welcome uh, Emma. Welcome Alicia. And um, yeah, we're going to talk about. Uh, sort of widening the net and we're going to be chatting to Emma Freivogel, Alicia Bob. Um, hello both of you. Hello, thank you for having um, us. I'm waving at you Emma and there's no screen of you here at Jim, all. I'm waving You're, back I assure you. <laughs> I am sure you are fantastic. So really want to chat to you this morning a little bit more. We had a conversation recently um, and I actually uh said the wrong thing while we were chatting. I mentioned Radical Recruitment uh, as a recruitment agency. So let's start there. Because you're not a recruitment agency, Emma, tell us a little bit about what you do, you know, the differences there. Yeah, sure. So we're a, um, we're a not-for-profit. We are a recruitment agency, Jim, but we do lots of other things as well. So we're a not-for-profit community-owned um, recruitment consultancy. And we represent people who are underrepresented in the labour market. So anyone who um, has a barrier to work, for example, has been or is currently homeless, um, has been through the care or criminal justice system, is a um, domestic violence survivor, has um, you know got an enduring mental health condition, a physical or intellectual disability. We work with people who are in recovery, um, who have sort of um, poor mental health that has um, made it very difficult for them to come back into the labour market or, or get into it in the first place. And mm. we, we approach recruitment in the same way as our um, sort of eight, um, for-profit counterparts in the sense that our candidates get offered an interview on the merit of their application um, and get the job because of the best candidate at the end of the race. The key difference for us, I guess, is that we support people who are... Um, sort of on the, the fringes of the labour market, but not quite interview mm. or work ready to become interview and work ready. And then um, once we place them, 
uh, we support them to sustain their employment and hopefully with time um, progress in their chosen careers. So pre-work support, it looks very different for everyone, but essentially um, it's all the things you would expect around confidence building for people who um, perhaps fail to see their own potential or who have um, struggled to, to find a job of, of being long-term unemployed, all the way to um, supporting people to to develop ATS optimized CVs, teaching them how to answer competency-based questions using the Staff Boss L framework, um, mock interviews, these types of things. And yeah. we also partner with um, an amazing uh, group of sort of specialist providers that um, help us to provide the specialist interventions that people need when life throws a hurdle their way. So for example, once a candidate has um, started in, in their workplace, we don't leave them. Um, we check in with them once a week for the first three weeks because that's when people tend to trip up. Um, and we support them with all sorts of things uh, through these partnerships. So, for example, if we've got a, a young person who's been in a domestic violence situation and the ex-boyfriend moves himself back in the house without a consent and he's abusive, then we will help her to move out of that situation and negotiate, for example, some time off work in order to get that, that issue resolved so that that person doesn't lose her job. Um, it's the same with things like, you know, we might have a candidate who suffered a, a loss in their family. Um, it might be that the candidate's actually been, you know, managed retrospectively or their remit and responsibilities aren't clear and they need help to find the right language and the right ways to have conversations. It can be a little bit tricky if you've not mm. been in the workplace for a long time or at all. Um, to, to you know, find solutions to those problems. So we do lots and lots of things in addition to recruitment um, with our candidates. And on the other side, we also support our employers to be more diverse and be more inclusive. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 and, and the chats that we've had and the, the work that goes into pre uh, the support and all that journey that you take people on, um, it is amazing, Emma. You're you're on a mission at the moment. Um, I think loads of people are on the mission through COVID. Many different missions to to get through all of this. But you're on a mission at the moment. Place hundred people in a hundred days. How, you know where where we up to with that? Yeah, yeah. So um, we were. I was contacted by um, Saint Mungo's. They're one of the big homeless um, charities in the UK, and um, it was at the start of um, lockdown 1.0. And they had been tasked to move thousands of rough sleepers off the street um, and into temporary accommodation that was uh, funded by the government uh, so that they could self-isolate safely. And many of the people that they've moved off the streets were actually capable of working. So they were on the hunt for a recruitment partner, essentially, to support them with that work because they didn't have the expertise within their existing team. Um, and their team was already stretched, of course, because they had you know, huge numbers of people, additional people to support. Um, so they they emailed me when I was a one-woman show, essentially, um, saying, can you help? Um, this is a situation. We need all hands on deck. And I sort of found myself thinking, oh, gosh, not really. I don't have any money. I'm a one-woman show. Um, we've just started up ourselves, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I, they called me the next day saying, we've heard about you. Can you help? And I sort of explained all of these things I've just explained to you. Um, and we agreed to stay in touch. And it was sort of, that was on a Friday night. It was a beautiful sunny Friday and I was drinking a cider at the time and probably catching it up on admin or something in the garden. And for the following two days, I just couldn't get out of my head. I felt really compelled to, to do something. So I put together this um bid I guess that said if you give me this this money I think I can do this with with it um with all the the caveats you would expect that you know we're in the middle of an apocalypse uh, we're about to go into a recession uh, it's a candidate rich market there's going to be more and more redundancies um the people that we were sort of um being asked to support were people with no recourse to public funds because they were EU nationals and typically didn't speak English as a first language. So hadn't actually received any support to solve their homelessness, to get into jobs, um, you know, to receive NHS services, none of that um, they could, they could had recourse to. So a really, really challenging cohort of people with complex and unique vulnerabilities. Anyway, for some reason, they considered my proposal, which was a shock in itself. And it was one of several that were tabled 
with the Ministry of Housing, um, Community and Local Government, who then funded the GLA, who funded us to do this piece of work alongside St Mungo. So the project has been um, initially was to support 200 people with no recourse to funds. That sort of reduced down to about 60 and we've assessed 53 as being um, work ready, although probably not interview ready. And um, I recruited a, a crack team of recruiters. So Glenn Martin is one of them. Um, Lee Thomas Rag is another. They've both worked in sort of the corporate commercial world for, for many, many years and bring a wealth of experience. We're also supported by Alicia, who joins us today, yeah. um, who is our lived experience expert, but also um, going to be an amazing engagement coordinator, as well as one of my, my other radicals, Chris, and uh, Paul and Mel, who do sort of work on strategy and, and marketing um, respectively. So we've got this amazing team that have been working sort of tirelessly to get this cohort of 53, well, it's 51 men and two women into work. We've made around 20 placements, um, got seven more job starts on Friday, and we're working with some amazing employers who, you know, can see beyond the labels, who have worked with us to ensure that their, their recruitment processes are accessible and fair, and that our people um, with loads and loads of support to get interview ready, have an opportunity to apply for jobs um, that that uh, are available sort of in the open market. So that that's the work that we've been doing recently, um, and it's going incredibly well. I don't think um, many people expected us to make any placements, and I certainly didn't write job starts into the KPIs framework because I ain't silly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're doing we're doing very well, and that's enabled us to sort of look at well, what else can we be doing within the the homelessness space because homelessness is on the rise. Um, there's mm. tens of thousands of other people predicted to become homeless as a result of COVID and a good 30,000 of the people that are currently homeless are actually young people um, yeah. aged 18 to 25 who, who desperately need our help. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the help that you're giving, the support you're giving, the work you're doing is, is, is amazing. Let's, Let's go back. You you were, as you said yourself, you were a one woman business. Now now you've got a team of people about you. Um, Alicia, you've recently joined. Um, uh, we can't see Emma's face here, as I'm sure she's smiling and waving. I'm very and much smiling. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm Alicia's <laughs> biggest cheerleader. I tell you, she's um oh. a young person who really really inspires me. And if I had the resilience and the determination and grit that she has at, you know, when I was how old are you, Alicia? 22? Yeah. yeah. If I if I were, you know, half of what Alicia is in those in those ways, I I um would yeah, I think she's just a brilliant young person. So we're really pleased to have her on the team. Hi. And Alicia, can I chat to you about that? Can I can we talk about your story? Because you've had first hand experience of homelessness. Can can you give a little bit of insight to that, if, if that's okay? And tell us the journey that you've gone on, really, please. Yeah, of course. So um, when I became homeless and uh, after surf sofa surfing for about six months to a year, I finally came in contact with social services and there was very limited help. Um, eventually, I think 12 weeks after that, when I turned 17, they said they no longer can support me and, you know, I have to find my own way, basically. Um, so I was put in an accommodation with that had 16 other young people living in it, um, which was quite a mixed experience. There was a lot of good people, but at the same time, it was quite hostile at times. Um, and this accommodation was supported, although um, there wasn't much support. I came into the accommodation doing an apprenticeship. Um, I was asked by the people that ran the hostel to leave the apprenticeship because if um, I lived there and had the apprenticeship on apprenticeship wage, I would only be left with five pound to live on because the rent's quite high. And, um, you know, so I had to leave that and just claim, was encouraged to claim benefits um, so I could have a roof over my head, basically. Um, yeah, so from my experience, I, I really do believe that businesses are in a position that no other entity is uh, to make a real difference to individuals like me. Yeah. 
Hundred percent, and 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 you, the story and the journey that you've gone on there, Alicia, and to where you're at now, and you, you know you you you're working with MO radicals. Your that insight and experience is valuable to the people that you know you're supporting and helping. Um, I know myself, when you're in that recruitment sector, that having some of the knowledge in the sector that you're working in is is, is great value. Um, you mentioned there sofa surfing. Was that is is that what you were doing? Is that as terminology that, that that's used? And excuse my ignorance and all this. You know, I'm. You know, I suppose this is part of our our DB DB and I days really to or the day of focus to try and understand all the types of diversity, equity, belonging, and inclusion. So sofa surfing. Tell me, is 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 that a thing that that's a common word, or is that a thing you? Yeah, it's very word? common in young people, especially. Um, because, you know, we come out of our family homes, we've got a lot of friends that can, their mums or their families might offer support. Um, but, you know, we all have lives. I'm still here. Lives, and this is very short term. Um, so yeah, so sofa surfing is basically, you know, staying with friends mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you don't really have your own accommodation, but you have a roof over your head. Mm, oh, excellent. Oh, it's that. And it's and it's a warm term, isn't it, really? I think if you think about surfing and that kind of thing, it's a, it's a, it's a warm thing, considering the difficult situations that you're going through. Mm -hmm. So you've now started with, with Emma. And Emma, it's, it's very odd not been able to see your smiling, yeah, I'm fantastic really sorry. And do you know what? <laughs> I've just done, I was just in another recording in another podcast and I didn't log out of it. So they've just logged on to do some more recording, presumably. And they've asked me, are you still here? Which is why I said, yes, I'm still here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Don't worry. Just, just to add to Alicia's stuff, um, sort of comments around homelessness and hidden homelessness. So there are th the people's perceptions of homeless. And when we th think about homeless people, we think about people who live on the streets, don't we? Mm. Um, but homelessness, the definition of homelessness is, is more expansive than that. So it, do, it includes people who are in unstable accommodation. So, for example, you could be um, in a Airbnb, be, bleh, sorry, an Airbnb um, funded by the local authority as a temporary accommodation um, option while they're looking for a long-term house for you. Or you could be rough sleeping or you could be sleeping on the floor of a friend's place or in their garage or you could be in a tent in the forest or you could be on a car in a caravan on the side of the road. So this idea that homelessness is exclusively people on, um, on the street is, is um, a, a common misperception, um, mm. a, as is the perception that all homeless people are drug addicts or alcohol users. So um, Alicia is a really good example of someone who, has made a decision to leave her, her family home because her family home was not a healthy place for her to be in. And she felt like there were better, safer, more, more um, viable sort of long-term options for her. But she was let by, down by a system that just does not work um, for lots of people. Um, and obviously you can see how eloquent and intelligent Alicia is and how switched on she is. Um, and having worked with her for and known her for a few months, you know, I can she's savvy and she's quite streetwise and things like that. But even someone like Alicia struggled to navigate the system. So if you've got a disability, mm. if you suffer from addiction, if you um, are a very young pe person, you know, if you're a child, um, it, it's really hard. It's really easy to find yourself on the streets. It's really hard to take yourself out of homelessness, especially yeah. if you don't have a job. I, I, yeah, c c completely. And I, I think you, you raise a very good point there. You know, we, we talk about this today and talk about our unconscious bias, you know, and, and you mentioned the word homelessness there. And, you know, that perception for most people is someone on the street living in a cardboard box, you know, kind of thing that people say that's their perception, but it's, it's broader and it's wider than that. And as you mentioned there, Alicia, yourself, that you're in that system and struggling to get out the system. You, you said there that, you know, you were encouraged to go on benefits, you know, to, you know, then going out to work. And, and, and that's some things for people, it's, it's very hard to understand that whole journey and, and an experience that you've gone on. Um, how did you get to come to, to, to be working with, with Emma uh, and the Radical team? Um, so I was on a project with um, Sage Foundation. So it's part of uh, Sage UK, um, and it was to it was a, it was called a place to call home. So it was about homelessness and how young people, you know, um, may find themselves in that position. 
Uh, for example, there might be a death in the family that uh, led that young person to become homeless and, you know, them type of different things. So I was helping out with that, um, with an amazing lady that supported me, um, you know, mentored me through my uh, journey live when I was living in supported accommodations. Um, and, you know, she helped me out a lot. Uh, she introduced me to Emma th earlier this year. And, um, you know, Emma is amazing. She's really helped me. The employability sessions that she runs are so useful. And it's lovely to be, you know, talking to other prof like different professionals and really getting into that environment. Um, whereas, you know, I might not be able to just get myself into that environment and really bridging that gap between the community and people in, you know, high positions. Yeah. And I, I think, I think you, you, the, the, we talk about widening the net and talk about already this, the, you know, the, the, the insight, the knowledge, the passion that you bring to add value to, to Emma's business it, is what we're missing out on. You know, if I put my head a talent hat on, you know, we look at a normal route and trying to broaden that net. We can widen that net. There are lots of people out there we can find. You mentioned there the, the, the support and, and, and um, sessions that Emma delivers. Emma, you know, you do do more and you're doing something, um, was it radical? Was it being consciously unbiased training now as well? Tell us yeah. a little bit more about how you, you're, you're helping companies with that. I think... Um... After the George Floyd murder, um, there was a whole load of discussion, particularly on LinkedIn, that caused me to do more listening and more thinking and more reflecting. And um, one of the things that I became acutely aware of was that, I mean, diversity, equality, inclusion, belonging is, is core to our business. And um, it should be core to everyone's business and it should be everyone's responsibility. But when I think about what I've learned about equality, inclusion, diversity and belonging. It's never been through training provided by my employer. Mm. And employers, you know, across the nation spend hundreds of thousands, probably millions collectively training their staff on matters relating to DNI. And, you know, the, the big piece of work that we do, the hardest piece of work we do at Radical is actually talking to businesses and calling them out when they're not being radical enough. You know, mm. so when the, you know, the George Floyd murder occurred and, and Black Lives Matter, I mean, it's always been happening, this movement that was sort of under the spotlight again. We were talking about, you know, being anti-racist um, and that it wasn't enough just to say we were an equal opportunities employer anymore. And it kind of caused me to think, you know, is, is identifying our unconscious bias enough or should we be trying to take things a step further and, and educating people and, and taking responsibility for ourselves and ensuring that um, we as a business internally, but also our partners are getting the support they need to not only identify their biases, but to become consciously unbiased. And then also giving them the tools they need to um, take action and be anti-biased. And so when we look at, at Radical, we prescribe to um, sort of three dimensions of diversity. So you've got sort of internal dimensions and, and they're the things that everyone thinks about when we talk about diversity. We talk, we're thinking about age, we're talking about gender, sexual orientation, physical ability, ethnicity and race. They're, they're what we call internal dimensions, but there are two other dimensions. There are external dimensions that look at, um, variables like, say, for example, income or someone's socioeconomic background. Um, it might look at religion. It could look at their work experience. It, it could be the way they, they look and, and the way their accent sounds. And then at, on the, the outer layer, if you think about it as a circle, you've got organisational dimensions. Um, and that looks at sort of management status and union affiliations and work locations and seniority and these types of things. So at Radical, we, we want to be talking about diversity and really opening people's minds to what that actually means for per personally um, in their roles within businesses and for employers generally. So we, are, we have developed some training um, that we hope will do all of those things and more. Um, we, it, it's sort of a, a combination of theoretical 
classroom-based training tailed with um, experiential learning, which will make everyone, I hope, feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> it mm. will um, help people to identify their implicit bias. It will give them the tools that they need to change the way they think, to add to their perceptions, to do better at work and in life. Um, and it will um, be coupled with sort of three virtual check-ins um, that will occur quarterly um, every quarter after the delegates com complete the the face-to-face -face stuff um, whereby delegates from all of the sessions we've delivered in the in the previous quarters can come together and um, share ideas exchange ideas um, talk about what what's working and what's not working within their businesses um, support each other uh, learn from each other and also keep each other accountable because I think you know all of the training that I've done around DNI has always felt like off the shelf three hour tick box company-wide compulsory training that that didn't make me think that didn't you know it didn't mean I had to lean into what was uncomfortable you know um, it didn't teach me how to listen as an ally um, it didn't teach me how to sort of state my intent and and share my corner and bring people into my my sort of perceptions and my experiences. It didn't ever feel really very authentic or, you know, create a sense of safety for myself or my team members. This is what good training should do. So this is what we're delivering at Radical Recruit and we're doing it um, with the help of our radicals. So yeah. it's not going to be some white bird who's, um, you know, was born into incredible privilege, ranting about what you should and shouldn't do in your business. That's not what, what our training looks like or will feel like. I'll be co-facilitating, as will some of my other colleagues, um, with people with lived experience who have expertise, who've been on the other side of, of our bias um, and who can bring the narrative to life and, and make it real. Because mm. these are human people, you know, we're, we're talking about and that, that have been treated unfairly, essentially. 100 percent And I love the fact, Emma, you're pushing people out of their comfort zone. You're making them feel uncomfortable because then you sit up and listen. You know, if you're sat in a nice comfy chair, you can easily relax and fall asleep and not take the important bits on. But if you're feeling uncomfortable, you're going to sit up and listen. I think that's, that's such a valid point. And as you say, bringing other people's life experiences, you know, that story, tell that story, and it, and it will really sit with them. The check-in point as well. So you're going to check in with the people? Sort yeah, of so everyone will come together quarterly. Um in an online sort of event and we'll, um, we'll, we'll ring fence two hours together. And um, the idea is that after the training, you as an individual make a commitment to do something in your workplace, take action in your workplace to address a diversity, equality, inclusion or belonging issue. It might be that you review your company's recruitment policy. It could be that you talk to a black colleague and ask the question, are you hurt at work? It could be that you start a DNI book club and read a book a quarter and report back to your team members about what you've learned about white fragility. Um, it could be that you share a, you know, what's that woman who does the um, blue eye, brown eye experiment? Jane, she's been campaigning for anti-racism forever. Um, and these, these exercises are incredibly powerful especially when they're brought to you by people that you trust you know people that you mm. respect within the business so we're wanting to sort of change um the way d and i is is um treated and thought about because it really needs to be something that is ingrained in everything we do as individuals mm. and as businesses and it has to be everyone's responsibility so once once people sort of have a, a we'll give them a toolbox of things we'll give them a whole range of ideas and they'll pick ones that they think are relevant and will be useful in their businesses and then we'll say okay go implement them go give it a try go have these conversations it could just be a conversation with a manager it could be that you put dni on your team meeting agenda it could be that you build that into your um, performance management framework or your support and supervision frameworks, where whatever whatever makes sense to you as a business, you do that. And then what we do is we come together and we talk about the work that's being done 
as individuals and as businesses. And the idea is that we learn from each other. We exchange ideas. We sort of troubleshoot what's working and what's not working. We'll bring in people with lived experience, people who are experts in this because they've been on the other side of the bias um, yeah. to, to support and to, to talk through things and, and keep people accountable. Because this, this whole three-hour tick box exercise, it's, if I can be honest, bullshit, Jim. It's not oh, good oh, no, no, 100%. It's, it's the tick box, tokenism, reactive sort yeah. of way things people are doing. Yeah. It's, it's, today, it, it isn't a day, it's a day of, it's every day. And the exactly. conversations that we're having today should be everyday conversations and we exactly. should be learning. And hopefully those people listening, um, hi, mum, if you're listening, um, <laughs> you know, are actually learning something and, and, and taking things in. You know, I love that, Emma. We've come to 11.30. We've got Theo on next. Alicia, Emma, fantastic. Emma, um, uh, you're crowdfunding at the moment, so we'll get some links up there. Thank you very much for sharing your time, both of you, this morning. Um, Emma, sorry we couldn't see you, um, but I'm sure with the, the power of technology, when uh, Martin does his edit, he'll be able to get a lovely picture of you into the screen there. At some oh, point. gosh, anyway. make sure it's a good one, Martin, <laughs> please. Do me a favour, <laughs> mate. Thank you so much for having us. Well done, Alicia. Proud of you, mate. I'll speak to you soon, Bye. guys. Bye. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Awesome discussion. Thanks, all both. Marvellous. Let me um, do that slick thing. Um, Theo is waiting in the wings. Let's bring Theo in first. Emma, let's get rid of you first. Come on, Techie. Yeah, she's gone. And then we can all clear off. Um, fill, the, fill the void, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, well, listening to some of your chats this morning, Elizabeth, fantastic. Um, I hope people are joining in and listening. I mean, it's not just my mum. Hello, mum, again. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of the chats have been amazing. And there's a real common thread that, that's happening. And we're talking about this whole DEB and I. Um, and here we have a fantastic Theo Smith. Hey, Theo, how are you? Hey, yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Excellent. I think we're going to hand over to you, Sean and Liana, um, and we're going to we're going to let you uh, crack on, and we'll be listening away in the background. So, uh, thank you for doing this, everyone. Incredible. Thank you so much. So, thank you for joining us. Um, so, for those who don't know, uh, I'm Theo Smith, uh, and a couple of things that I do that may be relevant of interest for today is I. Uh, I host a podcast called Neurodiversity Eliminating Kryptonite and Enabling Superheroes. And my guests today, Lena and Sean uh, from the BBC, uh, have been on that podcast. So if you want to find out more about them in a bit more detail, you can go and listen to that. Loads of other content as well. And also, um, I'm writing a book with Amanda Kirby on neurodiversity at work. And also, when that comes out in April next year, you're going to find that Lena and Sean also play kind of pivotal roles in that book as well, because the incredible work that they've been doing. So we're going to cover off a few things today um, that have kind of been buzzing around my head. And I know uh, Lena and Sean would have been uh, coming across these as well uh, in discussions, conversations, and just what's going on in our own minds. So uh, it's kind of where, uh, first Lena and Sean introduce themselves in a second, but what we want to know is kind of where ND is at, where neurodiversity is at currently. Um, uh, and what our thoughts are around that. Labels, because I think that seems to come up a lot and it's always whizzing around my head because I struggle with language generally. So when you tell me I have to, you know, fit things into little boxes, I find it quite difficult. So we'll discuss that. Uh, disclosure, you know, do we need to, should we have to? Um, and disability or not around neurodiversity? Uh, and then how employers can offer support and kind of what the future looks like really. So hopefully we'll kind of squeeze that into the next 35 minutes. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully you'll find it of interest. So Lena, Sean, would you like to introduce yourselves? I'll let Lena go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so um, hi, I'm Lena Hack and I'm basically working at the BBC um, as a senior user experience designer. I also um, co-lead uh, the BBC's Neurodiversity Initiative, BBC CAPE, which stands for Creating a Positive Environment, and uh, with Sean, um, and yeah, basically here to talk about neurodiversity at work with Theo. Thank you for having us. Sure. Uh, yep, I'm Sean, uh, working alongside Lena uh, on BBC CAPE. Uh, and also uh, part of the BBC's User Experience and Design team. Uh, I'm a UX principal there. Amazing. And by the way, CAPE, if you don't know about it uh, and you've not come across it, then there's tons of resources, information, 
content, YouTube, go find it. Let us know if you want to know where to go and see it because um, there's some really, really great work uh, that they've been doing over there. So let's crack on. Let's get into the kind of the heart of the conversation. So uh, neurodiversity, um, I mean, what I've noticed recently and be interested to hear your thoughts as well is it seems that specifically in the UK, um, the, it seems to be uh, going at a rapid rate, neurodiversity, like more organisations are talking about it, more people are talking about it. I can see legal firms talking about it. I can see HR departments. It is like, it seems to be uh, it, like positive wildfire. It just it, it is starting to gain pace. That's not necessarily though, a good thing dependent on what those conversations are and what people's perceptions are and where the debate is happening. What, what are you both seeing, Lena and Sean, uh, as kind of where neurodiversity is at currently? Uh, I'll start. Um, well, I'd just like to say, yeah, I mean, when we started CAPE four or five years ago, um, you know, we, we, we basically started exploring, looking around to see what people were doing. And there wasn't really an awful lot there, which is what propelled us into starting the work that we're doing and, and starting to look at how we create a positive environment. We've definitely seen in the last 12, 24 months, as you mentioned, an explosion in, in terms of the conversation, uh, the amount of organizations that are starting to look and, and, you know, kind of in different parts of their journey, some more advanced than others, but a lot of people starting to ask those questions and starting to get involved in, uh, you know, what, what, what is neurodiversity? What does it mean? How do we support, um, you know, the, the looking at the benefits and advantages of cognitive diversity as part of the, the wider DNI agenda? Um, so it's, it's, yeah, and, and, and along with that growth, um, you know, we, we, we've seen those, those kind of conversations develop around uh, language, around identity, um, you know, neurodiversity is starting to rise up as, as this, this specific topic. So there's this question of, I suppose, where, where does neurodiversity sit within a DNI agenda if we're looking at all, all the characteristics and categories within diversity and inclusion? Um, you know, where, where is neurodiversity positioning itself? Um, you know, be, because it's definitely coming through as, 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 as something to, to be considered in, in an individual round, I think. Absolutely. And that's an interesting one, kind of where does it sit and how much influence can we have to kind of force the conversation? I've seen um, there's the uh, ADHD uh, all parliamentary group that's just started up again after a year and a half uh, of being quiet, I think. So this kind of, it's not just, uh, you know, the, the kind of the political conversations are now happening as well, which is an important element of that. You know, that we can do all this great work, but actually to, to inform real change, uh, sometimes that, that, is, that is difficult for us. And, other, and then we have it imprinted upon us rather than us being able to help that conversation along. So Lena, where, how, where do you think it's at at the moment? What are your thoughts around the current state of neurodiversity? Um, as Sean said, there's lots of conversations happening. Um, and the work that we do with Kate, um, it's very much about the advocacy side of things. But for, for me, um, you know, I'll, I'll, every time I, I'm asked to sort of speak about it, I sort of say, well, there's two, two I've got two hats really. Um, one is around like the advocacy side thing and the, and the other is having lived experience being on the autism spectrum and having ADHD. But I also say I, I'm I'm speaking very much from my own personal perspective and I'm, I don't claim to represent a, an entire group of people because the, the neurodiverse community is vast as, as you know, Theo. So it's, it's like, so I'm careful to sort of say, this is my perspective. And, you know, if you've met one person who, who identifies as ND, I'm going to use that as a, as a way of uh, describing it, because obviously we'll go, move, go on to labels and whatnot. So um, if, it, you know, if you've met one person with ND, you've met one person, we're all different and unique, and we all have very different perspectives, some conflicting, some very similar, um, you know, traits, etc. And for me, it's it's really important um, to highlight that um, advocacy is important, but I think you've got um, sort of, you know, you've got the community who have lived experience talking about it, and then you've got uh, diversity and inclusion professionals who are, it's, and it's a tricky job to have because they're trying to represent a community, but then you've got to be careful in terms of if you're representing a community, I think you need to be also prepared to be an ally, which is 
empowering that community who has who have lived experience to speak give them a voice give them a platform as opposed to speaking on their behalf if you see what i mean so i think that's kind of missing from the whole uh professional conversations that are happening uh with you know with the and i uh, with the DNI industry it's like you want to help a community but it's about empowering them and being allies um rather than speaking on their behalf so to speak so allow them to tell their stories and you know be be true allies to them basically so that's what we're trying to do with cape um and what we do i mean that's brilliant so that's something else that's been going on in my head and it'll bring us nicely onto labels in a second but the reality is there are many conversations going on around the UK, around the world, but it seems like uh, it, some of those conversations can be quite narrow um, and, and therefore, you know, not everybody is allowed into that conversation. And if too many narrow conversations are happening all over the place, then too many uh, people are coming to too many viewpoints or decisions that then perhaps are not aligned or where the, the influence has not been broad enough. And I think sometimes that's influenced by kind of a medical paradigm. Like you say, you know, it's somebody who is a psychologist or whatever, having their point of view based on their evidence-based research. And then the people who've got the lived experience come to, well, actually that thing that you've come up there, kind of moving nicely onto labels, I don't feel quite comfortable with that. Like, I don't want to be called neurodivergent, right? I, like I already have to put up with um, having a deficit and a disorder give me um you know too many disses i've got dyslexia as well and now i've got this neurodivergent i don't want it you can tell me it's correct and it's right but um not for me thank you very much so on, on the basis of labels and and there seems to be many uh, not just within neurodiversity broadly what are our thoughts around labels and where we currently stand um i'll i'll go uh, basically um i i just say it's it's basically about respecting choice if you know people should be allowed to choose whatever label they're comfortable with and everyone should respect each other's choices rather than saying you know like you said there you're not comfortable with certain labels so and uh, you know i'm not going to force you to accept a label that you're not comfortable with it's simple as that it's just etiquette it's just polite um and for me i get around the whole you know neurodiverse versus neurodivergent label thing by saying you know I'm, I identify as ND and 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 it's and it's kind of a, a, a workaround in a way I mean it's not ideal uh, but um, it's a workaround so that way I'm I'm not upsetting any particular community because they can take ND as neurodiverse or they can take it as neurodivergent so it's worked out as a really nice positive way of getting around those kinds of conversations um for me um Labels can cause conflict, you know, um, but at the same time, people sh should have the right to choose how they label themselves um, and uh, without fear of being judged, uh, basically. And and when you look at other conversations, for example, around LGBTQ, people, you know, people are, you know, strongly identify with certain labels. You've got your cisgender versus transgender and people should have the right to choose you know in those conversations quite rightly so and i think it should be the same within when uh within the conversations happening around neuro neurodiversity um so whatever you want to if you label yourself as it should you should you know it should be accepted and um you know respected basically it's about choice yeah. I, I think, you know, it's interesting looking at the parallels in terms of how, how the neurodiversity movement and the community is, is kind of mobilizing and, and starting to have these discussions with itself in terms of language and identity and the parallels with, with perhaps how the LGBTQ community have, have kind of generated th that, that kind of identity and then, you know, kind of push that forward as to this is who we are, this is our community and how we identify. Um, you know, it, it's nice to see that the conversations occur and, and people talking about different language and different styles of language and how people identify. Um, I'm not entirely sure necessarily. I think it's, it, it's, it's sometimes a little bit dangerous when we start, you know, within the community, start, start trying to impose language on people or trying to introduce, well, this is what I think it should be. So everybody start using this. Um, I think it's interesting to offer suggestions and opinions to share maybe how everybody is identifying and what different language that they do have. So, so that maybe what we can do is 
you know, as a community, rally around each other and support each other and go, okay, that's how you identify. I, I recognize that. This is how I identify and it's a bit different. Um, but we can respect each other's position. And what we should do is, is maybe be allies together to represent and support each other's position on this, um, you know, so that we don't necessarily get bogged down too much in, in becoming uh, kind of, you know, entrenched or, or, or embedded in, well, this is, this is how I think it should be done and you're wrong or you're right. Um, you know, let, let's be there for each other because, you know, this isn't, there's, there's enough to fight for anyway. Um, and I think this is about how we reflect that onto other people and say, this is how we identify as a community. That's how we'd like to be respected and recognized. Um, and, and just basically, you know, listen to people, respect that, and, and let's move forward together. Yeah, I think the um, listening, the seek first to understand, if we could all know what our own opinion is around language, labels, and think, I know what it is, so I'm going to try and listen to this person in front of me and understand what they think it is, because that should inform my thinking. <clears throat> Amanda and I have been grappling with this because we're writing the book and we're using 100 different labels. And, and even we can't, even I'm using neurodivergent and thinking, oh, I don't like it, but I'm using it. Because what happens is you fall into the trap of going, whether or not I like it, there are certain people who associate with it, understand it, uh, uh, and therefore it makes sense to them. So for me not to use it at all, even though I would like to move away from it, if possible, we still have to, I still use ADHD. I don't like it, but I've got nothing else to use. So we're kind of, we're, we're constrained by what we have. And I think we, as we go on a journey, we may come full circle, we may not. Um, but I think listening and, and trying to understand each other is pretty good. Um, so let's get on to um, kind of disclosure then. Uh, now, you know, do we need within our working environment to identify as being disabled, as being neurodiverse? Should we? I know legal paradigms that we may have to if we want support in certain organisations. Maybe we shouldn't, right? But, but it, it kind of in certain organisations, they will insist upon it. Um, and then disclosure, should we have to say? What, what are our thoughts around disclosure and disability? Um, basically, um, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna use the example of the work we've been doing. Um, we, we thought about when we started CAPE around, uh, and as it stands for creating a positive environment, we thought we wanna create a positive environment um, for everyone because at the time we knew disclosure obviously four or five years ago disclosure was a massive issue and it still is it continues to be so people are afraid of um disclosing or sharing i don't really like the word disclosure but sharing um you know um that they happen to be you know on the nearer the best spectrum um i i just feel that um if we create an environment which already caters uh, you know to nd minds um and then hopefully there will be a point where it's not necessary to disclose because we're already providing the support and the right kind of culture and environment um for the individuals to flourish so they don't, they don't feel you know they can if they want to but they don't feel they have to so that whole that's you know there's that saying where get your house in order first before you start inviting people to the party and that's what, what the work that we've been doing at the bbc that's what it's been very much about because we know disclosure is an issue. Um, I think it's, it depends on the culture of the organisation. You know, if you have an open uh, culture, um, you know, and accepting and, and allowing people to be there, bring their authentic selves into the workplace, then, you know, disclosure will happen. But if it's, if it's the opposite where, you know, um, disclosure could potentially mean it affects your job, affects your progression, um, and how you're viewed in the workplace, then it, it you know, people will, will be afraid to talk about it. They won't be as open and, and they will continue to mask and pretend to be neurotypical just to fit in to that culture. Um, so, yeah, it's, it is a big, it's, a, it's an important thing. But um, I think if organisations start to work on their environment and culture and just in, in general be more accepting and provide all the support for people, um, then it, sh it, it shouldn't be an issue, really, and, and that everyone's accepted as they are. Yeah. yeah. And I, was, I was just going to add that, that I think in, in terms of that, that culture of acceptance and, and recognition, I think, I think it, it would be, you know, what, what we're trying to do, what we'd really like to see is, is to have 
is to have neurodiversity form part of a conversation. When we're talking about diversity and inclusion as a strategy or an agenda, I think it's important. What, what we'd like to see increasingly is, is neurodiversity listed alongside gender, alongside especially disability, rather than this assumption that it fits underneath neatly within disability. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can appreciate, you know, again, it's around this not telling people how to identify, not telling people what they have or what, what they haven't got. Um, but I, I, I do think, you know, some people don't, you know, if, if you're having an event and it's listed as dis a disability event, are you necessarily going to have everybody who identifies as ND going to that to talk about, uh, you know, their experiences and their perspectives? Um, if, if we can say it's neurodiversity and disability, is, is that going to invite more people? Is it going to open up the conversation a little bit and make people feel more part of a community uh, and open to those different ideas? So it, it's kind of interesting to see where neurodiversity and disability, how that's going to work out and where that's going to go. Um, but I do think we need to start recognising that some people don't necessarily identify in that way. And, and you know, can we open up that conversation a little bit more? So interestingly, I'm not going to politicise this, but this was on the manifesto of a particular party some years ago, um, that neurodiversity to be recognised, you know, separately from um, um, se separately from disability. Um, so unfortunately, it's been quite a few years since since that was being discussed and debated. So what so what you're saying, I think, is absolutely right. I think the challenge we've got at the moment. Um, Anne Kakeno, I hopefully is watching today, um, did three years of research around uh, what it's like from a manager's perspective to manage somebody on the spectrum. Uh, and I think what, is, what comes out of that is there's still the belief that somebody needs to um, be, uh, needs to disclose, needs to say before they can get the reasonable adjustments. And the flip side of that, I know we've discussed this before, is that um, a lot of people don't want to disclose. Like, I don't want to disclose. I'm not disabled in my mind. But actually, if you said to me, hey, Theo, do you want a bit of extra time on the test for the interview? I'd be like, yeah, actually, that'd be really good because I read really slowly and I make mistakes. And I need to go over it several times. So that's a different question, right? That's, it is a reasonable adjustment, but I, you, I don't need to tell you I'm disabled for you to <laughs> make that adjustment, right? Um, yeah, uh, you know, it, it, again, it's it's like a it's a tenuous you know kind of thing because it's um, for me personally, um, it, it's like um, growing up um, through the education system uh, because I was not classed as disabled, um, I wasn't uh, given the reasonable adjustments and the support that I needed. You know, they're like, you're not, you're, you know, I was told umpteen times, you know, my parents were told you're not disabled and therefore you can't have this support and, and you're going to struggle. And and what we did was struggle or work around it. Um, and then <laughs> the irony of it is as soon as I started doing well, um, that's when the disability label came on board and saying, oh, you're one of our own, you're, dis you know, you, you have a disability, aren't you brilliant, aren't you amazing, the minute I started doing well. So, but then it's like, but... I, you know, I, you know, throughout my life, I've not had that label on there, and 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 it's like people should have a right to choose. Again, going back to choice, um, you know, uh, for me, the environment is disabling. Depending on what situation I am or whatever, it can be disabling. But I, per I personally feel, you know, I'm not a, as a disabled person. It it depends on the situation or the environment. The environment can be disabling for uh, you know, ND individuals. And we need to recognise that. And also there are a group of people within that community who, who won't tick that disability box. And we should we should really respect their wishes rather than, again, and you know, imposing a label on them, which they don't necessarily want. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think to your point also, Theo, in terms of having to share, disclose, declare, um, you know, it's important to recognise uh, you know, the effect, the importance of the Equality Act uh, and disability as a protected characteristic uh, and ND conditions within that and the obligation that puts on employers and organisations to support and offer reasonable adjustments. Um, you know, and, and, and that's, that's crucial. It's really important. And, and you know, that, that's something that we need to recognise. But it's about, it is about, you know, it's a shame that we have to rely on, on, what often becomes a minimum bar of legislation, which is as long as you do this much, you're fine. You don't have to go above and beyond. And, and I think, you know, that, that's a shame. If we re rely on legislation, you get so far. 
but but we should think about this as a you know this is about uh, business this is about an opportunity you know people are, are an organization uh, an organization's greatest asset so why would you not go uh, above and beyond to, to, to be able to, to bring out the talent of that asset, that, to, to create an environment in which you can get the most out of the people uh, that, that, that you are asking to do a job, um, you know, and, and recognize the importance of the diversity, uh, you know, across that workforce. But I, I think let's, it, it, it's this, you know, it's this idea of support, and only so many, you know, certain people need support. It's like everybody needs it. Uh, myself and Lena have spoken about this often in the past, uh, um, and we have with you as well. I think it's, it's you know, we, we've talked about destigmatizing the label of support. We all need it, um, you know, whether it's certain medical trips, whether it's looking after the household, the family, these things come up, children get sick. You know, we, we need support from our employer and from our organizations. Everybody does. Um, you know, not not just because of a disability, not just because of, you know, whatever. Um, I think we need to understand we all need support. We all ask for support. So let's just recognise it and destigmatise that. Brilliant. And so I heard a stat the other day from the ADHD Foundation, 50% of those diagnosed with ADHD are now adults, right? So we've got to think about that from an, uh, an employer's perspective. You now have a good proportion of people, and it won't just be ADHD, it will be um, people on the spectrum, it will be dyscalculia, whatever, whatever the people are now looking around and going, well, hang on a minute, there's this thing happening. And actually, I, I associate with what they're talking about. Oh, oh, I'm going to go and find out a bit more about this. Oh, right. So, so this is happening. Um, and this is part of the explosion of neurodiversity in the search terms in Google. What is neurodiversity? What is ADHD? I, I need to know. Um, so this is great. But what this is, what's happening, I fear, and what, I, and to go back to what you've just said, which I think is really important, is that what's happening is now people are going to their HR or their managers and going, I need support, I need help, I'm ADHD or whatever it is, or um, these lights are pretty bright, can we do something about them? Manager may, may be good manager, may not be a good manager to Anne Cocaine's research again, depending on where they sit. Go to HR, this person's a nightmare. They, they, I don't know what, like, they said something about ADHD. I'm, I'm a bit concerned and they're a real problem to manage. HR go, oh, I'm going to have a clue about this. We're going to contact the solicitors with the legal team or whatever. Legal team go, oh, we don't know. We're going to have to go and read. Before you know it, you know, the legal advice is, well, have they, um, are they disclosing? Have they got a disability? Have they got, have they got, have they, well, tell them, you know, and we'll manage them through the process out of the business. And I think that is the, the danger we've got now is we've got not just the individual, we've got their manager, and this is why you are both brilliant, because it shows how two people coming together can create something incredible, right? There needs to be the rest. Just two individuals willing to listen to each other and have that conversation and explore what, what can be achieved together, right? Um, and then you've got all these other people manager not known hr not known and and then it gets lost the whole thing gets lost when it's one person asking for something that ultimately is very simple um and, and i think we need to just bring it right back down to that to this and i think if we can get organizations to just think of it in that context in the human context then you know it, it hopefully it will make our life so much easier right i, I think it's yeah, it's getting back to basics of being, you know, thinking about what a manager is there for, you know, you're there to support people in order for them to do the best job that they can do. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, certainly within the remit of, of thinking about su supporting or, or, or kind of, you know, neurodiversity within the workplace, it's just about be, be, be a manager, learn, you know, the soft skills required to be able to manage people. Uh, and, and it's not about telling them what to do. It's about asking them what they need. And it's just changing that question a little bit in order for them to succeed. I don't need to tell people what to do. They know their job, they know it better than I do. Um, my job is to remove the barriers, to ask them what they need to do the job that they have to do. And, um, you know, it's, it's think about it as a collaborative partnership. This isn't a hierarchical situation. I think if, if we get back to the basics of, of, of supporting each other, of looking out for each other, of being a team, 
as opposed to being individuals and I'm a manager and therefore you've got to listen to what I tell you. Um, I think it, it doesn't just benefit neurodiversity, it benefits everything. Uh, and the way organizations pull together and work together, um, you know, I think that's what it's about basically. Yeah, I've, I'm going to go back to the whole, um, the key word being allyship. For me, Sean, as a manager, has is, is been an, a, an ally in the truest sense. He's empowered me and given me a voice. And he, you know, it's been very collaborative, like a partnership and uh, not hierarchical at all. I feel comfortable if to talk to him. He's been open and, and uh, I've been open and we've listened to each other and things. And that's, that's how it starts. It's a conversation. Um, it's as simple as that, really. Um, a little bit of support actually goes a long way. And there's this sort of misconception that uh, people who identify as ND need a lot of support and they're going to be hard work, which is kind of wrong. So we need to change that, really, that perception. You know what? And Anne's just come on the chat now and made a very good point, which comes out in a research, is that actually being a good frontline manager is tough as well and not to underestimate that. Um, and, and I think it's a really good point because it's not difficult, but the advice needs to be right to the manager and that advice could be coming from other places like HR or legal. And they, they, that becomes the challenge, doesn't it? That if, if the manager was just given very simple advice on how to be human, how to interact with that individual, and maybe even just given the time, because some managers are maybe overloaded with work and pressure, maybe managing 10 people, dependent on their work environment. And, and all of those things, I think we need to consider. We need, need to find better ways to support managers as well as That's the individual sat in a team. That's exactly my point, uh, you know, that, and Lena was talking about support. Um, I get support from my manager. I've got somebody who listens to me, who asks for my opinion, who asks my advice. Um, so so it, it, the way I'm treated, the way that, you know, the way I'm managed means that I'm able to reciprocate that to the people that, that have reported into me. And it is, it is about the, it is all about down to this fact that support can be democratized. Everybody needs support. And if, if we have that structure in place where managers are supported, they'll be able to better support the people that report into them. And it is a tough job. So, you know, what I don't want to do, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, we're using a big stick to kind of, you know, be a better manager, you're rubbish. Um, you know, it, it is about, no, learn to, to understand what it is that a manager needs to have, you know, see this as a trip of development, see this as an opportunity to learn a different skill. Um, you know, this is something I think that can be learned. I don't think it's necessarily, you know, some people are born with it and they're born natural leaders, uh, but I think other people can learn it, um, you know, and it is about let, let's invest in people. Yeah, brilliant. I think that's probably a, a good place to, to put it all together. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for, for those commenting as well. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you, Theo. It was a brilliant show. It was wonderful. So um, without further ado, we've got Dan waiting in the wings. I'm going to get rid of the three of you and say thank you again uh, and then bring in Dan. It's interesting. Have you noticed when I appear, two other people appear. I'm just saying. We're here. Why? <laughs> this no, is the time no. you can only get us to shut it. up, Martin, is what you're saying. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just, just saying. Isn't it? We're, we're listening <laughs> intentively. Yeah, fantastic show, uh, Theo, Sean, Liana. It was great. Great to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Catch you all later. Did it? Uh, so this this is your job now to fill. No, it's been really interesting. So I've been looking at kind of the tweets and even rereading, and I have been absorbed. I even forgot to take some pictures because I've been so absorbed in the conversations. And I think, you know, here where there was a talk about um, line managers, the responsibilities, and how do we have access to the support and as we continue to move forward, these, these aspects around empathy and seeing out of another person's eyes and being willing to unlearn. Absolutely. I think it, I mean, it's, it, um, it's probably worth also stopping at this moment to, to say we've obviously, this is uh, it's 12 o'clock now. Um, we have got, uh, Dan's gonna be running Dan's show. I I've got the right Dan. There's mul I had multiple choices of Dan's here. Let me go, <laughs> should I go for the other Dan as well? Cause he did, he's in logged in twice. Let's bring both Dans in. Not that there's a schizophrenic Dan, but there we go. Often the way with me, I, I, my ego is so big, as they say, that I'm in twice. So uh, that being oh, yeah. another that's another conversation the other day. Um, <laughs> so, uh, said, so Dan, 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 leave it with you. No pressure. You finish at one. Just saying that. One or else. We go off to somewhere else when you, at one o'clock. <laughs> it, it's live and then I, I go off and then that's it. As long as you can hear me at the same time, that's, that's fine for me.
Um, and if we if we do go off the air at any point, I probably we've been having no, lots but of at chats. One o'clock, we we take we well, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt at one o'clock and just take you off air no matter what is what I'm saying. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. No, no, if you could possibly if that's okay, could you do that about three minutes to? Is that okay? Um, um, yeah, awesome. I'm going to say because uh, otherwise I'll um I'll just keep going. I'll just keep talking uh, forever. <laughs> Oh, fun, you guys. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, everyone. I don't know if, uh, if everyone's had time to be listening. I was just listening to uh, for, for most of the morning. And uh, yeah, I've learned. I've learned an awful lot already. Um, you know, I, I've, learned, I've learned so much. I've learned so much already. Um, fascinating. Fascinating process. Um, hey, sorry. I've, it's now a bit now, isn't it? Hey, the big idea. Hello, everyone. Um, lovely to have you all here. Hopefully you can uh, at least see me. Uh, we are recording live and going out on, on YouTube and other things as well, uh, which is awesome. You might be able to see two versions of me. I think there might be one here and another one there. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, team, can you all see and hear me? Yes, yes we can. We can. All good for me. Oh, that, that's, that's, that's okay. Hey, as long as we're all here, that's the key bit for me, if I'm truthful you know. Um, Simon Selleck says, and he's a very clever chap, and I don't know if I pronounced his name right, which is ironic what we're going to be talking about today, pronouncing someone's name wrong. There you go. Um, Simon says, Simon says, I don't know him so well to say this, Simon. Anyway, he says this thing, great book called uh, Start With Your Why. Has everyone of you guys read Start With Your Why? It's a great I book. Have, yeah. Like, purpose yeah. and passion and things like that. It's a great TED talk that he does as well. Um, and of course, to start with our why, well, today we're going to be talking about diversity and inclusion. Yeah, about what's the big idea? But actually, I, I argue against Simon Selleck. I think yeah. don't start with your why. No, start with your who. The who is the most important? Who? Who is going to do stuff? And more importantly for us, who are we? Yes, we got deep on a, on a, on a, on a lunchtime. Uh, Socrates said, know thyself, didn't he? Uh, if, if he actually Indeed. did exist. I know he could be just an amalgamation of different points. Anyway, that's a different chat. Um, point big is, know thyself. More importantly, know you. And I'm not going to do an Alan Partridge, knowing me, knowing you. <laughs> oh, I almost did, didn't I? I almost did. You did. Oh, you did. Proving my age. <laughs> I just did as well. <laughs> proving my age. Anyway, the whole point was that was a segue, a filling segue into who are we? And actually, more importantly, who are you? So I'm going to throw up a coin in the air and I'm going to say, oh, we'll go on um, first names first and first letter of first name, which I know is a brilliant way. <laughs> Because we've had this chat before, of so going in. So I'm going to go. Uh, who'd like to go first? First, le- first name, sorry, first name. Introduce yourself. That first, so, uh, well, yeah. seeing as, as I'm the A, so I'll, I'll go first. At least I know the alphabet. That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Who are you while we're here? Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Asma Yunus and uh, I currently work as a marketing manager for Mobica. So we're a software engineering provider based in Manchester, um, but we've got global offices and we provide software development across the stack. Um, and the reason why, why I'm here, why I'm part of this, why I'm you know speaking with Dan and Kai and, and Zach is, is because when I look back on my own career, I've been in marketing for quite a while now, um, and I realized I had like almost an epiphany, we're going to call it last year, where I realized that at every point in my career, the, the main hurdles, the struggles, the battles, the challenges, um, I used to think I was alone in them and that it was very much a personal thing and, and a reflection on me and, and who, who and my work and my, my ethics and things like that. Um, but over the last year, being on things like this, speaking to other people within the industry, who have come from my background, um, I've come to realize that actually the struggles and the battles that I've faced are actually completely common. Um, and it's the same story over and over again. And through listening to those experiences, through hearing those journeys, they've actually empowered me to make the changes to, to progress for, for myself. So to, to move forward, to get the, the roles that I wanted, to get the jobs that I wanted and, um, that was really my reason for kind of joining Dan and his team and the MPA and, and just to kind of, to be part of that process then for hopefully for somebody else and to really share my story, my journey, my experiences and the tips and the, the advice that I've kind of come across over the years that may help other people move forward when they've had the struggles, um, which do come down to diversity. They come down to being included and, and being represented. Which is awesome, fantastic. Um, as I don't know the alphabet, sadly, very well, um, who's, who's next? Technically, it would be me. But I, if, I know what, do you want me to go next? I suppose I'm D, aren't I? Good Lord. Okay, it I'm makes D. Sense. So I, yeah, it would make sense. It would be nice. Logic goes out the window with me. 
Um, yes, I'm Dan Dan Sodgren. Um, I do stuff occasionally with the BBC. I don't like to talk about it. <laughs> I do occasionally with BBC. I do occasional stuff with radio and other things. But my big one really is is I work for a company called Your Flock. Your Flock is uh, an HR and tech startup company which helps companies uh, make sure that they recruit on values and that helps the diversity and inclusion thing. Diversity and inclusion is a passionate point for me, not only because my daughter is literally in the other room there as well as we're self-isolating at this moment in time, so she's important to me. So uh, that's very important for her future, but also I come from my diverse background myself. I'm half Jamaican, half Swedish. Um, and also I noticed every day that there aren't enough I don't think there's enough of us in the right places. We are underrepresented in so many areas in tech, especially in tech. And because I'm a futurist, because I do a lot of stuff with technology, my bigger fear is the implications of that. There is a much bigger problem with a lack of diversity and inclusion and equality inside technology for the next driver for the next years, because it will create products which themselves will be problematical for society. That is the, the big issue for me. And that's why that's the big idea. The big idea will be for 2021, we'll need to bring in diversity, not because it's a nice to have, but because it's a must have. Um, so that, that was me. I'm Dan Dan Sodegrin. And uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and other stuff talking about loads of things, proving that my daughter is also here. She's now, she's literally like we're on a live show. She's literally handing me a note. Yes, darling. So whoever's next, they go next. Yes. Yes. So Dad. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep, Who would so like to next? Yeah, I think if you're going through the alphabet, then that'd definitely be me. So I'm yep. just to get that right as well. Uh, so good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Ishak. Everyone calls me Zach. Um, I come from um, a very different, different background because I've worked in quite a few different sectors, but also being someone who's always been a representative in them sectors. So I spent 10 years in the construction industry where I was predominantly the only person from a being background through two apprenticeships, um, also being on uh, building sites, et cetera, et cetera, before I then made the move into software development. Um, when I made the move into software development, I was obviously uh, having to then go through a re-education period whilst being a father, having two kids. Um, and also it was the fear then of having the, um, of facing the adversity of coming from a background which wasn't your traditional educational route, no university, et cetera. Um, obviously got through all that, but at the same time, I think for myself, it would be nice to to know someone or to have the opportunity to speak to people or mentors who have been through what I've been through, who can relate to uh, the problems that I was facing for me to then ask questions to relate to have a mentor with. So part of me getting involved with the big idea um, and with everything we do for the MPA is to put uh, number one, put myself in that position where people can approach me, which they have done. Um, I've been helping a lot of people with uh, getting into the industry and giving them tips and advice and helping with CVs. Uh, but it's also to help other people who are in the industry to connect and represent people from the backgrounds that need representing. So whether that's from the being background or whether that's people from um, the educationally disadvantaged, I would say uh, disadvantaged in the sense that they didn't get to go to university or maybe they're adults coming back into education. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that's something that we can really work on in 2020 and beyond. Awesome. Proper inclusivity being, of course, not just then the, we won't start unpacking the BAME uh, word itself or that agenda, if that's the case for today. I'm not a massive fan of it, but that would be a whole different uh, hour. Um, so, so I'm not going to do that. But of course, in inclusivity being not just around race or gender, uh, they're being the most obvious ones. I mean, Theo Smith uh, just did a uh, talk uh, just a couple of minutes ago about neurodiversity. And it's absolutely, you know, that's hugely important. Uh, but also other things you say, you know, from socioeconomic backgrounds and also ages, all these things, this is true inclusion. And that's, you know, the big idea is it has to be inclusivity for all. Um, and on, on that note, I'm going to bring in Kai um, to introduce himself and to explain why he's here. Hi, thank you. Thank you. So Kai, Kai Ojo, I work for a global <coughs> software company. Um, so we do enterprise uh, project management software, an amazing company. We're actually a French company, but we started the UK office uh, in 2016, which I run as the managing director. I've uh, got an amazing team here with me in Media City. Um, I managed to sneak into the office uh, just uh, to do this session. Also, I am sneaking in every now and then to try and get a, a change of scenery as we uh, adjust to the re new reality that we're all in. Um, so why, why am I um, involved in this? I'm actually in a, an interesting place in my own life right now in the sense that with um, the advent of the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the murder of uh, George Floyd and a number of different events over the last few months, reflecting on my own life, my own experiences in education and in, in career and realizing 
um, I guess, a bit like as my Eunice mentioned earlier on that, you know, I have been through a number of challenges and how do you try and encapsulate that and try to package it in a way to share with people who might go through those, set, those similar um, challenges? I've got children of my own now, um, three children who I adore to bits. And some of the stories that I hear from them from the school um, pains me to listen to sometimes. And uh, it, it reflects some of the experiences that I had. And, and so it's incumbent on, on people like me, like us, as, as leaders in, in community and in, in, in the workplace, to try and find ways to capture that information and capture those experiences so that we can share it with them so that they can feel empowered themselves and feel that they are represented in the world in a way that allows them to, um, you know, you know, ex exemplify what they can be themselves uh, in the future. So it's funny, really. I'll give you a very quick story. My daughter, she, I came home the other day and she was on the Nintendo Switch um, playing away and she saw me come in the door and she ran straight for me and said, Daddy, come and see what I've got. And it turns out that on, uh, she was playing Animal Crossings and what had happened is that they released a new bunch of av avatars on there and she saw one that looked just like her. It had hair and in bunches, just like herself. And the, the facial expression that she had, and I looked at my wife and I said, representation right there. And, and it's little, little things like that that then make them feel that they're not alone. So when she's in school, she's surrounded by her friends, who she loves to bits. Um, but I, as an adult, can see that she's underrepresented. So when things like that happen, little nuggets of experiences like that, then raises her own confidence in herself. And, and so one of the things that I'm keen to do through um, the work that we do with MPA and, and, and Dan and the big idea is around trying to give exposure to schools, colleges and, and the younger generation so they can see themselves represented um, and so they can aspire to roles that they can, you know, see, yeah, if that person can do it, that means I can do it as well. We had Charlie Martin on earlier on, who's a racing car driver, um, and her story is absolutely amazing. And um, I'm an F1 fan myself, and we've all seen the story with Lewis Hamilton and his achievements lately. And, you know, you need people in those positions and to, to represent, you know, the, the diversity there is in the world so that the children can see themselves in that and then aspire to them as well. Otherwise, we're all losing out, really, because it means that they're not fulfilling their potential, um, if you like. And it's important that we try and do that so that we can, you know, as we say, with a big idea to make make the world a better place. So uh, yeah, yeah, that is the uh, that's a, a a a wonderful story. I just literally yeah, just a wonderful story. I didn't want to get too emotional on it, but that's a wonderful story. But it's, it's, it really is important, isn't it? It's as you say, the small knowledge. But actually, I always think that you know the 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 small things that become the big things. I mean, they are the reality of the situation. Now, it might feel just like a small nudge, but for a tech company to do that, remember, it's a company, a series of individuals yeah. are making that choice. You know, it's not yeah. a, a something that doesn't exist. You know, it, it doesn't exist outside the human experience. Human beings are making those choices. And when they make those choices, so that yeah. makes a difference to the world and makes the world a better place. And it, even though they might not always think about that secondary consequence, that is one of the most important reasons why we should be doing stuff. You know, and a lot of people do talk to me about, you know, why should we be caring so much about diversity and inclusion? Actually, not only is it the next generation, and this is a brilliant, well, terrible segue, but yeah, it was my thumb attempt to go through a segue. Into the first question, really, is like, why is it so important? Why do you think personally diversity and inclusion is so important? Not just from your own opinion and your own life experience, but why else is? What are the deeper kind of business reasons? Because we're most of, we're all, and most people on the call or listening, I would imagine, are, are from a business background as well. So why is it important uh, for businesses and organisations uh, to be much more inclusive in 2021? And uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm definitely going to instantly put that over to. Oh, I can't do it to Kai. Uh, so, uh, um, Zach, we'll, uh, it's like, we'll, we need to go first because my daughter's now just raiding the fridge. Give me a second. I'm back in a second. Not a problem. Should I answer that while, we wait, while we're waiting for him or should I wait for I'd him? Go, I'd go for it. just answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so, for me, being someone, as mentioned earlier, that came from uh, when I was 30, 31 when I transitioned into tech and Applying for a lot of the jobs for a junior role, traditionally it was, I was going to get to people who were 20, 21, 22. So when I finally got into a role, um, there was so much more I was able to bring to the role because I had people skills, soft skills, communication skills. Um, I could obviously speak quite well. I could deal with the team. I could lead a team. And 
one of the things I then noticed going around to different companies and working with different people is that people who are coming from different, a diverse group of hires, sorry, now, is that, yeah, um, you are hiring somebody with who might be uh, a junior level, who might be slightly older, or who might come from a slightly different background, but what they're actually bringing in terms of their other skills, their soft skills, and what they can bring to a team is absolutely amazing. So I think that's one of the uh, standout points for me. I love that. I love that. That's absolutely right. My apologies as I say, I was just bringing my full sense and my full, full self to work here as <laughs> the reality of being on lockdown and being self-isolating with a loved one. Who I do love dearly, Mia. It's not that you're not important. It's just a moment of life telling you that. Um, she didn't, she wasn't, she didn't dive in. So that's good. But I think what you're saying there about the soft skills, and I, 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 one of the things that I get a bit cross about sometimes is we call them soft skills, when really, I think, personally for me, they're the harder skills. You know, it's the emotional intelligence and it's the bringing your full self to work and all these things. And as you rightly say there, my friend, and it's a brilliant point, that people from diverse backgrounds, socioeconomically and other backgrounds, they bring this richness of their own life to your business. And actually, it, mean, it means it develops in a much better and deeper way than it would do if it was just standing by itself. You know, and they didn't. So those soft skills that people bring, those, those extra points that they bring in might be they're very hard to quantify, I think, sometimes, but they might bring in a richness that you know, is almost uncomprehensible, but it, it adds a vastness to it. Um, and yeah, so uh, it's over to you. What do you think about uh, diversity and why is it important for organisations? Because I know you may, you may not have mentioned it, because I know you also work for the BBC as well. So and I know the BBC were just talking earlier. So I'm just, can you bring any of those kind of experiences over from that and why we should be doing it more? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with everything Zach said and, and why it's so important. And I'll be honest, it was my, when I became, because I, I present on the BBC Radio Manchester, so I'm a presenter um, there on a Friday night. And it was actually my experience of working within the BBC that boosted a lot of my confidence, if I'm quite honest, because it was the people that I met there and seeing the BBC Radio Manchester team is is quite nicely diverse um, for me you know it's there's always room to, to improve but considering all the other places that I've worked in it was the most diverse team I've ever worked for and seeing that respect for colleagues that respect for culture that respect for everybody as a person and if something ever came up it was let's have a discussion about it or is everybody okay with this are you comfortable um is there anything we can do to make you feel more comfortable? And it was honestly eye-opening. And I've never worked in a company or a culture that has done that, you know, from a small team level anyway. Um, and it was one of the reasons why I, I did kind of think, actually, I don't know why in the past I've apologized for certain things or I've tried to fit in um, rather than just, you, you know, be true to, to who I am and, and what I can do and what I can bring to the table and instead trying to fit into the little box that I think I needed to be in. Um, but also, you know, as, as much as I think, you know, we need to remember that we are bringing those, you know, all important soft skills and those experiences and the different socioeconomic backgrounds we come from, but also that there's skills within everybody um, which regardless of where you come from, regardless of your background, need to be appreciated. And you shouldn't have to be a certain, you know, um, I shouldn't have to be Indian or white or, or black or, or, you know, Chinese. I shouldn't have to come from a certain place to be associated with a certain skill set. You know, I can still be um, a, a British Muslim Indian woman, but I can still be confident, outspoken, and um, you know, not have to need a man to dictate where I go, which is what the stereotype is. Um, so it's kind of bashing through those stereotypes as well, where people maybe treat you or speak to you in a, in a different way and, and moving more towards this culture of actually we're all just people and we need to be more respectful of that. Um, sorry, I feel like I went off on a tangent there, but no, no, <laughs> I think I've done no, this before with you, Dan. No, no, far from it. No, no, no. And I was being, I was being as uh, respectful as I can with my uh, lack of emotional intelligence by not trying to interrupt you as soon as you paused, uh, because <laughs> I was listening to what you were saying. You're absolutely right. It, it, the lovely thing, and uh, earlier on today, I was listening to I think it was Vanessa who was talking about you know, bringing that whole self to work, but also kind of being a bit more not, not necessarily proud of our differences, but, but yeah, actually, no, no, that's true. It's proud of our differences, and so I think she was talking from a neurodiverse point of view. And she was saying, well, I've kind of, I've come to terms with it, but not only that, but now I'm, you know, it becomes a superpower. And I think that's 
true of so many of us that we ha we sometimes light you know put our lights behind a bushel or something and then of course you say there are the other aspects about other folks series and then that becomes a stereotypical moment and i suppose that that's you know diversity inclusion is so important because then you're starting to learn a lot more about other people and in a diverse group you can be you can start to learn to be more respectful because without having that bigger group of folk how would other people ever know if that makes sense you know i think i think sometimes we blame companies and say well they're not diverse but what happens if that company itself because it's not diverse finds it almost impossible to become diverse um i've just realized now it's a chicken and egg moment that i've talked myself into luckily for me i've got kai who's going to rescue me and talk about some other whites of why diversity is important especially in technology uh, because of course he works and, and manages a huge company um, that comes from in France, but is now in Media City. So it's over yeah. to you. No, definitely. I mean, a couple of things first. The, the, the session that we're having here and now, um, here's the thing. This is actually by inference, the, the, one of the benefits of doing, you know, something around diversity and inclusion, because by inference of us having this session, we as leaders will go back into our businesses, richer, more diverse, more aware of the topics and the challenges. So our organizations by inference will be richer. For the poor yeah. and you know by by doing this we're actually you know this is one of the reasons why we need to do it um you know as a, as a tech company uh, a global company we are global we've got offices in paris munich san francisco um in fact, all over the us east and west coast in the us japan um media city tunisia wow. um and so as a management team when we meet um it's, it's a french company so we do all our management sessions actually in french so i speak french as well uh, which is very it's very hard trying to do the whole management call in French, but it's it's you you hear the stories of each regions and the challenges that they're facing. We're all having similar challenges, but in very very um, localized contexts. And by having those conversations at that level, we're able to share ideas and understand how one one you know one way of working might not work in another uh, situation, for example. And so as a tech company, you know, in Media City, where we are now, we're, we're about to start doubling the size of the team. So I'm recruiting right now for, to wow. expand the team. And that in and of itself is a challenge because I, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the recruitment drive is, has got a very, um, albeit, you know, um, to be completely, um, uh, what's the word, um, controversial, um, more biased towards diversity inclusion. I want to do that. And in talking to recruitment companies and talking to people who are going to help me with that, that in itself is a challenge to make sure they understand why I want to do it. Because in the tech company, it's important that we have a diverse background in the organization because our software and our, our solutions and the way we consult with our customers when we're trying to deploy our solution, if we are insular about the way that we do it and we take no meaning from their own context, we'll miss things. So mm -hmm. we have an in-joke in, you know, between ourselves in, in, internally in the organization about how the French do things this way, the English do things this way, the Americans do things this way, and the Germans, well, they need to have a list of rules for everything. Those kinds of contexts, if you're not aware of them and what they mean to those people locally, you miss things and you miss value add things, especially with technology, because then you, you don't get them. So by being more diverse, you bring that knowledge, as, as Zach said, by bringing his own experience into an organization, he can then enrich that organization so that when they then go out there with their solutions, it's relevant to more people yeah, and the people can relate absolutely. to it. Yeah? We, we build better products because we listen to our customers more and our customer is the globe. I love listening to you, know, especially because you're a global tech company. So it does, you know, that's exactly what it's about, isn't it? You know, if you've got a global reach, then you've almost presupposed a culture which is multicultural because of course you have a global reach. Uh, but you've also still got a safeguard against becoming too uh, siloed in your approaches, and especially in recruitment. And the reason why I'm particularly smiling is because your flock, which is the tiny tech startup that, that, that I help run, um, is around that recruitment piece. It's around how do you get more diversity and inclusion in recruitment and actually getting more recruiting, more hires. One of the ways to do that is to recruit people based on values rather than some of the other slightly odd and, to be fair, sometimes literally almost illegal metrics that people use for success. And one of the ones that I and I know uh, Liz, who was on the call, uh, call earlier, uh, we both get a bit cross about is this whole idea of culture fit and the idea that you should fit into the culture of the company you're about to join. And actually, I, you know, I, I strongly argue against that. So. I don't think it's about culture fit. I think it's about values fit. The values are the thing underneath all of these things. Yeah. However, you should bring in more different cultures, and it shouldn't be about culture. It shouldn't be about 
you know, can we go for a drink with them at, you know, at 4.30 on a Friday for just a whole host of reasons. But you'll be surprised how many tech startups um, and almost was probably appalled and certainly in creative and the digital world and agency world, as we're very famous for in Manchester, um, you know, that drinking culture and those other problems. Yeah, I mean, that's a deeper thing. Because you create, or you sometimes you don't mean to, you create a culture which itself becomes non-diverse and then it excludes and it's not inclusive. And some of the things you think are the value adds would be the exact opposite. And, and to be fair, I'm completely stealing something that uh, someone else uh, I know, as I said, uh, because we wrote it down, we were talking about it the other day. In fact, we're making some graphics for the MPA and um, for, for what we're doing, the big idea here. And we made some of those graphics we're going to be pumping out in the next couple of weeks. And they've all got these top tips on how can we do things better as an industry. And that's what I want to go on to next. I think, you know, the why part of it, brilliantly covered by everyone. And it's hugely important. But actually, how, you know, how are we, well, how, how, is, how has diversity been a problem in your life, if that's OK for me to talk about, you know, with your experiences? Not too many negative. Remember, you know, it's a live show and it's a nice and, you know, fun bit as well but it's the reality isn't it you know how's it affected us all and, and how's it impacted our families etc and then later on we'll then discuss you know what can companies do to, to make a difference so i'm going to go um for the how if that's okay i'm going to do it for myself first here because um my own personal story around this is that diversity and value stuff does make a huge difference um you know the how for me i was quite affected by a lack of diversity where i was brought up i was cliched being you know i was literally the only uh, the only brown guy or the only black guy in the village i literally was that me and my brother actually uh, adopted by uh, by a vicar it's very you know, two thousand people everyone else is white yeah so you can imagine you know late 1970s uh, i think uh, guys smiling to this because absolutely right to you know, you can imagine the horror show what that really was in a in a small mining town in, near nottinghamshire and it did make a huge difference that lack of diversity by itself made a huge difference to how i started off in life but also you know some of the things that i then went on to do now i, I sometimes use this as a I, i'm an entrepreneur so i like to spin a negative into the positive so because i stood out i could stand out but but standing out is not always a good thing but you can make it into a good thing if that makes sense that's probably why i show off so much and talk so much <laughs> it's, it's probably fun um but you know you can always spin it into a positive then i suppose for me the lack of diversity in that is most probably why i now work with the mpa talking about diversity and inclusion why i know it's so important because you literally will create a situation and we have a danger, I think, maybe not in Manchester, uh, because we're quite a diverse uh, crowd in Manchester and it's pretty good. It could be better, but, you know, but compared to other places and in the creative industries and digital tech, I think, has a bit of an issue. Certainly around funding there's a huge issue around uh, problems with diversity. Um, the, the stats on uh, being able to get uh, funding as a, as a black woman is just a horror show from a founder point of view. I think it's literally like. Like there's one person that's managed to do Series A funding in the last decade. And if you think about that and the billions of money that's gone in, it's, it's an appalling statistic. It really is. It's, it's terrible. Um, but that, that, that's, how it, that's how it affects it. So I suppose that was my question to you. Is I know from, from, our, from my point of view that as a, uh, as, a, as a founder from a diverse background, Flock itself, by its very nature, is a diverse team. We're a diverse and remote team. Half of our board are women. Um, at least 30% of the people that work there are from a BAME background. Um, you know, and we are, at the moment, we're looking to recruit people from diverse backgrounds. That's just exactly for the reason that Kai's talking about, because we know that you build better teams. You build better teams and build better products because of it. But I'm going to ask a question because I know because of your new coding background. How have you found, um, have you found your experience so far at the beginning of your career, uh, Zach? So, so I realised I didn't even, I didn't segue at all there, Zach. I gave you no chance whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I was ready. I was ready and prepared. <laughs> um, so it is an interesting question. You know, how has diversity been a problem? Because there's two folds of it for me. Because I'm somebody who's been who's worked in obviously a few different industries. So in my first set of industries, the main point it was being the colour of my skin, how you pronounce my name where can I pray, et cetera, because I was obviously in the construction, which is not a, a, an industry where you see a lot of people who represent us. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel that's something that we've already touched on as a whole, and it's something that's already sort of inclusive. So being in tech is more, I found more diversity sort of, uh, especially as being new, as you mentioned, new to coding, it was age, um, age diversity and also educational diversity, as I touched on earlier. So I found it was actually harder um, I'm 31 now. So when I started my transition to tech, I was 28, 29. Uh, so I find it harder when I was applying for jobs because everything was graduate, 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 graduate. Um, and every interview I attended, it was 
19 year olds, 20 year olds, 21 year olds. And I was set there thinking, you know, I'm set with kids and I've got real world problems to go against. But it was a fear as well that them things were going to go against me. And I think one of the biggest fears of coming into tech as somebody who's not got uh, a degree in computer science or somebody who's, uh, you know, a parent and is retraining is number one, are they going to look at my educational background? Is that going to be enough? Number two, are they going to look at my age and think, well, it, you know, he's, he's, he's too old for this, which is ridiculous because you're never too old to do anything. You're never too old to train or to learn or, you know, to be the person that you want to be. So then with, that was for me was um, a problem in diversity. But at the same time, I didn't see it as a problem, which is why I'm set here for you today. I didn't let it affect my mindset, which is why I went through the retrain, which is why I was at a boot camp five days a week and I was working uh 24 hours over the weekend to put food on the table for my kids because I thought well not only am I going to get myself into this industry I'm going to put myself in a position to help other people who don't come from the traditional educational background who want to go through apprenticeships when they're 30 35 40 45 um, and I'm going to put myself into that place where I can hopefully mentor inspire and take that negative like you said and spin it into a positive I must have just just listening to that I mean that's you're doing it already my friend you're doing it already you're already inspiring just from that story alone. That's an inspir- that is an inspirational story. I literally, I mean, God, I, I, I don't do enough. It's the honest truth. There you go. I could be doing more. You've inspired me. There you go. You've inspired me to do more. And um, it's really interesting as well. This morning, I was just talking with a chap uh, called James, uh, James from Tech Returners, uh, which was started by Becky. And Tech Returners does exactly that. It helps people from different backgrounds to return into tech. Um, so often they are um, older people rather than and it does make me smile that you think you said you were 31 was it there and you were saying you're old I, was, I literally I just I almost I almost fainted I'm um, <laughs> 40 45 I was like oh god <laughs> I didn't consider myself to be old until then oh I almost fainted uh, fair enough um you know uh, there you go I don't know I don't know I, don't, I just got a bit panicked about my age there and um, as I know you've got some great hows as well but um, can you give me some more about your own kind of personal life experience and and I know the times are changing, but can you give us some more of your kind of your, your story and your journey and, and how you've got to be the place you are and how that can inspire others? Yeah, sure. Um, I think if I look back, as you know, as I said at the start, when I, when I start to sit down and, and think and, and look back on my career and when I moved into marketing and the things that I had to do, because I did I did it kind of off my own back, I suppose. I started my own blog and um, taught myself social media did a lot of my own kind of going away, did my own wow. research, practically doing it. Um, so I'd, even though I'd studied graphic design at uni, it was never anything I moved into because I kind of always thought I want to be in business. I want to be in marketing. I knew what I wanted. Mm-hmm. I just didn't have anything around me apart from my own drive to kind of get to it. Um, and, you know, thankfully I did push hard enough. Like Zach said, you know, you put your mind to it. You, you really go for it and try not to think about, all the other noise um, and it does become you know you can make it a reality but what I found in terms of moving ahead and, and working through companies and um, the stumbling block that I tended to, to hit every time was that point of promotion or that point of moving from being a junior and getting towards a senior position or being an exec and moving into a manager and I, I often found um, that I had to work twice as hard as everybody else because I felt I had to prove something because one maybe I didn't have the the qualifications or two because they'd come from industries or or everybody kind of took a very relaxed approach I always felt like I was the one that was I will do everything whatever you want me to do I'll do it I can do this um but then I was never really kind of um rewarded for it let's say um and it was only when I started speaking to other people or looking outside of my own company and speaking to other professionals who were from my kind of a background and they would sort of say well what are you doing why, why haven't you asked go go out there and ask for what you want and when I started doing that and, and either pulling people up on it and saying look as an FYI this is everything I do this is everything I'm promised or this is everything I should be getting why mm. isn't that happening and then they'd kind of go Oh yeah, why aren't you getting that? Well, let's let's reassess the situation, and um, and I and I have had to do that. At, I'll, I'll be honest, at every stage of my career, you know, every time I've moved forward, it's only because I've asked the question, and that might be true for a lot of people, but but actually, the people that I've worked with who've then mm-hmm. been promoted above me, or they've they've never had to do that. 
and they've always been in my inst- in my experience male they've always been white um and yeah. i'm not saying that they weren't qualified because they absolutely some of them were but was i more qualified at that point did i have more experience i'll never know um but for me it's always been about i needed somebody else to tell me to have that confidence to go mm-hmm. you've got this you know what you're talking about you absolutely can do this job why are you not doing it? And then yeah. I've kind of had to sit back and go, oh yeah, I'll go, I'll go and I'll go and ask that question. <laughs> and yeah. um, and that's that's been you know such an important factor for me that confidence factor. And like I said, you know, being on the radio that gave me that confidence because I was like, I actually have a voice, you know, and figure of, figure of speech have a voice. But I I felt like that when I went into my companies and my job. Um, and I really think it's so important for other people to realize and it's it can be such a cliche you know speak out you know be true to yourself and and say what you think and always fight for what you believe in but actually the reality is quite hard when you're mm-hmm. in a job and you're worried about your position you, you don't want to upset the balance you don't want people to look down on you um so it's a, it's a very difficult task and it's it's important to know the right way to ask as well without kind of going going in all guns blazing like why didn't you promote me <laughs> <laughs> Did, did make did make me smile as well because I was listening earlier and I can't remember uh, who exactly it was who said it but we were talking mainly around the idea of psychological safety and you know as, as flock we talk about culture and the important you know company culture matters and we talk about the reason why you should all share values is because actually this can then create this psychological safety because you you all have a lot in common at that baser level now I suppose what I'm trying to get to is when you create a company culture where people feel psychologically safe they can then have those difficult conversations or even just those conversations, by the way. Um, it does always make me smile that we live in a world where people sometimes don't like to talk about money or progression or career progression to, you know, because they don't want to rock the boat, as you, you, know, as you just said there. And different cultures, you know, they're, they're not great at, they're not different cultures as, as people, but different company cultures sometimes aren't great at that. And of course, that can make a difference to, you know, how good your boss is. You know, a lot of people leave companies. I think it's something like, 34% of people leave companies because of a mismatch in culture and cultural values, but it's a much higher percent actually that leave because they don't like their boss, um, which by the way, is almost the same thing if you think about it. Bad bosses tend to ruin companies. Uh, this is again, a wonderful segue to say, but, ah, but someone who's not a bad boss, who's a great boss, is the gentleman who's going to answer next that question of, of how uh, diversity has made an impact in his life. Uh, and that's over to you, Carl. He's a great boss. Um, no pressure there. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so here's an interesting thing. So both Zach and Asma Yunus, one of the things that the, the themes that I heard in, in what they were saying around, um, you know, wanting to make sure that you were excelling in yourself, you were doing the best that you could in yourself. This goes back to childhood experiences and, and what goes on in school and the perception that you create for yourself as an identity is, and then the perception that you see of the world. And um, on the in, the in the chat, in the, the Zoom that we've got, someone's just put something along the lines of, you need, I need to see what I can be. It doesn't mean that you have to be that. It just means that you need to see what you can be. And if, if we talk about unconscious biases, but there's also a flip side, which is the negative side of the psychological safety that you, you end up creating for yourself as a child as you grow up because of what you see and the limitations that you give yourself. So when you get into the workplace, you... Whether you need to or not, you find yourself working, as you put it, um, as you, know, you, you find yourself working double hard because you think you need to. Even, even whether, irrespective of whether people have said that you need to or not, you do it because you think, right, I better do it or else. Um, and that goes back to what happens when, you know, you, I think when you're, when you're a child, you, you're growing up and the, the perceptions that you have of society. And I think, you know, when you think about what, what, is it, what is it that makes it important? So when I go back to my own experiences, um, I certainly don't want to take anything away from the employees that I've had over the years because I've had some brilliant employees and some some great and some not, some not so good managers. Um, you have to mention names. I won't mention names. I won't mention <laughs> names. Um, and you know the the I think the certainly the perception that I created for myself without realizing it is one of the biggest barriers that I've had to work through because I by inference I assumed that I was lower than average. Whether I was or not was irrelevant. I assumed that I was. So I assumed that I had to work doubly hard. I assumed that I had to constantly demonstrate that I was able to do something, even though others around me didn't seem to have to. 
they kind of seemed to just elevate around me. And I was like, okay, well, I must work harder then. It must be because I'm not working harder. And I didn't have that psychological safety to raise the question, even in a, oh, so what is it do you think I need to do to be able to get those promotions or those extra projects or whatever it might be? I kind of just felt as if, well, it's all on me. I've just got to keep doing it. And I think the the, the positive that I take from all of it was, having the right people around you to support you. So, you know, my, my family was certainly the, the anchor, if you like. Um, and now with my children, the purpose, if you like, to make sure that I can keep doing these things. So you need that, you do need that psychological safety, but um, I think society with some of the narratives that we've got, it's hard to kind of find that unless you've got more people like ourselves talking about it, sharing it and dissecting it and trying to understand it as much as possible. Um, you know, it's the, the old cliche, if you, and I was try, I was trying all the time never to use it. And I'm sure it's been said several times today. Uh, you know, if you can't you can't be it if you can't see it. But it's truly what I believe. I mean, if you literally can't see it, you can't be it. And that ranges from product placement stuff, you know, and all the way up to you know the very fact of being like you know, I know it sounds a bit silly, but you know, but seeing I saw on social media today a um, great video by a black guy who's in space because of Falcon Six or whatever. I don't really follow the space stuff, but it's a bit seeing a black astronaut. It just it just cheered me up. I'm not going to lie to you. It would have been great if it had been a lady at the same time, but it was not. But, you know, but it, it, just, it just cheered me down. I said, Absolutely. God, you know, yeah. well, you know, the world has changed and it is awesome that this can yeah. stuff be happening. Now, what I'd like to do, though, the last bit, if that's okay, and then because I know we've got loads of them, uh, I should have given it more time. So sorry, I promised I'd look at the time more and I, I haven't done it enough. So, so what are the things that, what are your top tips that you can give uh, people on the call uh, and listeners to the show uh, about what they could do for their businesses to make them uh, become more diverse. I think we've now gone through why should you do it? I think we know why. There's a few hows and how you can affect people's lives. But actually, the nitty gritty, the what, what can they do specifically that can help? And, and I come from this because you know your flock is looking for diverse front end developers for our business. Yeah. And we find it tricky. And I've learned, by the way, a lot from who I work with the MPA because you know, I was too down and deep and trying to do stuff and try to stuff with flock. But actually putting my head up and learning from you guys uh, has taught me so much. So if you could give us a couple of tips each uh, on what um, businesses like my own and bigger businesses can do to make sure that inclusion and diversity is the big idea for 2021, I'd be most grateful. And I'm going to say Kai first because I was looking at Kai. <laughs> awesome. Okay, sorry. I can do that. Um, yeah, sorry, it wasn't really good to you. Sorry. No, no. Uh, Zach, okay, Zach, go for it. Yeah, no problem. Okay, I think I need to drink. Uh, yeah. Drink first. So again, another interesting question: What can people actually do for their businesses to increase their obviously diversity in hiring? Um, as somebody who doesn't actually own a business, I can obviously only speak from person who's applied to work with businesses and somebody who's tried to help other people get the opportunity right. to work with businesses. Um, and I think one of the standout things that I, that helped me is that when businesses are hiring for tech talent, they don't just go, they don't just stick on their um, um, <clears throat> job specifications. You need to, you know, especially for a junior role, you need to have a bachelor's degree. You need to have five years of experience. You need to, you know, be able to do everything and paint the moon at the same time. It's, it's having realistic expectations because a lot of the times what companies don't realize, especially in the tech industry, is that what how they word their job specifications is actually scaring away more people than what they're actually bringing in and i've seen this firsthand with so many talented developers who are young developers or who are people uh, my age and above but they're so scared of the job specification because it they feel like it's already counting them out because of number one their age number two their educational background so i think one of the main points, in fact, it's the only point I'm going to make because I think it's so important, is making sure that them, them job specifications are inclusive and they're not actually uh, scaring people into not applying because you are missing out on amazing talent. Awesome, awesome tip. Love that. To make sure that you uh, make sure that your um, the job specs and the jobs uh, applications are they're all about being diverse and inclusive, but also not making it too scary, especially around the in the junior sections. Um, what are your thoughts? What one of the? Because I, I actually, I was just just being, I've been naughty there. I was actually reading some of the stuff you've already written. I was going to because uh, I think it's so good. But I'm going to let you say a couple of tips that you had were just brilliant uh, that we created graphics out of. So I'm going to let you do. It. Thanks. Um, I'm trying to remember what they were now. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> you may have to wait for the graphics, everyone. <laughs> um, but um, I think for me, it is. And I know you said it before, you know, you've got to kind of see it sometimes. And, and I think 
it's, it's just so important. You know, we need to almost, we've got the people out there. And I have to say, what I'm also recruiting to expand my team. And it is really hard sometimes to find people from or get people from diverse backgrounds to apply or to to know where to go and find them. And there is a lot more work that we need to be doing ourselves, I think, to try and, and, and fix that and, and be able to find the right places to encourage people. And, and as Kai's been saying, you know, it does start from, from schools and it starts from right at the bottom end of, of getting people from when they're quite young to knowing that they can do these things. But um, there's a few things for me is just that kind of that understanding or representation at a senior level, because we're not there. I've yet to work in a company where we have a, a diverse board. I've worked in a, a number of companies now and every so often there's a female member. Yay. That's a great thing. Um, we've got a long way to go for that, but then I've not seen a single board in my career history where I've had somebody from a, a from an ethnic minority group that's been Muslim, that's been Asian, that's been black, that's, you know, that's been from another, that's been anything other than white. Um, and, you know, there's that kind of thing where you can put the token person in, tick that box, but it, we don't need to do that. We have the people out there. We just need to give them the skills. We need to give, uh, not really the skills, we need to give them the opportunities Jeez, or the yeah. voice to, to, to be part of those senior discussions, to move on to those levels, to give them that confidence to go, you belong there. Um, and you fight for it and you go for it and, and you should you will help to, to then work from the top all the way down to make hopefully your companies more diverse to make you know just as Kai's doing you know he's actively going out and and trying to make that difference from a, on a global level which is incredible um, but then there's also those little things Dan I know we're conscious of time um, there's those little things that you said about like the, the culture within a company is that is really important because especially in tech that I, I witnessed it where there was a very heavy drinking thing, um, but not even in tech, actually other industries too, yeah. where yeah. there was a lot of this after hours drinking and going to bars. And if you're not a part of the crowd, then how are you going to get to know your directors? Um, and that's something that I came across a lot with getting to know exec or board is that if you're not going out and having a vodka on a Friday night, then mm -hmm. can you really be part of their team? Um, and as a Muslim, I don't drink. I will go to a bar. I will hang out at a bar if I have to, um, if I'm with the right people and I enjoy it. But yeah, it's that assumption right and creating that kind of, oh, if you're not there, then you're going to be left out. Um, so that, yeah. that looking at the values is, is makes a difference. Yeah, no, no, it is the problem, isn't it? And it's sometimes, and I have to say this often to the tech companies and other people, because... I think sometimes they get quite personally, especially if they're the boss of a company and they haven't meant to create that culture and they, they then take it quite personally. They're like, well, what, 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 what were we meant to do? And it's like, well, yeah, but you, you gave away free beer and that and it became a lad's drinking culture and then you've recruited mainly men and that's when it makes it. So, you know, one of my bugbears, and it's a, a bit of a silly one, but, you know, the, the silly jokes at those kind of parties, and I've been in lots of them and I've had, you know, basic racism for you know, quite a lot of my life, but, you know, stuff like people playing with your hair and stuff, uh, you know, I get it. You don't have very many black friends, but I know it's a bit silly, but literally, you know, and my other one, which I which I do all the time as well, is get people's names wrong, but also then people having to change their name to fit into the crowd because they know that someone can't say their name, so they change their name. That's a bugbear for me. And it's happened to me, not to me personally, it's happened to a couple of friends of mine. And I said to them, look, don't do it. Don't, not the fact, don't let them get away with it because that sounds awful. But what you're doing is you're allowing that culture to exist because you're basically saying, well, I don't mind. But the next person who comes in, most probably should do. They most probably should mind, really, you know, mm. because it actually is quite important, your name. Mm. He says, knowing that he said Kai's name wrong so many times, <laughs> I'm just embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. So, well, actually, you did well. No, you didn't do so bad. It's funny, really, because that name name um, change or name pronunciation thing is extremely important. Because you know, over the years that I've I've lived in different parts of the world, and name pronunciation and and, and sort of the the phonetics is actually quite important to a lot of people. So if you if you pronounce someone's name with the wrong um, sort of intonations, you could actually be saying something completely different. Which could then offend them without you realizing it and so what i always say to people when they see my name sometimes is rather than me pronouncing it for you i say you know i turn into a bit of a uh, an exercise well you try you have a go you try it so that then the onus is on them to make the effort to try to pronounce it and then if they do well then fine but at least you've had the effort rather than 
I don't want to have to teach you to pronounce my name. I want you to make the effort because then you, if you get it wrong, I'll explain to you why it's wrong and why you should say it this way. Um, and I think that's important and, and just important about what should companies do because I'm conscious of the time that we've got. I think it's important that we don't, as business leaders or business members or businesses generally, categorically do not pay lip service or tokenize, as Asma called earlier on, to any of this because, I kid you not, it, it will... Um, it will create a hugely adverse consequence for not just us as businesses, but for the people who are looking at society as young people. They will they will see people saying, oh yeah, of course we're diverse. And they will see the diverse on their website. But then actually when they then get employed by that company, they see actually it isn't, then they slowly lose faith in the idea of companies saying they're diverse. So it, the thing, the one you know, tip is if you're gonna do something, Make sure it's, it's sustainable. Make sure it's it's true. You're true to it. It's true to the business and the, the employees that you're working with understand what the project is going to deliver and they understand why they're doing it. So that when the outside world sees it, it, it looks, feels, and is genuine rather than just a token exercise. I think that's the, the biggest tip that I can... I mean, it, and it's such a big thing because, I mean, we also work in marketing and I work in marketing quite a bit with things. And, yeah, it's that difference between brand values, the stuff that's on your wall, and actually really being it. I get quite cross when people talk about cultures being, you know, the football table, the football table, the fact we've got integrity as a brand value. And it's like, that isn't the reality. The, your brand is what people say when they leave the room. And your employee yeah. brand, by the way, is what people say when they leave your company. Yeah. And your employee brand is so important. And I'm totally with you, Kai, well, because it's it's the next bit, this next evolution of marketing and the next evolution of society itself, actually, mainly accelerated because of the COVID situation. People will vote with their feet and they will leave your company and they will go and work for a company that's got better values. And I use the word better in quotes there, but values that are more aligned with them, that are more cohesive together as a group, that's a nicer place to work because we cannot, and we won't be able to, by the way, with the new hybrid world that we're going to be living in, and we will be living in a hybrid world, even thankfully when the vaccine does work and we all go, you know, it's back to normal, there's no such thing, but it will be different and it will be a hybrid approach and people will be able to remotely work uh, it'll be flexible working and it'll be different. So your employee brand is going to be more important than ever. And another piece uh, which is going to be really important is technology. And I've got a real bugbear on this one because, because of the lack of diversity in past tech companies, we now have an issue inside recruitment itself where the AI system that recruiters are using because of the scale of the issue they've got themselves are biased. Yeah, and this might sound a bit geeky, but it's absolutely right. And the people who are recruiters listening on the call, please be aware that the cognitive biases that are inside AI that, that makes themselves an issue is your issue too. So start looking at, start looking at how you're using technology. Don't just let technology dictate some of the most important and humane decisions you're going to make because we need human beings in that process. If it's all done by the computers and the computer gets it wrong or the computer has a waiting system without realising it, against diversity that extrapolates into a huge issue for example you know ai systems at the moment do not or for a little while have not recognized black and asian faces as well as they have white because of the data set now you expand that into a global situation it's a massive problem but also into police state and all sorts of weird stuff but think of it the same for recruitment it's the same principle be really careful of what we're teaching ai systems and sometimes let's not use them Let's not use them as let's, let's use human beings as much because I think human beings and the right company culture will create diversity. And I suppose that was my what is start using pieces of technology that aren't necessarily just churning stuff based on AI. They've got to, you know, you've got to augment your own experience. Now, of course, we would say higher on values as well because Flock's really important with you know diversity and inclusion, and it'll help you do that. Of course it would do, but that's not the point. It's just one part of your tech stack, but don't just rely on technology because. Even though I know I'm a technologist, but I just have a big issue with the fact if we let the computers do it all, they might not be, the computers might not be as nice as we are. That's kind of my point. That's kind of my point. And are there any other kind of what's that people can very, very quickly do and quickly grab any kind of one sentences just to uh, finish up? Because I did say to Martin that we were finishing, you know, round about uh, three minutes beforehand uh, to give people time for the handover because I am respectful of their time. Thank you. Um, but, but also, has anyone got like a one sentence uh, bit that we could sum up? they could do to make sure that the big idea in 2021 uh, can come through their companies. I'm going to throw that to anyone on the call because I'm lovely. It's just, I don't really have a one sentence, sorry, but I'm going to get okay, in there just to say, Dan, with what you yeah. just said about the technology, 
just to highlight how important it is, I've been in a situation over the last few months where I've been to, you know, you get those thermo scanners and we've had a problem where it's not picked up my face or another Asian face. Um, and that's been the, the issue and they've tried Your to rectify goes. it. So, Your you know, those, those are real life, you know, things that happen. Yeah, absolutely. But this is it. We're allowing the data sets of the past to then dictate the future. Those data sets, is if you read about it, like half of them are bad data based on the fact they didn't know any black people. So they just made it about white people because there's only white people in the team. And that's the core base of the technology. Slightly worrying in that one. Uh, so that's a good reason for diversity as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally cool. You know, if, if people would like to contact any of us, is there a way that people can get, uh, get hold of you all? Um, that would be a lovely way to finish off. So is there they can find you on social media or any of the things? How would you like to be contacted uh, for people that might have questions for you after the show? As I know, we must have inspired some folk, uh, especially some of us. Uh, some of us just did a hadget, hadget job of uh, hosting it like me. Um, you can find me on Dan Sodegren, so just at Dan Sodegren, uh, S-O-D-E-R-G-R-E-N. Uh, that's at Twitter or at UK Marketing Help or on LinkedIn, Dan Sodegren, uh, easy peasy, or at Your Flock, either way, yourflock.co.uk. Uh, but over to Kai. Kai, where would we find you and your company? Yeah, same LinkedIn. So um, at Kai Ojo, uh, Kai underscore Ojo uh, on Twitter and on LinkedIn as well. And same with the company, planisware.com. Um, we'll be posting, I think we've got six roles that we're looking to, to hire at the moment. So by all means, make yourself available and um, we'll, uh, we'll have a chat. Good company to work for. Awesome culture. Zach, and I'm going to say Zach because I know your your uh, name, your handle for Twitter is different to your name. So over yeah, to you. so you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, which is Ishak Amin. Uh, plus on Twitter, I am Digital Guy Zach. So add me, and I'll share some awesome. insights. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but you're brilliant, mate. It's fantastic. Thank you. And last but not least. Uh, well, you can find me on LinkedIn with my name Asmi Yunus. It's Hanif. Um, got married ended up having to take half a surname but hey um and uh, on twitter you'll find me on my blog name which is jet set chick um i will keep that till i die because uh, that's what got me started on my career but yeah on any other social platform i'm jet set chick i love that i just i just love i just love being a jet set <laughs> chick i think it's just a wonderful thing so i'd just like to thank all of you including cool jet set chick but everyone on the call for that thank you very much also to our circle to martin and to liz and to jim uh, for, for just being great and hosting this all. I hope that we've managed to inspire you. And also thanks to the MPA, Manchester Publicity Association, for their drive for inclusivity and uh, diversity next year. That's the big idea. Inclusivity, diversity, equality and action. And the key one for me is action. And of course, thanks very much for your flock.co.uk because they've given me the time to, uh, to be here today. So uh, thanks so much to uh, everyone who's on the call. Marvellous, thank, thank, thank you. you so much. We're going to be really you. short because awesome. we are going live over to... Um, uh, it's cool now working lunch with Louise Triance so if this works this is super I'm going to get rid of you lot and then we'll ping over there and it'll make it look like a wonderful thing like it like it's a, just like a proper tv program thanks guys really good to see you thank you brilliant Dude, let's get rid of everybody now with a bit of luck if I do that and do that well we're going to get a third Dan it's going to really going to look like Brady Bunch that's why I wear quite a lot of scarves is that either I've dripped yeah. on my scarf and I can remove my scarf or I can cover it up. Um, normally we I have, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, I did do a show the other day and when I stood up, I found I had um, an unfortunate stain on my top, but there you go. Um, cool, and Jim's gonna stream us into YouTube. So if you're watching over on YouTube, um, hopefully Jim will also um, share the link where we are here um, because we do a ton of other shows on the working channel. So uh, the, I guess the format for our shows often is a bit of a chat about what we're doing and then we talk about the topic. So um, I do want people to know we are going to get to the topic and um, the topic is, i to find exactly what I called it, it's called uh, trans inclusivity in the hiring process. So that's the topic we will definitely talk about and if anybody's got questions please put them in the chat, please put them in the ask the question. You know I think that um, Joe and I probably pretty much happy to answer anything that you might have around that topic if you're um, in a hiring role yourself um, or as an employee or as a potential job seeker. Off in the chat.
then lockdown. Uh, I think then, then Boris came on telly and, and told us we all had to do this. And at that point there, I think I, I kind of reflected and had a cry. Uh, yeah, I think many of us did. We went, OMG, everything's changed. And I started emailing all my all my customers, all the people I was going to do work with. And, and one by one, they said, no, no, we appreciate that, Joe. Yeah, you're right. We, 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 everything's on hold until we know it. And so I think we all went through that kind of pity party, that kind of, what are we going to do next? And uh, I, I, I was no different. And I, I kind of just thought, well, hang on a minute. You've got a big experience about change. You know, I, 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 trans I gender transitioned three or four years ago. I built a new career and new business. I thought, well, this is just another opportunity for change. And I, I was able to sort of bounce back quite quickly and, and kind of reinvent myself as a kind of an online remote speaker. But, I mean, I, I don't claim any kind of foresight here, but I'd already decided at Christmas time that I was going to launch a podcast, I was going to write a book, and I was going to do a lot more remote training because I'd already identified I was flying around the world doing silly plane trips, making no money, having a great time, obviously, but not actually getting anywhere. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'd already decided I was going to do some more online stuff. And so kind of coincidentally, I'd already bought microphones and cameras and stuff ready to do this. So I was coincidentally well prepared to for the online world and my i've got a background in it i used to run an it company uh, i've always had an interest in videography and photography so this whole all these skills sort of kind of come together and i thought well okay and what gave me a bit of passion at the beginning was actually helping other people set up their remote studios so i helped people with their lighting their cameras so i actually ran a couple of youtubes a couple of webinars and, it's, and, I, and i've got a bit of a sideline now in, in training people how to set up their remote speaking and their, their tech and stuff but in the meantime, that, well, that top of mind personal brand stuff going on, the LinkedIn, the webinars, I think we do, suddenly that dovetailed with the, with the world change. The world was now more empathic, more empathetic. It, Black Lives Matter, DNI became top of the agenda. I mean, we've, we've had more conversations this year about DNI and well-being, mental health, Black Lives Matter, trans inclusion, everything. We've had lots more conversations this year than we've ever done before. And there's a real demand by organisations. So all this kind of came together, and since June, I've been busier than I've ever been um, delivering online sessions. So my, my view of lockdown is actually I'm quite comfortable. I'm quite happy. I, I I don't need to go out anymore. I've got I've got coffee. I've got food. I've got a bed. I've got my sofa, um, and I've got my great wife who uh, who we who I live with, and uh, we have fun together. So yeah, I'm my experience of lockdown is very privileged. It's very very, very successful and I'm uh, in fact sometimes I, I, I get a bit exhausted because I've been so busy during the day. Well that's actually one of the things you might come on to is about when, we, when we're running it live events and, and how exhausting that can be um, and how, how that does feel for people but it did dovetail amazingly well for you I mean that's quite the story isn't it how you were um, already moving towards that because in March and April, when we started at work and lunch, there was a lot of people who were really, really struggling and they were talk we talked about pivoting all the time. And that wasn't a pivot for you. It was just a kind of natural transition made speedier. Yeah, it was just turn left at the yeah. traffic lights rather than, rather than go straight on. Yeah. Literally just stay in the same car, just, just take a different yeah. lane. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I, I started calling it pirouette. I think that's better than pirouette. <laughs> pirouette. <laughs> it does sound rather glamorous as well. Um, yes, I think a, a, a pivot feels like it's something like made as a jerky reaction. Yeah. And, that, and, and that to me doesn't always feel great. And, and that's one of the things I've seen actually in the hiring process is that, um, and, and this is kind of a sideline of the talking about recruitment is um, businesses who've taken people on who were furloughed um, and were looking for something else a part-time gig or people who've been made redundant and they've been hired in a kind of pivoted role and now as the market for some areas starts to recover these people are do you know that actually wasn't the right move for me and that organization yes. hadn't really done due diligence on that hiring they'd said Sally looks amazing. We'd never normally be able to get a Sally. Let's have her. Mm. But you know, this wasn't the right long time, long term move for somebody. Mm. And I have seen oh, yeah. a fair I, bit of that. I remember seeing a graph back in March. I think it was one of one of Boris's famous graphs. You know, one of his death by powerpoints that he was doing, or someone someone put it on the internet that showed about this the lockdown, the release, the lockdown, the release, the lockdown, the release, and it almost like set the scene. That we were going to have periods where we'd be really tight and 
it may be open, it may be tight. And they are projecting this as, as being early 2022 before it, before it really changed. And I thought, well, if we think about this as a, as a 24 month plan, from a business perspective, that's forever. Because every business changes itself every couple of years anyway. So I've got to think about this as being my world and my life forever or until, I, or until the change comes again. So I, I, I was trying, I think we set about trying not to hang on to what I had and say, right, what do I do new? And not think of it as kind of reinvent myself using the old paradigm, be different given the fact that we're, we're now in this new, new world. You know, the old paradigm was PowerPoint slides, 16 by nine, stuck over, you know, stuck on a big screen. Why do we need to have 16 by nine PowerPoint slides in the real world? Why can't we have words appear in different places on the screen? Why can't I bring my face and my words together? I don't have to be me in the corner and words up here. I can now be part of my words and bring them in front of me. So by using some of the tech and using some of the innovative ways of presenting, looking at how we can use tools such as Zoom, breakout rooms, online quizzes like Mentimeet and Slido, those kind of tools. And really maximizing the, the engagement as a speaker, because I, I, yeah, or an entertainer, I, I think myself as an entertainer as much as a speaker or a trainer, because I'm there to, to, to give people knowledge, but you have to make it fun. I mean, how many times do you think, how many, I mean, how many people are watching this now with, with, with the browser minimized in Outlook, eating their lunch, and just sort of kind of listening to us? How many people are really engaged? So. I, I really do focus on this kind of engagement in, in making sure people stick with it and that they're involved because we, we get really spoiled by sitting in front of the telly. We, we see high quality production, we see the evening news, the camera angles, the shots, the cuts, the, the clips, the interludes. Mm. And people, when they're sat in front of the screen, they need that same kind of, they need that diversity of, of content to keep them engaged and they, they need to see you that they need i mean I, i'm very big on passion and leaning into the camera and, and, and making people feel that i'm with them and having a conversation with them because so i need to speak to you as an individual not you as a as a as a, as a mass because unless i'm connected with you i've got no attention so, and so i i very much talked about this and focus on this in the way i train and, and engage and it seems to resonate and i'm i'm just going to keep doing it so it, it seems to work I feel like I need to stand up there to be more powerful, to be more engaging. I feel like I need to move my, I love moving my arms around when I talk. Um, yeah. But no, you're absolutely right. So, so we've touched, said two words today. So transition and you said change. That's probably the topic we're meant to be talking about too. Mm, so, so let's move on to that. So our topic um, for today was um, trans inclusivity in the hiring process. Tell me kind of like the main themes that we ought to be thinking about here. Well, just, just to put it in context, so last week was Trans Awareness Week, um, and, it, and Trans Awareness Week always starts on the 13th, it doesn't matter which day of the week that is, and it always finishes on the 20th, which is Trans Day of Remembrance, and again, whichever day that falls. Uh, so, topically, we're, we're now in, in, in that zone. So, Trans Awareness, so I, I've talked about this often, and, and yeah, I've, I've done some, lots of events with Stephen O'Donnell and his, uh, his RecEx, where I've talked about uh, the challenges that trans people face in the hiring process. And to be fair, it's not just trans people, people of colour, uh, people with neurodiversity, people, various other people have, have the same kind of impact. But in terms of trans people, we're still seen as kind of a, a marginalised group. We're still under attack in the media. Uh, it's still okay to post negative comments about trans people on, on link, even on LinkedIn. I, I posted something the other day and I, I attracted someone who felt it was their, their need to stand up and promote um, to, well, to talk over me and talk about women's rights and how trans people were destroying women's rights. Uh, and that was fine. That happens on Twitter, it happens on LinkedIn, it happens everywhere. We wouldn't do that. I mean, actually, we, we, it does happen when we talk about Black Lives Matter. It does happen. People stand up. What about white people? What about what about me? So we get a lot of that. But, but trans people seem to be currently, even in 2021, misunderstood, misrepresented. And the biggest barrier to inclusion is lack of understanding, lack of awareness, lack of role models, lack of visibility. And also biases. You know, I love you, Joe. You're fantastic. Yes, I, I, I pay money to see you speak, but I wouldn't hire you. Because if I hire you, what will my friends think? What will people think I'm 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 is, I, I'm kind of creepy for liking you? It's almost this uh, bias by proxy. 
we're okay with you, but what about our customers? If we put you in to our front line, let's say you're a, I'm a plumber and I send you into people's houses, how are, how are our customers going to react when you go into their house? If you're, if you're a sales director and we put you on a big account, how are customers going to react to you as a trans person? So there's always this negativity bias. I mean, I'm okay, but what about my customers? What about other people? And this is where people haven't got necessarily the, the inbuilt allyship to embrace me and say, Joe, you're fantastic. I know you're fantastic. My people are going to love you. My customers are going to love you because I know you can do this job and you're amazing at what you do. But it's, amazing. it's incredible how many people aren't prepared to stand up and say that. And that was an interesting fact, sorry, uh, interesting yeah. fact by the, the new chief executive Stonewall. And what she said was that uh, in the survey, 75, 76% of the population have got no issue with trans rights. They're kind of quite comfortable and cool with it. That does beg the question, there are 24, 25% that really don't <laughs> embrace trans people. So if you're, if you're in a room of 100 people, there are 25 people in that room who are looking at me with, with, uh, with evil eyes and, uh, and, and out to get me. But in the same survey, they identified that only one in three organisations would hire a trans person. So there's this huge disconnect between, I'm happy for you to be my friend, I'm happy for you to entertain me, I'm happy for you to perform for me, but I'm not going to hire you. And we see the same thing with, with often with black people. I, I, I watch black people play football, I watch black people on the stage, I watch black people entertain, but I won't hire black people because I'm white. And we see the same all the time with minority characteristics, is we're okay in an entertainment, in a non-engaging sort of way for your amusement, but we're not so not so great when we actually want to connect and hire. So that, that's the challenge trans people face. And I, the question I was about to ask you've answered, which is that, it, is it pretty much the same for other minority groups? Those statistics, I'd like to think that we've, you know, it sounds like we're moving in the right direction. So if we're looking at somebody like, um, you know, the situation of hiring a black person in your organisation, there are going to be a percentage of people who would say something similar. I have no issue with black people. I like black people. Black people are my friends. But our customer base, they're very white. Are we like to hear that same sort of thing? We still say that about women. Yes. We still think, we look, we look at uh, some very traditional male organisations, um, engineering, STEM, sales, car industry, all these kind of professions. Well, we couldn't trust, a, couldn't trust a young girl to go into that account, could we? And, and that's, that's, that's women. That's not let alone black women. That's let alone trans women. That's let alone, we're talking about women here. Half the population is still struggling to get that right. So I think what we have to say is that we have to recognise these incumbent biases, these incumbent people like us, the PLUs, you don't fit. We get the same bias around the wrong degree, the wrong, the wrong universities, the wrong, we still get that. And it, I, I wrote an article for the Scottish Herald the other week about the, the BS of meritocracy and about how we keep, we keep sort of justifying our hiring, saying the best person for the job, we're going to get the best person for the job. If we hire for diversity, we're getting second best. It's almost like it's almost like an unwritten rule. If, if I'm making a diversity hire, they must be second best because they're diverse. The obvious choice is the man, the white man here. So they're being brave and making a diversity hire. Look, oh, and we, we, end up, we end up having this massive celebration. Hey, we've hired a woman. Isn't this fantastic? Aren't we amazing? Uh, actually, that should be the typical. It should be the, it should be the unusual. You've just touched on something which I've seen in the um, event space, which is that um, when I'm organising speakers at somebody else's conference and I'm um, trying to find the right people in a diverse lineup, I have sometimes had an event organiser say to me, yes, but who would be the best choice for this? And I say, no, that woman is the best choice for this. No, but if you could have anybody, if you could have a man, who would be the right person for that? <laughs> No, 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 that is the right person. So you're absolutely right. There's that implication that because I'm trying to be diverse and only gender diverse in this particular instance, mm. that I, which is obviously a disappointment full stop, that I am not picking the best person. So when you get that for an offence speaker, how much worse is it for hire? So you said about um, the recognition of bias. That's obviously one part of this. And then you also mentioned about the lack of role models and visibility. Um, I mean, there's, it sounds to me that there's quite a few interlocking parts here that organisations are either choosing not to be aware of or not putting in place. Yeah, I think there's also this disconnect. You, know, you think about... I always, I always go out being generous. Organisations don't set out 
to be exclusionary. They don't set out to create a monoculture. It just has happened. And to break the monoculture, it, again, is just something that is, is hard work. It's easier to keep doing what you've always done. It's easier to keep hiring the same people. Bringing someone different in is like to disrupt. If it disrupts, it could, Im it could impact. So, so everyone's kind of risk averse. I want to make the safe choice. And the, the, the incumbent type monoculture is always the safe choice. What if I hire Joe and she kicks up a fuss because of the toilets, she kicks up a fuss because someone misgenders, she kicks up a fuss. Oh, we can't take that risk. Joe's just a bit too complicated. There's an easier choice here. Let's, let's go with that. So often it, it's based on this, this, I don't know, this perception that people are easier and harder. And I think and we, we talk about this meritocracy and we talk about the, the BS of that and, and how we, we invent what is, what is the best person for the job based on our own biases and perceptions and, and trying to step outside of that. But the other side is, what's the culture? It's a culture in such that I actually want to work for you anyway. You know, we talk about it, the company wants to do the right thing, but do I really want to work there? I mean, this, we, 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 we talk in, in, in the hiring, you know, in, in, the, in the TA space, we talk about this employer branding, don't we? Who are we? What's our brand? What's our perception? Uh, uh, but we often forget to align the employer brand with the employee experience. What do our people actually say about us? Um, what do our customers say about us? Who are we in the market? And until we kind of get the alignment between who we think we are and who we are, and who we want to be, then, then we can start making progress because often we try and rush into solving the problem by hiring. We need to be more diverse. We need to have more women on the board. Like, let's hire women. Let's hire women. It's, it's just, it's, it's, that will solve our problem. We'll dilute the men. We'll quickly hire women. But what we haven't done is fix culture. We haven't understood the why. And actually, when we go out to hire women, in order to not be in, 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 tokenistic, maybe what we need to say is, Louise, we're struggling. We need to hire women on our board because, and I will go through the whole reason why me as an organization need to hire more women because it makes sense, because it gives us representation, because we know we've got to change, et cetera, et cetera. Louise, we recognize that you're a leader in your field. We want to come to you, but we're going to give you this challenge. We know we're not great. Are you prepared to work with us to help us on this? I'm the CEO. You have my complete backing and, and my team. We're right behind you. And I'm going to go, okay, it felt a bit tokenistic to start with, but now I get it. You're with me. You're going to amplify me or we're going to make this happen. And and you and you say to me at the end of it, it says, if you're lying, I'm going to tell everybody you're lying. <laughs> and I go, deal. We shake hands on it. And that's how we get over this, this apparent tokenism by actually saying, by actually engaging with people and saying, we really want you because be part of our journey. And that's how we, people go make a start. And we often, they often hit and say, how do we go from all men to hiring a woman to hiring somebody? Be honest, be authentic. We've been getting it wrong for years. We know that. We know we want to make a difference. We want you to help us on that journey. And you can do that if you're trying to increase your, your racial diversity, your faith, whatever beliefs, or disability. If you haven't got a great track record, ask. And also pay consultants, uh, pay for people with lived experience who can advise uh, maybe specialist recruitment or search, searching firms that specialize in, in, in hiring um, diverse sites and a great experience in and use their skills. No, you haven't got all the right skills, but do, do think about your hiring teams and the process and the biases you have. Because there's no point in, there's no point in wasting my time if you're going to take one look at me or hear me or, or, or think I don't fit your mold and then go, actually, no, Joe, you're, there are other people better suited for this role. Yeah, okay, because, fair because there's a couple of things there, again, um, that you touched on. One was um, around, um, you know, the, the first part about being risk averse, which actually just reads as being lazy. So, you know, you're not prepared to take that chance. Um, and then the second part is about this tokenism, which is something, a conversation I've had with people, which is how do we make these first hires without it being so bloody obvious? And I love what you've suggested there. I love the way that you've said that, about being honest and being authentic and saying, you know, we know we're not getting this right right now. It's just really crap. We want to do something about it. But you're a... A person who's confident in your worth to people. Um, not everyone is, um, whether they, whatever the reason that they've been, you know, that they're being considered minorities, whether you're a woman or whether you're trans. And, and you know, you, you ended that uh, role play, which I loved because you said I was amazing at the start of it. So that was a great role play. We should do more of those role plays. Um, 
But you ended that role play by saying that you would say, and if this turns out to be complete crap, I will let everybody know. Now, for most people, that's obviously not their experience. Maybe they get hard. Uh, maybe it does feel like tokenism. Um, um, and maybe they try really hard and it doesn't work out. But for most people, you just walk away thinking, that's just another example of how I'm undervalued in the workplace. Completely. And I've got a great friend who works in sales for, in a small business space, around, mainly around computer and tech. And she has had to leave her past three roles through sexism and basically she's been pushed out. And each time I sit and say, come on, you've got to do something about this. You've got to do something about this. I've got, I've got friends in the DNI space. I've got solicitors who work with me on these kind of things. They will hear your story. You've got the evidence. Do something with it. If, if not for you, but for someone who follows you. Because this is about sometimes when you make a stand, you're not always making a stand for you. You're making a stand for the person who follows you. I think that's the important thing. I think and I, and I do, do that. They can't yeah. fix you. They got that wrong. It's about how they get it right next time. That's the important thing there. And I 100% agree with you. But there's another side to this, which is that some people say, I don't want to speak for all women. I don't want to speak for all trans. I don't want to speak for all black people. Why does it have to be on me? No, it doesn't. And, and that's, that's, that's also part of the deal with an employer. I, mean, I, I want to be hired for being the best, I don't know, Java programmer there is. And I don't want to necessarily be a, a trans role model. In fact, I might even want to tell you I'm trans. I don't want to certainly be an advocate. I mean, if I wasn't professionally trans myself, I'd, probably be, I, I'd be getting tired of speaking about it by now. Yes. I mean, I transitioned four years ago. And it becomes very samey. You become the same arguments. And it, it, is, it does become wearing. Which is well, why we need that's what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and we, we've talked about this before, Joe, which is that, you know, in an absolutely ideal world, you would not be speaking at events about being trans. You'd be speaking at events about all these other amazing skills that you've got. You know, and that's what you do do. You run a business where you help organisations get their events online and get their technology in place. The, the fact that you're trans is entirely irrelevant to that. Mm. But you are also, and I love that expression, you are also professionally trans. Yeah. So I guess you, but, that, that's yeah. part of your business, isn't it? Yeah, my passion is around DNI, inclusion, belonging, um, challenging people on the hiring processes, working with some tech startups who are producing uh, inclusive hiring or unbiased processes, and, 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 and again, just sort of shining a light on them and saying, are you serious? Have you thought about this? Um, have you developed this in your own echo chamber? Or have you actually, actually spoke to people who are underrepresented and say, how do you find this? And, you know, I mean, I see, uh, I think... Jim Beresford from Resume is on the call, and I, I've spent a lot of time talking to Jim and challenging on some of the design that Resume put in play around video interviewing, and I, I fully accept that there's no one size fits all. It benefits some, and I've also yeah, expressed my view on how it, 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 it's a negative for other people, and there is no one size fits all. So I think it's how you use the tool. To, 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 you, know, you buy an ATS, you buy a system that has video hiring in it, it's how you use that. If you use it in a way that creates bias, it, it, it creates mistrust. It means that I, as a trans person or someone as a black person, has a poorer experience by being on camera. Someone with a, someone with a facial disfigurement, someone with, a, with a, a, a speech impairment, all those kind of things impact. And some people just don't want to go on camera. They're scared. Even, even after nine months on Zoom, some people don't want to put their camera on. So are we now introducing another bias? I'm now saying not only... You've got not only have I got to have the, the capability, the credentials, the, the expertise, I've now got to look good on camera, I've got to sound good on camera, I've got to have no dirty washing in the background, I've got to have this amazing environment, and, I, and I've got to have all this charisma to, to sell myself in, in a video. And if I haven't got that, who, who do we hire? The extrovert, the party person, um, again, someone who, who resonates with me. So it, it all comes back down to how do we build our process, how do we build our hiring teams, how do we deep bias, how do we how do we value people as individuals and not pick up all these extra cues and add that into the negative part? And that, that's the challenge I think organisations have when they're trying to build these hiring strategies, is to think about how can we be person-centric, how can we really sort of see into the heart of someone and say, who are you, Joe? Who are you? Who are you really? Can you do this? Yeah, you can, can't you? Have you got, have you got the capability? Yeah. Have you got the kind of culture add? You know, are you going to bring something to us? Are you going to, are you going to bring ideas and passion yeah that's what we want isn't it 
Yeah, so there's a, there's a few parts here again, which is that we've got the bias in the recruitment process internally in the people in the organisation in the way that they think in the way that it's structured. Then you've got the bias in the technology that you potentially use in the process. And I think there'll be maybe some organisations who don't look so much at that and think, do you know what, we aren't biased, we are inclusive, that we've got this all in place. And then they're putting in steps that they need to do. So, so looking at why you're, ask, why you're asking people to jump through these hoops is really significant. Um, is this actually measuring what I need to measure? And one of the things right now, um, I did a, a show on this with Zip Recruiter, with the um, Labour Economist, was about how the COVID um, pandemic has set back diversity um, in the workplace. A part of this was about the fact that um, some minority groups um, are more likely to own businesses um, which are struggling more um, right now. And then part of this was the impact on employees. Because I said this, I really early on I, I was talking to people and they were saying things like, um, you know, I've got a disability which makes it difficult for me to go into the office. So with remote working, that's great. I can get a job working from home. And there's a couple of other examples about that, or, or working mums, so you know, the flexibility of working from home is great for me. So I had this big blanket, it's great for diversity, because people can work from wherever they want, and they can work at the hours that they want. Um, but there's lots of evidence that that isn't the case, um, and also, when you've got a massive candidate pool, you don't tighten up your recruitment processes in a positive way, you tighten them up in a way which is going to negatively impact certain groups of people. I don't know whether you've heard anything similar. Yeah, I think you're right. It's it, in as much as it's it, it's leveled the playing field in some respects. It's it's really messed it up further in other respects. So when we talk about the impact, as you say, the impact on people from underrepresented communities generally tend to be lower paid workers. Lower paid workers tend to work in hospitality, entertainment, uh, and, and and that kind of gig type working, that that small bitty work, tends to be people from underrepresented communities and those those are the those are the jobs that have been cut um also we need to think about the impact on families you know when we started back in the lockdown eight, eight or nine months ago we started started realizing that not everybody has the same home experience uh, home education um primary admin for, for the family often is a woman's responsibility yes we live in a, in a more modern world and there are many men with children men, men who are prime parents Yes, we know that, but the majority of women tend still, even in 2021, tend to be the home admin, home, home in charge of home, in charge of parenting. The first time when a child trips over and grazes their knee, they go to mummy first. That tends to be the way it works. Um, and we've got, so we've got to remember that women don't necessarily have nine to five access to their time while in a, in a home working environment. They have other, other commitments. Even even the most progressive uh, um, gender, gender balance relationships. And it's, it's also applies to men as well. We don't have nine, uh, eight, eight hours of contiguous time anymore. We have yeah. to accept we get people in bits. I mean, you probably didn't, I don't know if you heard it, but Amazon were ringing my doorbell like it's going out of fashion. It was like, <laughs> like that, that, that scene on Breaking Bad, we are ringing the bell on Breaking Bad. It's like, oh, come on, go away, I'm not going to answer it. So we, we have deliveries, we have, we have our parents, we have, uh, we, we, we're caring for people in different ways. We've got impact of three or four generations of of home worker trying to access the internet, the kitchen table, and let the kids play on the PlayStation and do their homework and log into the system and do a Zoom call in private. And we've got members of the family sitting on their beds in different rooms trying to get on with their life and their business. So we can't assume that everybody has the perfect home office as we do, as I do, or, or even, even a comfortable chair that is ergonomically safe for me to work on day in, day out. I sit on Zoom calls and still see people sat on the sofa with their laptop on their knees. And this is nine months later. So how, how are these people functioning day to day with their, their necks, their backs, their typing? Uh, and what are employers now doing to reach out and make it, making sure that their, their, their people, their teams, have got a safe home working environment as well? So I, I think we've still got a long way to go on this. And lockdowns and, and, and remote working and home working isn't going to, it's never going to change that. I think we're, it's, we, I think we all agreed that some some hybrid merge of, of the old and the new will happen, and more and more people are going to be working from anywhere um, rather than working from home. WFA is probably more relevant, and I, I'd I'd love more pubs and coffee shops to pivot and provide 
and provide sort of locale based co-working spaces and, and come together spaces. You know, I've got a cafe over the road. If they offered a decent Wi-Fi, a decent per diem coffee rate, I'd sit there all day for a tenner, mix with people and just do my admin and my Zoom calls. Uh, and to save my, my studio time when I'm delivering some training. But yeah, I think, I think ways people can pivot out of this, think about how they can reuse the space they've got, rather than just saying, I'm a pub, I can't, I can't serve beer, what, what, what can you serve? Yeah. So I, I've gone completely off topic there. Um, but yeah, no, no, it's, but you're right. You're right. Yeah. Love that. Love that point. I think I think that is um, about, and that, and that does serve some people. I mean, we talked about working from home and people coming back into the workplace and working from home. But some people don't want to be entirely on their own. And for some people, um, you know, if we're talking about neuro neurodiversity in in this in this inclusion thing, for some people, it's all very well saying you've got a job. It's a great job but you're not going to socially interact with another single person from dusk till dawn. And actually you don't have a happy home life or you don't have any home life. Yeah. Um, so organisations, you know, when, when does that become their responsibility? When does it become their responsibility to say, actually, Jane, I can see that on every single call we do, you're sitting on your sofa and, mm. um, you know, you never tell us about anything you do socially. Would you like us to try and find a co-working space for you? Yeah. Uh, and I think that that should be the push. You know, hotels are now doing co-working. There are more co-working spaces opening up, and I think that is the way. Because we've got we've got also got to think about how we dovetail this into sustainability and environmental. I think as part of this, we've all we've all realised we don't need to commute at eight o'clock in the morning every morning. We, we we can do work at different times, and by by balancing out our commute, our travel, avoiding it where we can, we're not only we're not only saving ourselves money. We're saving ourselves time, giving ourselves a better quality of life, but we're also not sitting in traffic, burning petrol. We're not crowding trains out. So the whole transport network has got to reevaluate itself as well. And I was talking to someone yesterday who's in the sustainability and environmental space, who the rail companies have already, already recognised that they're going to be more focused on leisure in the future rather than rather than business travel. You, you look at all businesses in the city of London, they've already come to terms with the fact they're going to have to they're not there to be the lunchtime trade anymore. They've got to rethink about who their market's going to be, and maybe tourism uh, is going to be more relevant uh, because people aren't going to be queuing up on the Waterloo and City Line, packing themselves in shoulder to shoulder, nose to nose anymore. People have had eight months of not doing that. I don't want to go back to that. You don't want to go back to that. Nobody wants to go back to it. So I think we have to realise that the world is going to, going to work differently, and that's going to, and that's going to work. For electrification of vehicles, you know, Boris wants to bring it forward to 2030 now, get some of the, get some off the road, get people using public transport, get people using, uh, working differently, working more flexibly. So I, I think it, it is it's really important now to not think it's going to go back to as it was. How can we now, you know, we've pivoted, how do we start the new track? How do we carry the keys forward? Yeah. But I, I had another point in my head earlier. I, I think it's, it's Debbie wrote, um, what's it like being the only person in the room? And how is that for me as an experience? And we're going back to this, how tiring it can be to be the only person, to be the token. It, it, it is. And I was fortunate from very early on in this journey into the talent acquisition space to meet a couple of you know, our great friends, you know, Stephen, Bill, Ivan, Claire, uh, all the names that we, you know, we all know in our community. And they have been amazing friends first and foremost business business friends business colleagues and personal friends and i know bill hates the term ally uh, but allies is a great word you've been there amplified me so I, i've never truly felt alone yeah i've stood up i stood up at smart recruiters in uh, san francisco i emptied the stage for two days there's six or seven hundred people in the room probably a thousand twelve hundred people and i was probably one of the only if not a minority of open and out trans people in the room I've, I've, I've spoken on the stage at Unleashed and other places like that. And I, I know Unleashed, some of the people who work for Mark are, are, are trans themselves. I've actually met a couple of them. They've come up to me afterwards and go, oh, Joe, it's fantastic to have a trans person here being visible. We're kind of stealth. We, we, don't, we don't let on the trans. So, yes, it, sometimes it is a bit of a pressure because I don't represent women. I don't represent trans people. I don't represent anybody. I speak for myself. I, all I can say is this is how I feel. But, yeah, it is sometimes, it, it, is, it is difficult sometimes when you know that as I said, the stat, 76% of people haven't got a problem with trans people, but that means 24% of people do. 
So if I'm in a room of, if I'm in a room of a thousand people, I know that 24, 240 of those people actually may be questioning who I am. Um, it's also this, this sequential coming out. I don't come out once, I come out every time I meet somebody. So we've met before, but there are people on this call who maybe never met me before. So I've had to, I've now got to create a first impression to everybody. And, and when I go to conferences, you know, I, I emceed your stage once at the, in the uh, UK recruiter. So there's a whole, whole, whole room full of people there who probably never met me before. So I, I had to come out to them as well and be open about it. So there is that kind of pressure. The more I do it, the more I forget about it. Yeah. But it's still still kind of right back here somewhere. Where it's, always, it's always there. And that's no different to other people with neurodiversity or to black people who are black. Um, they, everyone has this, this kind of this double thinking, this protection, this safety. Am I going to get discriminated against? I think that um, the, the thought, though, as, um, as an individual who knows that every time you meet um, a large group of people or people who you're going to have to interact with in a business nature, that, do, you know, do you actively, do you have like certain terminology that you word into your conversation as kind of like, this is my subtle way of, of saying who I am, and this is my statement way of saying who I am, and I'm going to make a judgment as to what I'm going to use? Um, yeah, I think inevitably you, you, you become adaptive. You, 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 we're, we're all sorry chameleons and we, we talk about bringing a whole self to work, but we bring different parts of ourselves to different situations. Yeah. It's no different to being having a parent hat, having a, a, um, a sibling hat or a, or a daughter hat. We, we all wear different hats. So sometimes when we're in, in work, I, I, I know that I have to behave in a certain way, you know, if I'm if I'm enjoying the after party with Claire and, and, and myself and having and friends, I'll, I'll I'll maybe relax into myself. Um, but when I'm on stage, I'm I'm being very business like, very proper. When I do my podcast, when I do my training, I I, I bring down a screen as we all would. And I'm not saying it's exa any more exhausting than anybody else trying to put a professional persona on. But yes, yeah, sometimes I am conscious that my my characteristic of being trans adds another dimension. But the as I, as I said to you, I'm professionally trans. I personally have the privilege and luxury of not hiding that fact. It's part of who I am. But there are many people out there who don't want to be trans first. They don't even want to be trans at all. They're, 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 just, they're just, I'm a man, I'm a woman, uh, I'm non-binary. That's who I am. I, and I don't want to debate that. Whereas I, by the very nature of the fact I'm professionally trans, it almost invites people to want to ask me questions. And those questions can uh, can become tiresome, they can become repetitive, and sometimes they become, they, they do overstep the mark. Uh, and it's random. You know, I've, I've sat on trains and I've, I've sparked up a conversation with somebody on the train, and you think, oh, that's a really pleasant conversation. Then the last thing they sort of say is, oh, by the way, what was your old name? And I thought, we were doing so well. We were doing really well. And you had to ask me that question at the end. Why, why does it matter? Why did you need to know? Or I'm in the, I'm in the, in the queue at, at, at Sainsbury's checking out. And the lovely person in this incident was a, was a woman, and she says, says, oh, hi, how are you doing? Did you see that program on trans people the other night on telly? And I thought, well, thank you for making, thank you for, thank you for showing some empathy, thank you for showing care, and thank you for finding a bit of conversation you think I'd be interested in. But what you basically say is, I've now worked out you're trans. I, I've now decided to bring that to your attention, that I know you're trans. And whatever myth I had about feeling great about myself that day, it always comes back to the fact I'm trans. So sometimes the well-meaning intentions, and I've got you know, a circle of friends like yourselves, I often get a text or a message on Facebook or a messenger with, oh, have you seen this article on this trans person? I thought, yes, funny enough, I don't spend all my life reading about articles about trans people around the world or whatever. Um, I'd much rather find out about the Canon M50 Mark II that's launching and, and whether that's going to be great for remote speaking or not, or whether I can get 4K output on it. That's probably more of interest to me. But yes, it, it, yeah, I smile nicely and say, thank you very much. I appreciate the article. Um, how would you feel about if you got an article every day about prejudice just white men are feeling in the workplace? And I keep, keep sending those to you. How would you feel about that? So yeah, it, it's just it's thinking about, think of me as a person and understand my interests and what makes me happy, what makes me sad, and not focusing on the obvious trans, black, Asian, 
Muslim and, and, and every, all the conversations are based around trying to be nice. It's about raising your cultural intelligence to be able to have conversations with people that are more than just the obvious. It slightly comes back to that lazy point again, I think. Um, I see what Debbie says. So you can hear my dog barking now because I've got an Amazon delivery. Um, Debbie's saying um, this is why these important, these conversations are really important. Um, and absolutely. And the fact that you, you say you don't represent trans people, but the fact that you are very happy to have these open conversations which inform others um but, but you're right is that, that people will continue to bring it back to the thing they think you're interested in so um i've got a friend who's got twins this is not the same at all but it's an example of how lazy people are and when the twins were little every time she went out someone would ask her what she would class as a lazy question so are uh, and, and intrusive are they natural um and um regularly if they were you know boy and a girl are they identical twins? Um, so you know stuff which is um, you know and, and how big were when you were how big were we, were you? What is stretch marks like? Stuff which is that both lazy and intrusive. Um, and I think that it, yes. Oh my god, <laughs> that's a question I've had, and I haven't even had twins. Um, so I think that, that a certain extent it is just that we ought to all just try a little bit harder in the way in which we communicate with other people to to not be lazy and one track i mean i i, tell, I, t I think i told this joke on the comedy night at, at true london is that i was i was out with bill uh in brick lane with with i think i can't remember it was that time it might have been mark coleman and and with the barber of, of, of monty you know like you do it after hours and uh we're chatting away and before long bill bless him started comparing his broken nose and how many stitches he'd had in his broken nose and before long the, the entire group around us were all comparing how many stitches they'd had in their broken noses and the fights they got into and I thought oh, boys and boys in their toys or thing and then a week later no word of a lie I was in Brick Lane not in, not in Monty's but in, in one of the yards down there the open yards uh, with a group of women after a, a women's networking event and we were sat around the table and the subject got on to childbirth and number of stitches they had <laughs> after childbirth. I thought men talk about the stitches they nose and women talk about the stitches they after childbirth. I thought it's just a fight of passage, isn't it? We're, we're just we're just different into the body, uh, and we all have our own thing we talk about. I just thought I just thought sitting there in myself, just just chuckling on the inside of this, this sort of the irony of the conversation, and they happened a week apart in the same venue. Thanks, <laughs> babe. Oh, I can't hear you. I was going to say, it's always a bit disappointing uh, yeah. when um, we realise we fulfil a stereotype. I think that is always, you know, when I'm in a group of women and we get onto a subject like that, I'm just like, can we, can we not? I know we are. I know I started it. Can we not? Um, and I guess that that's, that's the kind of, the, the thing that happens globally, isn't it? Is that mm -hmm. we go back to the conversations we're most comfortable with um, and sometimes they are inappropriate, ill thought out. Um, so, but, yeah, but they're, they're familiar. I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's only when you're a fly on the wall where those conversations are kind of, I suppose, in the, in the, in the men's case, I was kind of trying not to join in because I, I've probably got my own conversations I could have had there. And, and no doubt you have, Louise. You've probably, you've probably started time with you. Uh, maybe got a bit angry than you should for somebody. Um, but then to be in a similar situation where I felt a bit of an outsider with the men I, and I felt a bit of an outsider with the women. And it was kind of interesting to be this kind of comfortable in neither, neither space. Mm -hmm to be able to join into either conversation as 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 I wanted to. And it, it, it made me feel different, but it also made me, maybe give me a perspective on the two conversations that I wouldn't have had had I been in them. So yeah, it, it is interesting sometimes. And I, I, I've I mean, taken this one step further. I mean, I, I've one thing I didn't realize in my old life is the amount of unwanted attention that women often get in, after work scenarios and it's only with my new awakening my new wokeness about my gender and, and, and the world did i really observe that behavior and how at a certain time of night a, a certain pattern emerges and i start to understand why many women start drifting off at 9 9 30 because by the time that <laughs> by the time it gets to 10 10 30 the behaviour changes and, and it's not as, as fun and friendly as it was an hour before. So, yeah, I, I think there's still this, this sexism, yeah, for whatever better word, it's a good word, um, 
and the way that men treat women in those social situations after work. And I'm not saying all men, and I wouldn't dare to say it's all men, but the, the behaviour does, does, does display itself in a crowd big enough and and you're nodding, so I'm guessing that I'm not. I'm not speaking. No, well, we we talked about something in the work environment very recently on one of these shows with Debbie and Katrina Collier and Andrew Gritz about um, you know sexism, inappropriate attention to women in the business place, um, which was it, it's just so depressing to happen. But but essentially, what we're seeing here is there's lots of unpleasant behaviours, and oh, some yeah. of them are okay. some of them are accidental. They are. Um, Years and years of just the, the you know um, habit socialization habits, yeah yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, and I guess that brings us back to this topic which is some of this is just you know a, a lack of awareness of what you're actually doing and how you actually mm. need to behave so we're at fifty minutes now and um, I did want to ask you a couple of questions about other stuff you're doing yeah yeah please say that carry so, on yeah. you mentioned the podcast earlier do you want to just briefly just get me on the things you've got the podcast and a few other yes yeah, so I, I lost the podcast. Oh, that's super slick. And I thought actually now it's probably a good point to return back to us here um, because they're going to go and ask a load of other questions. The uh, working lunch was due to finish at, um, at quarter two, which is why I'm happy to, to, to cut it in short. Um, Elizabeth is here joining us, who was obviously has to be saying, we need to get in and do this thing. And I don't disagree, but I was being good. Oh, look, Jim's here. I thought Jim was staying with his friends. Oh, OK. Hello, Jim. I'm on both. I'm, I've got a, I can multitask, really? you see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyhow, Elizabeth, it's your show. You have got, um, we're five minutes late for this thing, which I think probably helps. What I will do is I will make sure that we bring David in and then we can um, crack on with it. So let's do that now. Uh, there we go. David's coming in. Well, it was funny because, you know, so I'm excited to have uh, David joining us. I've got my thesis out from back in the day when I was doing intercultural psych and got intercultural psych diagnostics on because this is a subject I'm always excited about. And uh, David Everhart is uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, we met a couple of years ago at, a, um, at an Iventive conference. And then since then, uh, we've actually started up a working group on learning and talent in the COVID era. And one of the real aspects is um, here around inclusivity. How are we looking at different, um, creating different spaces as things change as perhaps some sort of uh, the, the shadows uh, in terms of what hasn't been dealt with around dispersed teams is becoming more and more into the forefront. So I'm excited to um, have David here today talking about the, the research that he's been doing around um, looking through a global lens and uh, what is the global mindset. So welcome, okay. David. Thanks, can you, can you hear me okay, first of all? Yep, can hear you right. perfectly. Can you so somehow you? My, uh, my neighbor and the, and the house behind me decided this was a good time to start a construction project. So. <laughs> <laughs> if it gets to be noisy, I've got headphones that I can, I can put on. But no, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to participate. And it's also been interesting to listen to um, a lot of the rest of this conversation. Um, so, you know, just very quickly, you know, my lens that I look at this, this question of diversity, equity, belonging, yeah. um, inclusion through is, is through what does it look like from a global perspective? And, mm -hmm. you know, I've been a... As you and I, as you know, Liz, I've been um, thinking about this a lot um, uh, for the past several years, I would say. And, um, you know, for, and I guess the first thing I would say is that um, I'm, a, I'm a, an unapologetic believer in the value of globalization, provided that it's done respectfully yeah. and responsibly. And to me, it's, it's that aspect of it that's critical, I think, in this conversation. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I would just say that um, to me, the global lens, so a lot of the conversation, I think, correctly today has focused around what does, you know, what is uh, diversity, equity, what belonging, what does that look like from a UK perspective? What does it look like within the organizations we work in? I'm really interested also, most of my work, um, I, I've, you know, American, obviously, as is Liz. Um, should we apologize for our nationality? <laughs> maybe maybe it's less apologetic this week than it was. <laughs> it was three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> what a what a stressful <laughs> month it's been. Um, but uh, and I spent a lot of my career actually in East Asia. So I'm, I'm really interested in how organizations look at their, their talent kind of holistically, uh, not just in one place, but are they, do people in the whole system have the same opportunities or not? So that's a big part of, I guess, my, my focus and my interest. Well, and I think that that's really one of those key points is, you know, you've had a long career uh, in learning and development and talent development as of I, and one of those, those key pieces is what you just said is, do we have the equal opportunity globally rather than, okay, who's sitting in headquarters, all of a sudden they're filling up the succession plans. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. So how do we really understand what, uh, what the talent looks like? How are we developing? What are we doing so that there really is that focus on um, what is a, a global talent development? What is specific to particular markets? How are we understanding what globalization can be if done in a respectful manner and really with the intent to listen, to understand uh, and to work together to say, okay, how can we use our beautiful plurality to bring something different that we otherwise with perhaps a more myopic lens uh, wouldn't even be able to see? Right, and I think, you know, interestingly, I was, I was really interested, and I think it was um, Asma earlier made this comment about working for companies where no one at the board level um, looked like me, or yeah. looked like anyone other than someone yeah. like me, actually. You know, <laughs> a, a straight yeah. middle-aged white guy, right, who happens to be fairly tall. Um, I sort of check all of those, mm -hmm. those privileged boxes in many ways, and um, I'm, I was just, um, one of the things I often do when I'm working, I work most, mostly, as you know, with big multinationals. And one of the first things I do, uh, there's, a, there's a, a US multinational, I'm doing a, a project, an inclusion and diversity project for currently, and had a conversation yesterday about, well, what should we be doing at the senior executive level? And um, so I looked at their annual report I look at who are their ex, you know, who's on the executive committee for this $17 billion company that has uh, about 40% of its revenue comes outside of Western Europe and the US. So, mm -hmm. and the fastest growing part of their business, which is true for most companies is, is actually out there in the world, particularly in fast growing markets in Asia Pacific. Well, the answer is they have, they have uh, 15 people on their, on their executive committee there's one woman, uh, the rest are, and all of them, including the woman, they're all, they're all Caucasian. Uh, so my first test is, well, you failed there. Right? <laughs> so yeah. you have a lot of opportunity for mm -hmm. increasing the diversity of your team. Um, and then you go, in most organizations, you know, you go down a few levels and things get a bit more diverse. And the question is, how do you, how do you create some momentum for that diversity yeah. to come to the surface, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and a, another friend of ours, um, and I, yours and mine, I was speaking with the other day, he's the head of HR for a big global um, uh, automotive company, and he runs all of the international markets outside of the US. And um, he and I were commiserating that, uh, I met him actually in Shanghai years ago, and this company has, thousands, tens of thousands of employees uh, in Asia. And they, they, all of the senior leadership roles in Asia Pacific, almost all of them now, I think when the first, when I first went to see them, all of them were American mm -hmm. um, and two Brits, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's a bit more diverse, but you know, they have these people show up, they come for three years, you know, kind of expats. Yeah. Um, they're measured on the performance of their business over a three year period, and then they go home. Yeah. And they have no incentive really to develop local talent. So three years from now, they look around, they say, hmm, mm -hmm. do we have a local person? You know, someone actually who's Chinese, right? <laughs> or, or exactly. Indian. Yeah. We can promote into these roles. Yeah. Gee, I wonder why we don't have anyone who's ready, right? Yeah. Right. So, and, and he, he and I were talking about the lack of, the lack of, uh, of incentive often for people mm -hmm. to create successors who don't look like them in these roles. And so that to me is a, kind of at a senior level is a big, is a big part of the issue. And you kind of scratch your head and go, I think we're doing a lot around inclusion and diversity. Why don't we look more diverse? And um, yeah. you know, it's a complicated answer, mm -hmm. but, but that's part of it anyway. 
Well, and it is truly part of it because it's that piece of um, how are we looking just beyond, um, you know, the, you know, how are we having an inclusive um, hiring process or these, you know, really the kind of the piecemeals to say, how are we looking at more systemically and what are the things that we reward you know, if we, you know, within three years, how am I building up my successor? Unless that's part of my performance <laughs> objective, uh, it's not going to happen. So here, how are we using it, you know, more systemically and systematically to say, let's, what is our approach to really, truly empower and understand that it's not just a short, short term and what are our co-responsibilities to say, if we want it to happen, how do we help ensure that it actually does happen? Right. And it's, um, you know, it, and it, I think another part of the problem is simply stated, and this is a generalization, but, but I actually have a lot of, there's a lot of evidence to back this up. Most, most corporate leaders who, in, who have global responsibilities from a global mindset perspective aren't qualified for their roles. <laughs> in other words, to me, they don't have, I, I have a pretty specific, um, definition I, I use for defining does a person have an inclusive mindset or not and um, the, this particular instrument that I use that I use and I've been doing over the past three months uh, I probably I probably had 60 or 70 people that I've personally kind of debriefed on this assessment and most of them are in the middle of this mm -hmm. developmental pathway they're they're neither uh, ex super exclusionary Area, nor are they uh, consistently inclusive in how they look at other people. That's a big problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right? and, yeah. and one thing I can also tell you is that level within organizations has almost no correlation. It has some, but not a very strong correlation with level of inclusive mindset. So, you know, there's a lot of work there. And I think part of it is we have to redefine what we mean by inclusive what do we mean when we say a, a person with a global mindset or a person who leads inclusively? Um, they're, they're, they're good in definitions for inclusion and diversity and equity, but, but there aren't necessarily um, consistent definitions for what's the mindset I need to have um, to be qualified for these sorts of roles to make sure that I'm actually creating belonging and, and psychological safety and all these things we mm -hmm. know are important. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, I couldn't agree more. Like I said, I was looking at my old stuff from like 1993 as to what are those, some of those definitions. And it's, and like you said, you know, how am I creating psychological safety, a sense of belonging? What does that truly mean? How am I listening? All of those aspects. So what for you comes into that global mindset and being an inclusive leader? What are the things that you've kind of captured within the definition that you've been working with? So to me, people go through, they actually go through, um, you know, we talk about, you know, there's values that I think mm -hmm. you know, really inclusive leaders must have. Um, in the center, I would put respect. Mm -hmm. To me, there's five core values that I think are common mm -hmm. to executives I know who have a really de well-developed and inclusive way that they lead globally. And respect to me sits in the middle. Um, do I have the ability, even if I'm not fluent or familiar with somebody else's cultural background, I don't speak your language, but can I show up in a way that's open and respectful to you? And that also means I have to have humility, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I heard one of the, you know, one of the Obama or the, um, the Biden um, nominees yesterday say, you know, I think I, I need to have both humility and confidence. Those are two mm -hmm. of the other five yeah. values in my in my model yeah. right so uh, respect humility and confidence are critical so those you know there are some certain values that you have to you have to know what you don't know and mm -hmm. you have to assume when i was young i, I lived in japan my early in my career and, and i realized in the first day because i didn't speak japanese and no one spoke english where, where i lived and i realized the first day that i had no idea what was happening yeah i would sit all day in these meetings um, literally like six hours a day, I was in meetings with only Japanese people and it was all in Japanese. So I had to sit there and just observe people. And it was obvious that I had no clue what was going on. And that was actually, you know, both humbling, but it was also, it was so obvious that I didn't lot of, lose a lot of sleep over it. And I had a lot of motivation to try to figure out how to communicate. Right? 
So I, I think those sorts of imp- yeah. experiences actually are important, right? Have you been in a place where yeah. you were the total outsider? Exactly. You didn't yeah. know what was going on and had yeah. to figure out how to build respect and rapport in spite of that, that deficit. Right. Completely agree. Yeah. I, yeah, I totally echoes. When I first went to Italy, I didn't speak any uh, Italian except for, you know, what I had to learn for my, my SATs, like the root words and, you know, just sitting there smiling. And then once you become t- more cognizant of the language, realizing, oh, that's completely inappropriate to be smiling now. So some of these, also these nervous gestures, et cetera. So, you know, gaining in that that humility and that humbleness to say, okay, I'm learning, I'm in an independence phase. It's, it's part of how I grow and um, being welcomed in that you are a learner. And then also when you get to those different stages, having the actualization, once you become more adept and aware within that different cultural context as to what's appropriate, what's not. And that it's just unfortunately part of the learning process but also fortunately part of the learning process because you then become more aware of how are others coming in and how are you showing empathy for it's part of the process of um, be, of understanding what is this new situation and the acculturation that needs to happen. And if you've only been in an environment of socialization, be it your cultural, be it your work, what, whatever it is, it's very hard to understand that there can be a different perspective because you've never been brought to that edge of not being comfortable of understanding the gist, what's going on, et cetera, because you haven't been in that extreme of a situation to have to challenge your own, is this the way I'm understanding it? Am I perhaps interpreting in this out of a, a totally different lens, which within this context makes no sense and is not fit for purpose? Right. And, you know, I think it's, I've heard some of these stories, you know, from mm-hmm. others today. Um, it, it's painful to be the mm-hmm. other, to be other. It is. Right? Yeah. Yep. And I think for people who, who have, like me, who, you know, have all this privilege, mm-hmm. uh, it's actually important for us to have that experience at some yep. level. Of yes. course, it's different, right? Um, yeah. um, but uh, but being in that situation, which is really uncomfortable, <laughs> where mm-hmm. you're the person who doesn't look like anyone else, and you're the one who doesn't understand what's going on, um, that's I think it, it's a necessary and important experience for any I think any leader at a global a global level to to have. And you know I. Um, uh, so that's that's a, a piece of it. I also believe that people go through these distinct stages of development as they go towards inclusivity. And you mm-hmm. know, I work a lot with with consultants in the in diversity, uh, equity, inclusion space here in the, in Europe and the UK, and also where I live. I live in London, by the way. In case those of you out there didn't don't know that, um, uh, also in the U.S. And another, I think, important point is the lens of the contextual lens of where you live and work, the, the context of the, the conversation around mm-hmm. diversity and inclusion and equity is mm-hmm. different in different places. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that to me has also been, um, you know, these global projects I'm involved with um, recently have mostly been driven from the US headquarters of, of big multinationals and so I end up talking with people in India and, you know, Southeast Asia and China, Japan. Um, and how do you, how, is Black Lives Matter a relevant conversation for us to be having in Shanghai? Well, probably not, because people in your population, they don't have experience they can probably hang that conversation from. But they have other experiences exactly. yeah. within China that are that are equally valid to 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 talk about. So I think it's how do we have the right conversations is another part of this. So you mentioned that there are different stages, and I think that that will probably be really interesting. What are the stages that you would say are really important or they're kind of those hurdles as you continue to develop and see what is a more a global mindset? What does it truly mean? So what are some stages that you've been looking at? Yeah, so um, uh, if, um, so the first stage to me is what I will call a localist, 
And there are a lot of people who have leadership roles. You know, I, I could lead in Manchester a group of Brits, maybe a diverse group of Brits, but maybe we all have somewhat of a common cultural experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or in Kansas City, right? My family, my extended family is from, from the Midwest in the US. Um, that's, you know, that's, uh, and that kind of leader is important. You know, I'm a pillar mm -hmm. of the local community, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I may not need, or I don't think I need to understand all this stuff about cultural difference or what's happening in the world. The second stage is, is what I call a warrior. Um, our mutual friend calls us a colonist. Mm -hmm. So the colonialist who, who goes to another place, another part mm -hmm. of the world and thinks, I'm gonna run the business here in China just the way I ran it in London or in, in Detroit, Michigan, right? In the case of an auto industry, Mm -hmm. And we're going to run our production systems and I'm going to run my meetings just the way I know it works. And I know how to run a business. Don't tell me I don't. Right. So um, he and I were joking about this. Um, yeah. And and that person, him, his word is a colonialist or a colonist. I would maybe call him a warrior. So my, it's, a, it's a defensive posture where my way is better. I recognize yeah. cultural difference uh, and my way is better than your way. And a lot of this happens subconsciously, right? Mm -hmm. And this happens in, in race relations and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, gen, in gender orientation and other areas as well, um, yeah. too. So the, the warrior. Uh, the third stage is a universalist. It's a person who realizes, well, at the end of the day, we're all people. There's a, there's a humanity that's common to all of us. You know, I'm American, I have two kids. I have Japanese friends that have children. Mm -hmm. um, we, we want to take care of our families. We want to work hard. We want to be respectful to others. We must be more or less the same, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. that's way better than being, you know, the warrior, but mm -hmm. it also, it, it uh, oversimplifies very yeah. real differences. We, you yeah. know, this morning, the conversation about neurodiversity, our yeah. brains are literally wired differently, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we think differently. So that's a third stage. The fourth stage, and these are, to me, the last two stages are what I would call inclusive and global. Mm -hmm. So the fourth stage I, I call a catalyst. It's a, yeah. a person who has the ability to, very accepting of cultural difference. Um, I know what I don't know. I'm consciously incompetent, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I, I know to ask questions and I'm really interested and curious about other people who are different from me and I'm trying to understand them. And I have the ability to, to synthesize a group of people to all work, a diverse group, to work towards a common goal. That to me would be, that's a, a, a strong, inclusive global leader, yeah. would be that catalyst person. Mm -hmm. And then the final stage, and these, these people, I call them integrators. Um, mm -hmm. A person who, it's almost a transcendent leader who, who, who also recognizes that the whole system is interdependent, right? So yeah. a person who has a really strong sense of their own interdependence in and among other systems. So in order for me to, in order for us to, I have a, a friend, she's South African by birth and she ran a big business in Asia for a long time for, for a global brand. And she told me, she said, I used to go in the room and say, here's where we need to go. I can see, I can, we can paint a picture of where we need to go. I have no idea how we're going to get there <laughs> because you, you guys know, uh, I don't know. Yeah. How do we get yeah. there? And, and so yeah. this open question about how do we construct this future reality together? Exactly. And, mm. you know, my, my belief is, is that those integrator global, inclusive global leaders are 1%. Mm -hmm. five, you know, it's a very yeah. small percentage of all the executives I work with uh, in the last 30 years of my, my career. So it's, it's a rare skill set. And we need a lot more people like that, I would say. So anyway, those are my five stages. And if anyone's interested, I'm happy to talk to you about them. Um, they're, they're sort of a work in progress. But yeah. 
And I think it's so well said. And I think, you know, if I certainly, you know, my old role, I used to be a, um, responsible for talent. And that was one of our biggest things is this, this ask, we call them cowboys, um, the warriors. <laughs> um, and, and it was, okay, I'm doing this as part of my development step because I want to become X, Y, Z rather than, you know, here, how are you integrating? How are you understanding that the whole purpose behind this assignment is that you challenge your paradigms that you're, you know, how are you successful in a com in completely different context? How will we support you? And so, you know, I won't say ringing in those cowboys, but you know, that was one of the big discussions that we had in succession planning is, is this the right person that we want to be sending over? What are those messages that we're sending over when we're sending over these cowboys? Um, and to say here, as we look to what is that global mindset, it's, it's not, um, because this was also one of the discussions, it's not get rid of your worst people, it's get, send your best. Right. Um, and um, particularly, as you mentioned, you know, we're, uh, where are you growing? What are those big markets? And how are you understanding that those needs are going to be different? Having people who are absolutely unwilling to listen or even entertain that there can be a different way and a completely different neural network as to how do these things get combined is very damaging for business. And so having some of those discussions and arguments as you're, we're going into succession and planning is important as we think about, you know, what's the best overall for the team and what are the things that might be, be different or be helpful. I love your definition also of the universalist, universalist, because I think this also brings into, um, you know, this onto the scene, that question of love, love sees no color, which yeah. I also agree is very challenging because if you're saying I, I'm, you know, obviously we do. And that's one of the pieces of how do we understand that the color is beautiful rather than putting a pretend blind eye to it. Um, to say we're not all Stepford wives and that's not what we're trying to get to. And it comes from a good place, um, but how do we then, like you said, those towards those next two stages of the model, a catalyst, a catalyst as we know out of chemistry is something that ignites a spark, but does not dissolve itself while it does so. And so understanding that by giving to others, I'm not um, I'm not taking away from my power in that aspect. I'm gaining it in terms of, you know, here we're, we're coming together. We're seeing that there are different possibilities. We're looking at, you know, how am I consciously incompetent of a learning? Um, and perhaps then to that fifth element of the integrate, integrative, the, you know, the transcendental leader uh, who understands I can't do this alone. Leadership is a group sport. How are we co-creating and creating that atmosphere where there's psychological bravery also possible that, that you know, playing back into your, your values of the, the humility, you know, that confidence and humility, these are not, this is not a dichotomy. It's not either or, it's how are you able to oscillate and understand that that's part of you know how you show up so that people can find their voices particularly if they've had bad experience says before with people who are just there as a plug and play type of leadership role yeah i mean there's there's a lot to this and i think there's um i still believe that we're you know there's sort of i've decided they're kind of these three different communities that i've been working mm -hmm. with in mm -hmm. my career and the first one was the the intercultural community um, mm -hmm. How do we, you know, and it started many, many years ago for me, you know, the whole kiss, bow and shake hands. How do I behave in a way mm, that's yeah. totally acceptable to someone else? And then I realized quickly that, well, that might make me feel better for five minutes, but then I have no idea what the person across the table is actually thinking, right? Which mm -hmm. is yeah. more important. Um, yeah. And then the second, so that's that intercultural community is one or multicultural. Mm -hmm. The next one is, is the inclusion and diversity community. And what I found interesting is that the, the DEI community and the multi, the intercultural communities are often, they overlap, but they're actually not very integrated. So yeah. mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who work in one of those domains and don't know that much about the other. And that I mm -hmm. find kind of surprising. And I think that's something we actually need to fix. Totally the agree. third domain to me is leadership. 
And mm -hmm. I remember I used to work, um, as you know, for a big global, I was a senior partner for a big global consulting firm. And I thought, okay, these people are gonna be all over this, this intercultural stuff and realize they weren't. So they knew a ton about leadership development, um, mostly I would say through a Western lens. Mm -hmm. And they knew almost nothing, even kind of basics about, uh, about multiculturalism, kind of uh, from con yeah. country to country culture, mm -hmm cultural adaptation, and they knew zero, really, about the inclusion and diversity conversation. And this is going back now, you know, kind of 10 years. But the, 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 the um, intersection of those three domains to me, we need to spend a whole lot more time in, right? And that's where I, I guess I've chosen to spend, try to spend my time, right, in, 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 that, middle, in that middle space. But there, um, I think for um, people who work in the inclusion and diversity or DEI space or, mm -hmm. or DEBI space, um, having, you know, being broader about how, how are we looking at these things, mm -hmm. I think is helpful actually. Um, because sometimes we're actually blind to the contextual needs of a person who's from a different mm -hmm. part of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so being aware of, uh, of the, the context in these other places to, to me is really is, is actually becoming more and more important. Uh, I couldn't. Yeah. So well said, David. And I think that that is really, you know, quite often because you get the tools. You know, I remember when I was working at my company, they're like, oh, we have a tool for interculturalism. And right. it was exactly, you know, what do I wear? What do I do? And, you know, we, we compare profiles and then that's it rather than saying, okay, but that's very different than a constructive conflict of, you know, where do we have these various interests? You know, here we, it's not, we're, we're not in just one team, we're in multiple teams. Um, and it goes way beyond the cultural norms as to what do you do with your silverware um, to, to really going into more deep work of how are you really building up a, a team um, and understanding um, how people bring their voices in, how are you uh, also creating that space that it's not just um, one particular function as well. And I think, you know, oftentimes people talk about the national cultures. Now with agile, people are talking more about, you know, multidisciplinary cross teams. Um, these aspects are not exclusive to markers. These are, you know, these are aspects that as we look to your, the delta of, inter, of leadership, of DEI, of, um, of different cultural groups and norms, these are all aspects of, you know, how are we code switching depending upon what situation we're in? Are we taking an empathetic stance to, to maybe take three steps back to say, what does the user's user actually need in that particular market? So as we go through taking on those different lenses, it can really help to be able to even understand what do we need to do? Why do we exist as an organization? And how is our interplay um, going to be important for how we make our mark moving forward? Yeah, I think those are great points. I, you know, I also, I have a really strong belief in, in that you have to, in, expe in experience-based education. And, yes. mm -hmm. and I, you know, we talk about experiential learning and for mm -hmm. most people in the, in the learning and development field, it means let's do a simulation or yeah, true. to me, yeah. actually, um, you know, I want to know what it's, what is it like to be um, a, a disabled, per a, a person in a wheelchair? What's it like to be in London in a wheelchair? Well, it's pretty easy to actually, and I, I actually, I used to take care of a kid who had muscular dystrophy. I did that for mm -hmm. a year. And it was a totally eye-opening experience yeah. for me of how do people look at me? How do people look, mm -hmm. did people look at him? They ignored him, right? Um, and, and we went all over, this was in San Francisco. And, and so uh, um, I, I had this experience one day, I decided I'm gonna sit in a wheelchair and try to get myself around. Um, and it's, it's really hard. And it totally changes your view. You start noticing things that you never mm -hmm. noticed before, like, oh, there's a step there, right? Yeah. Yeah. That you would never, so I think that for people to really understand um, what it's like for people who are different, there's a, 
it's not that hard actually, I think, to create kind of experiential learning mm -hmm. opportunities. And you don't actually have to go to a class to do a lot of this stuff. You can do it yourself, but people yeah. don't because yeah. we don't want to feel uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a what, I'm, what I'm hoping to do in the last kind of quartile of my career, since I'm mm -hmm. getting older, is how do, we, how do we give people that kind of visceral, emotional yeah. experience? And I can tell you, you know, everyone's been to a million meetings and we've forgotten 95% of them. We'll never think about them again. But there's always that one or two, what are those things you remember from 10 years ago? And it's yeah. usually a story or it's an experience that I mm -hmm. had. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think we need to just do a lot more uh, with that, with experience-based learning so people can feel what it's like to, to be different. Yeah, I yeah. couldn't agree more. And then, yeah, making it real. And it, it doesn't need to be a class. It can be just, you know, here, how my, you know, uh, Tim Ferriss talks about uh, it in his book of, you know, just go to a coffee shop and then lie down on the floor and then see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, and it, you know, it's incredible. I, I had a, I ran this senior executive program for a big company. And we, we spent a week um, at their headquarters every year and a week in China. Mm -hmm. And we go to China and I'd say, and these people are in this, in this transportation industry and I'd say, well, how are we going to understand transportation here in Asia? And I said, well, let's go ride the subway. In fact, better yet, here's a subway map. Why don't you go ride the subway and come back in an hour? Here, here, here's where I want you to go and come back from. And I want them, let's talk about your experience. And the corporate person said, no, it's not safe. Yeah. And I said, well, you, you have like... 20,000 of your own employees riding the subway system every day. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so, so th there are some things I think that we, we, we don't realize how ridiculous it sounds when we're, you know, we're talking about. Them. But yeah. I, anyway, I think there's just a ton more we could all be doing to how do we experience difference um, in a more visceral way to try to understand what that feels like. I couldn't agree more. And I think sometimes even just setting out the smallest markers. So like you said, our, our friend, you know, um, here, how are you setting meeting times? Is it everything according to what's going on with corporate within headquarters? Or are you paying attention to, okay, we have most of our, um, most of our employees in Asia. Let's try not to have a call at nine o'clock on a Friday night for them. So, you know, how are we shifting up the times? It can be as simple as that. And it can be as easy as that as to how are you showing respect or even just acknowledging the effort that has become quite often in multinational companies so self-explanatory that we forget that you know we have a diverse group of people. And so how can we, you know, just simple messaging, how are we making sure it's also in local language? And and giving that that respect of understanding of we are one team, different locations, different functions, different needs. How and then what brings us together and, and paying attention and tuning to that. Right. And listening. So I the last international trip I took before mm -hmm. the lockdown, I was in Japan and um, I was having a meeting with a big pharma company and I was talking to their in, it's a global company and their their um, their their head of diversity inclusion for Asia. And she said to me, she said, you know, we have this really well intentioned global initiative right now. Um, driven from our execs, chief executive, that's about, called it's called Speak Up. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is to give people, to encourage people to express their opinions and to mm -hmm. tell us what they think. And she said, you know, and that's all well and good, but in this market in Japan, what we really need them to do is listen up, right? Yeah. So she had this whole view mm -hmm. of, you know, help me, David, to uh, ha help me, drive that message into how we think it's mm -hmm. because speak up is great it's also a western idea right mm -hmm. yep. let's all be direct in our communication mm -hmm. and that's the best way to be and that's 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 actually an unconscious bias so how do we um how do we uh change the way we think about these things so I, anyway i thought that was a it was a great point that she made um and i have no idea how she's doing since i haven't seen her since uh, since February because of this silly lockdown, but um, I think it's a good point, right? About how, are we looking at things from different cultural viewpoints as we're suggesting them? 
Yeah, couldn't agree more as, you know, leadership plays out very differently of what is that social context locally and that socialization and how are you working within that? I always say, you know, in my old role to say, let's half standardize and say, okay, what are the principles we're trying to get across? But then how we do that locally, that has to fit to say, okay, are we, you know, how are we working towards that, those same principles and goals? Because then you get that, co, that co-creation and you get different solutions, which are beautiful that can be transferred elsewhere to say, how are we inspiring different ideas? Um, because it's that plurality of opportunity around how can we look at this? If the principles are the same, how you do it, that's not something I wanna to dictate to you. But I think that that's a lot of that unlearning as to case central office deployed and then implemented rather than saying, okay, how are we looking at what are we trying to accomplish? And then how can we accomplish it together? It's so true. And, and right now, you know, because we're all used to working remotely, mm -hmm. another conversation I had recently was company said, you know, we got to find a new head of learning and development. So I asked the question, well, where in the world is your, do you have the most pain points in your talent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, it's in, in Asia Pacific. And I said, well, where's the role going to be? And they said, oh, it's going to be in Cleveland. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, and I said, well, Okay, let, can we just back up a little bit? So <laughs> yeah. what, why can't you put the role, maybe that whole function should be, you know, in, 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 in Thailand or, or in Shanghai or in Singapore or in India. Um, if that's where the most activity for that function is happening, why not just have the function be there? Yeah. And uh, the person kind of looked at me and they said, oh, we're, we're not ready for that yet. You know, and I'm looking at the wall on all this stuff about inclusion and diversity and thinking, well, maybe you, maybe you need to challenge yourself a bit. Yeah. So I think, I think especially now, because we're, this is a great mm -hmm. opportunity to redefine where we have roles. They don't really need to be any particular place anymore, I would argue, right? Yeah. So yeah. anyway, it's, um, I, I'm looking forward to, to the next, uh, well, I'm looking forward to the end of lockdown, but I'm also looking forward to seeing how our uh, newfound competence at working remotely will change the way we look at these roles, especially leadership roles. They don't need to be all in one place. Couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. I love it. Thank you, David. Um, so last thing, how can people contact you and what, do you want, what are you going to be doing with your research? So, um, well, on LinkedIn, um, <laughs> I don't know, you can, you can tell me um, what is the best way to do this, but. Um, you can find me um, on LinkedIn, just David Everhart or Ionis okay. International, that, which is my little tiny company that I just um, just rebooted um, recently. And then I'm, I'm, my plan is I've started doing interviewing. I'm talking with um, global executives I know to try to round out and, and get feedback on, on my thinking about this. But it'll probably be a white paper and maybe some kind of a TED talk mm -hmm. um, to start with. But, but I'm hoping... If I, if I can get organized about it, it'll maybe be a book. I love, I love it. It's great. It's needed. And I think, like you said, the delta between these three areas is so necessary as we continue to move forward, as we look to opening innovation, as we open up this thinking of it's not just where you sit, it's how you interact and how you show up. Now, I'll just finally say it's been great to listen to all these stories today. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm just constantly amazed at how much I still need to learn about this, about this space. And, uh, and that's actually pretty, that's pretty exciting too. Couldn't agree more. Awesome. Well, thanks, David. And we will see each other at the latest at our group meeting. Indeed, we will. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Liz. Thanks, David. It was really cool. Thank, Thank you. Uh, That's cool. Marvellous. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bump you into, um, in a truly slick way, I'm going to do that and it makes you disappear from the screen. Ow. Hi, David. There you go. Look at that. Now, people. People. You know the thing that happens sometimes <laughs> where we just sit here now and just pause. I'm just going to do this faffing about a technical phrase. Elizabeth, you're going to I'm talk to me about... about uh, well, we haven't, got, oh, we haven't got our guest. We're a bit guest list. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Let me check my, my guest list. Um, so she should be here. Let We've certainly got, um, she's got the link um, yeah. and she's accepted it. She's also, also a really good sign because it means people have seen it. Oh. And she is usually, I know her, she is extremely timely. So 
la 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 ta 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 Jim, um, fill the void. Well, yeah, I knew you were going to say that, Marnie. I was waiting in the background for the wings there to do that. You see, guys, look, so far amazing. And the amount of things we've learned through the conversations, uh, I've been dipping in and out all day long and, and, and having, uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really pleased with the the content. I'm, I'm amazed at the guests and the feedback that we're getting on getting online from various people. Um People who are watching live, thank you for watching live. Mom, mm -hmm. again, thank you for watching live. Um, but yeah, uh, Elizabeth, how are you feeling? Because you've uh, you've been on and off a little bit today. So it's been awesome, Noah. It's been um, just the conversations. I think this this these aspects around how are we having a broader lens um, and thinking about these things differently. Looking at how are we not only saying, are you empowered and feel empowered, but how are we also seeing ourselves as empowered and taking our own voice and how that that has to grow in terms of our own maturity. And by seeing others, by having different representation and having these different conversations and bringing the different groups together, that that, that is a real boon and a real gain. Um, and so I think as we continue down this path, um, you know, from, you know, this R circle, which was you, you, you and Martin had decided, hey, let's do a couch show sometime at the beginning of the year, um, has developed to say, what is really needed is connection and real conversations. So how are we taking the time just to get a diverse group of people into a room and having different types of conversations um, is absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and I think the for, for me, the learning curve every time we jump on and listen to people from, you know, the chats first things with, with Charlie, Toby and Sam, right the way through to the chats with Theo and Dan and everyone else that have been on, every element and point of the show today has had something where I've gone, ah, that's something else. That's an interesting point. I know Joanne was talking a lot time about various things and comments were going on the bar on the working lunch uh, side chat there. And, you know, we, we talk about, I think Stephen brought up something about privilege as well, you know, and I think there's so many things that, that so demographics and people, you know, we don't even see the privilege that's right in front of our nose. You know, there's so many things that were just not obvious to us that we're privileged to be have to you know various elements and things so today has been great it's been great learning and I'm looking forward to uh, to the next guest wherever the no she Jim is Jim don't do that don't do that we haven't had the next guest that's the whole point we don't know she's not there at all not no, at all that's the whole point Jim that's why we're getting you to fill I'm filling I'm filling and I'm filling and running running out of energy because I wasn't prepared to fill this afternoon you oh, see God, oh you said I was going are you going to be Holly now if I'm going to be filled filled oh. fully. So, <laughs> oh, I just got her. Um, she will be. She had a slight uh, change, so she will be here within five minutes. So that's totally good. So, in this case, Jim, you've got to fill for five perfect. minutes. The good news is that means people don't get to hear you at three o'clock when you come to fill for a minute. Um, we can oh. do two things. We can we can chat and bore people. Or bore, I mean, what's your mum doing today? Is she all right? My mom's great. She's loving the show. Thumbs Thanks. up. Great in the background. Yeah. Trying to get, well, only social distancing. She would have the neighbours in joining as well, you see. So, uh, you know, that's all good. <laughs> uh, yes. Our one viewers. And then subscribing. Please, Paul, do subscribe. I can get my teeth back in at the moment. Um, you know, the chats today, go back over and view, go through. I know, Martin, you're going to be very cleverly, swiftly and doing your stuff. Yeah, we'll and chop editing it up into, into bite-sized chunks, I think is the phrase. Mm -hmm. Um, what I'm going to do is an awkward thing. We obviously talk, talk, not talked too much about fair share today. What I'm going to do is to um, just play another quick video from them. Yep. in really nicely. Um, and by which time I'm sure Cordelia will have joined us. How about that? Perfect. Yep. That means we can, uh, we can also just stay there. If I'm going to be super slick, let's do that. Oh, God, let's do that. You see, this is a magical thing. I tell you what, real television doesn't have to do this stuff. Oh, come on, it happened to Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> if one of us is Mariah Carey and choose your words carefully. People will get offended if it's not him. <laughs> if I do that and I do that. <laughs> and you have Mr. Bean on. I love it. There we go. 
Fairshare is the largest redistributor of surplus food in the UK. We work with over 11,000 charities helping to feed an incredible million people all across the UK. It makes life much easier. On a day-to-day -day basis, Fairshare receives food in from the food industry. We then package that up into orders for our charity members and then send it out on the road for them to turn it into meals. Without our volunteers, Fairshare wouldn't exist. They really, really are the people that make us work. I've been volunteering at Fairshare now for roughly two years. I'm a warehouse operative, that means picking orders for deliveries the next day and sorting food that comes in by trucks on a daily basis. I come from like an office environment and I find working here is, is much better than being stuck in an office all day. <laughs> I decided to volunteer for Fair Share because I've been unemployed for 15 years and I wanted to gain confidence and get to know what it's like to be in a workplace again. To do something like this, it's really rewarding, you know, and to see like where the food's going and the people that you meet and who they help, it feels great. It's a very friendly crowd here at Fair Share. There's a lot of laughter and quite a bit of banter. It's like a good detective. <laughs> it's a really fun place to work. You're giving something back and you get a tremendous sense of well-being in the process. We've got warehouse assistants, we've got drivers, we've got customer service and office-based people. No matter your skill set or your interests, come and volunteer for Fairshare. Yay, and I think that's a lovely charity that we can support. They said all the good work they're doing, particularly as you come into Christmas. It's a mm -hmm. Christmas like no other, a year like no other, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, people. No, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to say it's the three of us still, if that helps. Anyway, <laughs> She's always here. Uh, well, and the, the other thing I want, so I think fair share, and as we continue to look at how are we volunteering, what are we doing with our time, I also wanted to take the opportunity because today is also, I am wearing orange, um, and it's not without reason because today is, of course, the day as we look to um, violence against women, and violence against women is not only physical, it is also emotional, social, so how are we looking to empowering different voices is part of um, what we're doing at our circle, is to say, let's not get always the typical speakers, like, it, you know, we had a couple of first-time speakers, for example, Adva, so this aspect of how are we empowering voices, how are we bringing attention to things that perhaps otherwise wouldn't be known or um, foster awareness um, is really important. And then to come back to this aspect of violence against women, it is something that is really fraught with shame. So how are we making sure that um, here we're showing up for one another, we're supporting one another and we're trying and we're working to say, how can we reduce the stigma of the bravery it takes to get through it um, and that as as a community um, it's not just the women who are sticking up for each other it's also uh, men and it's this piece of how are we coming together united uh, to address the things that need to be addressed because one of the particular challenges of working remotely is the shadow pandemic of how um, both mental health issues have um, increased as well as domestic violence against women. So just wanted to also kind of shout out today um, is just one day there's this continues on, but as we bring awareness, um, not only to the good things that um, for example, Fair Share is doing, also having a lookout to, to your mom, <laughs> to your friends, to your wives, to your girlfriends, to everyone around to say, okay, how are we strengthening and empowering one another? And how are we reducing that stigma that you are not alone um, and that there are people who are here for you? Yeah. yeah, very good. I think it's it's all part of the day that we have today. It's not just today, as you said, Liz. It's 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 more than day, and there's more than just the the DNI element. There's a bigger picture and the equity and belonging and everything else that we spoke about and going to be speaking about later on. That you know, it's important for people to share, to stand up, to to have allyship, to give people a voice. And hopefully, that's what we're starting to do with our circle as well: yeah. is give other communities voices, give other speakers voices. Um, and I, I love the fact thing Emma was saying this morning about putting people into a you know, making them feel uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. you know, put them into a different comfort zone. I, I think that's been a, a common thread all the way through. Um, 
and there we have a fantastic Cordelia. Here we are. <laughs> so excited. I'm so happy to have my friend Cordelia here. Welcome, welcome. Um, so Cordelia, what are the wonderful things that I can say about this woman? She and I met uh, when we were in the waiting room to go on to Gary Turner's uh, podcast about uh, <laughs> vulnerability. Um, and there was a funny situation that happened there where we were missing one of our guests and we had started a little bit of a riff. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we're very creative in our ideas as to what could he be doing alternatively as to working with us to be on Gary Turner's show. And since then, I have been absolutely in love with this woman. Um, I have been impressed at every turn about how she shows up authentically. Um, so Cordelia Gaffar, if you do not know her yet, I you will get to know her here um, and you will get to love her here. Um, so this aspect of what we're going to be talking about today and where she has been um, really pivotal is how are we looking at ourselves? How are we loving ourselves? How are we embracing some of the things that uh, bring us rage? Um, but also how are we channeling that energy and saying, how can we use it um, for more positive good? Um, and really looking at how are we being, how are we showing up? Um, and that it's not just looking to the others. We can't control them, but what, what we can do is we can look at ourselves, our own responses, and say, how are we how are we taking ownership and embracing what's going on within ourselves? So welcome, Cordelia. So wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Liz. What a beautiful introduction. And yeah, that's so that is so on point. It's like I that I love the work that I do because I, of course, I'll do events like this where it's very, you know, cerebral and intellectual and we can talk all the theory, but then I do events once a month where, you know, it's an embodiment of those things. So this past weekend I had my embody joy retreat and like one of the things that came up for women, I was like, so like we didn't talk most of the event, right? Cause we were just like in our bodies. And so I was like, so what's come up for you today? And they're like, my body hurts, mm -hmm. but it feels so good mm -hmm. to, you know, really push your mm -hmm. self to the point of pain where you find the pleasure in it. And, and, and when we talk about, uh, you know, violence against women, I love your post today where you were talking about, uh, it's not always physical. It's mostly economic, like mm -hmm. violence against most people who are being dis discriminated against. It's mostly economic because you're forced to make economic choices that you otherwise wouldn't, which put you in compromising situations that become violent. And that enrages women, you know, that mm -hmm. enrages women of color in particular. And I was listening to, I didn't catch his name but there was a transgender person speaking earlier. And I mean, I'm sure it enrages them as well, right? Because you're in an economic situation where you can't um, do things that you have a human right to do. Yeah. yeah. So, but to your point, it's like you have a choice. You mm -hmm. can linger in that anger or you can find your joy and your humanness and, um, and show up more powerfully understanding um, the wisdom of having the courage to stand in your power anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, you know, it was, it, there was an old quote, I believe by Viktor Frankl of saying, you know, what is the last human kind of um, piece is, you know, that respect that your own self-worth, your respect for yourself and, you know, don't give that away because that's that's the last piece that you truly have. And so how do people, you know, find strength? It's that that aspect, do you see your own self-worth? And quite often, you know, as we, you know, like you said, mentioning about violence is not always physical. It's also that piece of also self-harm. Like, how do you see yourself? 
Do you see yourself as worthy? Do you see yourself as someone who's bringing in your voice and that you have a valid voice? And oftentimes it is a learning to how do you blend out those critical voices from the outside or oftentimes also very much from the inside and yes. our self defeating <laughs> or also, you know, you're not being good enough, whatever those stories are to say, how are you respecting yourself and giving yourself value is one of those most important first steps to be able to, to broaden your own power. Yeah. So you talk about, um, you know, one of your latest things when we were, you know, we were joking a little bit as to what do you want to talk about? So we're having this R circle day and then you texted me back like the best title ever. And um, which was the beauty of being a black Muslim woman married to an immigrant and raising six boys or something like that. Well, raise, like, raising, well, I have mostly girls, but th- yeah. we did squeeze in a couple of guys, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, I'm like, wait a minute, you have a lot of, you have really, really cute girls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, and to that aspect of how are you um, owning up with your own people, pieces of how do you choose to live your life? And so can you perhaps talk to me a little bit about how you learn to, you know, call it the beauty, because it is beautiful. Um, And, you know, going away from those little, uh, what are those shoe boxes of the shemata of, you know, I can put that in that category, in that category to say, hey, let's release that and say, how are we showing up and seeing the people for who they are? Yeah, I'm all about, you know, releasing what's expected and accepted. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned during the pregnancy of my fifth child, who was a girl, (laughs) Uh, that, you know, it's really, even though I had neatly uh, compartmentalized our life with the four children, two Mm -hmm. boys, two girls, you know, whatever, I had to embrace living in harmony as a mother and that that fifth child was gonna like offset the whole thing. So I had to like embrace harmony for a change mm-hmm. instead of this thing that we talk about balance. Mm-hmm. And that's, um, you know, so that's why I would say it's the beauty, right? So mm-hmm. I'm already a black woman in America, right? Yeah. But just to make things interesting or not, maybe just because I, the, the truth of the matter is because I went on a spiritual journey I chose to become Muslim. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other side of that was um, I happened to to find a a beautiful man who happened to be an immigrant. And um, and then we didn't really, you know, say we're going to have one or two kids. We were just let's just see what happens. Right. And so um, just living and loving life as humans have the right to do. Precisely. And, um, and then uh, September 11th happened two months after I chose to become Muslim. And then, you know, I guess a couple of years later, I chose to, to stay at home and homeschool my kids. So I was in a different grocery store dynamic, right? Because usually mm-hmm. it's like the hustle of the bustle after work. But now I was going to the grocery store like 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning and running into all the hmm, more like, uh, I guess, regular people, mm-hmm. right? I, I'm not going to take anything away from them. But, you know, I came into situations where on, on one aisle, my three-year-old son would knock over a display, right? Mm-hmm. Clearly he's brown. <laughs> and I have baby and baby carrier. And then my other Um, daughter who's just a little above being a toddler and then maybe a couple of hour aisles before there would have been a white woman baby in a baby carrier you know her three-year-old blonde eye yeah blonde eyed (laughs) blonde haired blue eyed child knocks over a display and everyone's rushing to help her Mm -hmm. right whereas on my aisle everyone's just like those people right and like everyone's kind of moving away and acting like they can't get down the aisle. And what do I do in that situation? I have a choice, right? I can be enraged 
And that's going to negatively affect the energy of my baby attached to my body. Mm -hmm. It's going to negatively affect the way my son feels about what just happened. Yeah. And, um, and also it's going to, you know, the, the negative energy that's already coming from the outside, right? It's going to match it and amplify it. Yeah. So what do I choose to do? Mm-hmm. First and foremost, for myself, and secondly, for the baby who's yeah. attached to me, right? And then for my son, who I don't want to do anything to add to lowering his self-esteem in that situation, I'm like, you're so silly. Get up from there. Here, let's go find someone that works at the store to clean that up for you. Yeah. Look yeah. up away from my children, smile at everyone who is scowling at us, yeah. and walk away. It takes a lot of bravery, it takes a lot of inner power to say, okay, how am I stepping outside of that initial reaction of, I can't believe you're not helping me? Why are you judging me like this? <laughs> To say, okay, how am I going to be the bigger person and make sure the result that I want to have for the baby on your chest, for your, for your son. Um, and also that, that aspect of what are the expectations of what you're going to do in this situation to say, how am I taking ownership for creating a different dynamic that's going to end up more positive, which it takes, takes also a lot of energy but it also is also a lot of power to say, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to let you be me shoved into that little hole that you're wanting me to be in. Yeah. And to be fair, sometimes I wouldn't tell the people at the store. I'd just let them find out because, you know, it's (laughs) like, look, I'm on a time crunch. I got to go and make food and <laughs> well, when, when you you were under time constraints and balancing in that energy constraint. <laughs> it wasn't that here's a snack. <laughs> no. no, I want my kids after especially after that very important point, I wanted to make sure that they had high quality nurse nurturing and nourishing food. So yeah, I would go home and actually cook really good food. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think, you know, oftentimes those, it's those little situations. And like you said, you know, here where you used to go grocery store shopping, it was probably after your job, you know, it was like, okay, it's five, six o'clock. There's a different dynamic. There are different people in the grocery store. And as you look to, you know, what are people used to seeing and what are they expecting? And, and that's why I think, you know, we, in our last conversation, we were talking also about the plurality and diversity of, you know, what do people see around them and what gets noticed as other or our experience and to say, how do we normalize for a lack of a better word that there are different strokes for different folks? (laughs) Imagine that. (laughs) <laughs> I, I just aged myself there so everyone you know if you don't get that no round, one noticed <laughs> go back to some 80s television and then you're right there with me <laughs> <laughs> so what are the things because you know you are raising um children and you mentioned that um you know september 11th happened very fairly um close to when you decided to become a Muslim. And these past years in the, under the Trump administration have been, I can only imagine, quite challenging. How have you found it within your power or within your situation to say, how do you choose to respond? And where do you put, or how do you channel that energy? Because that, that cortisone does come up, <laughs> that adrenaline does come up. Um, so how have you personally, um, dealt with that? Because it's not just you, it's also your role as a mother. Yeah. So personally, I protect my heart. I know what Mm -hmm. I can handle. So I, um, I do this funny thing. I I get my news through Trevor Noah. Sorry. I just, (laughs) (laughs) I'm right here with you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Right. You're a comedy person too. So like, If I want to, you know, like I'll have um, my friends telling me, oh, did you see the latest tweets? I'm like, no, I don't. And then actually, I've actually not been on Twitter too much these past four years. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And <laughs> um, yeah. so I will just, you know, maybe once or twice a week, check it out the, you know, through the lens of Tre Trevor Noah. However, mm -hmm. um, my son who is now almost 18 and one of my daughters is 16, they do actually um, watch the real news, right? If you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And they'll come to me and mom, what are we going to do about X, Y, and Z and blah? And I'm like, look, I said, first of all, you know, does it have to do, and this is like something for all of us to reflect on, is, is it something that you have personal control over in this moment? Is it affecting your life directly? And if it's not, your energy, you know, is not needed for that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, protect your heart by what you're viewing and what you're reading, protect your energy, by what it is that you can actually um, make a change with mm -hmm. and not spinning your wheels on stuff that just is frustrating, right? Yeah. It's like in your realm of living, mm -hmm. what can you do to change that? And, and I think the, the third part of this is, you know, you introduced the concept of allyship, right? Mm -hmm. So the third part is where do you have privilege and you can show up as an ally for somebody? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's my take on, on how to, uh, you know, to show up more powerfully and, and not stress myself out unnecessarily, because mm -hmm. if it's, it's, if it's not in front of you, it's not truly happening, but when it is in front of you, definitely don't ignore it. Yeah. Because that's a whole different kind of energy, right? Could not agree more. Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's taking that when it is directly in front of you. How are you having the bravery to say, okay, how can I choose to find a way that will help bring this forward in terms of a positive impact? So looking at your your locus of control and your sphere of responsibility to say, okay, what would be a more positive outcome? Um, and at the end of the day, what are the things I need to speak to um, so that you do have that energy? To I mean, I'll give you an example. And um, I try not to bring my kids too much into it. That's why I always tell that old story of my son, because like he's like pretty much an adult now. <laughs> but I mean, just between me and you and all the millions of people watching, <laughs> 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 I use my privilege as a mom, like, uh, you know, we'll go to the store or whatever. And he'll be like, mom, do you know, um, I'm going to just run in here real quick and, you know, look at some stuff, but, um, and, and I'll be right back. Right. Well, mm -hmm. he likes to wear hoodies and mm -hmm. he's really tall and he's really handsome. That's just a mom thing. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, right. And then of course we share the same complexion. Yeah. So, um, I kind of, he's like, you don't need to come. You can just stay in the car. I said, like, oh, no, no, I'm, you know, I might want something in that store. So what's really happening there is me being on the standby to use my privilege just in case someone looks at him the wrong way and misinterprets mm -hmm. his behavior because he's a lot like his mom, except for he's not 5'2 and a cute little pretty lady, mm -hmm. right? He's oh, like yeah. almost six feet tall. So um, when he does um, something similar to how dare you look at me like that, he doesn't smile, right? I'll mm -hmm. be like, <laughs> yeah. right? And he's yeah. just like, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I use my privilege in this way. And this happened recently when mm -hmm. we went to the store. So he, um, he actually walked in and he wasn't paying attention and he kind of knocked into somebody who happened to be the security guard of the store mm -hmm. and the yeah. security guard happened to side eye him. And so I was right behind him. And, you know, before the guy, oh, like his mouth was starting to open. I was like, hi, how are you? And he was like, um, hello, ma'am. And then I was like, um, you know, and I called my son's name. I was like, you know, look, can you go over there and see if you can see if they have sweatshirts? And then the guy was just like, he just shut up and just mm -hmm. looked the other way. Yeah. You understand? I mean, like, yeah this close yeah to a confrontation yeah yeah and i think you know it, it is very challenging the expectations of i of 
what are the associations of it's much harder and I talk about this with my with my sister is when does a cute young boy become a scary man and it's it's a horrible 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 challenge and to and absolutely important like you said if you have to protect and we have to protect our boys and especially our boys of color because it is particularly right now in the US a very very challenging time and we are furthering and fostering the conversation that has been a long time coming but <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's improved so how are yeah you are absolutely right. How are we using our privilege to, to make the situation that it doesn't escalate um, because we know it can happen in a blink uh, because the aggression is heightened, the expectations are heightened and we the dynamic and the social dynamic is very challenging. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, my other son is, um, you know, so my kids are multicultural. So my other son is a lot closer to your complexion, mm -hmm. right? And he's, he's not, you know, he's like 12. So he's not that tall yet. And people are still kind of like double taking like, oh, he's kind of cute, right? Yeah, yeah. So to answer your question, like, when does when do they become scary? I don't know if he'll ever become scary. Mm -hmm. And sadly, because of his complexion. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and these are, and this is where I think it's so important to say, and we talk about it openly and honestly, because it is a challenge. And this is what, um, as we've been throughout the day is oftentimes these things are uncomfortable and people pretend that they don't exist. But pretending they don't exist doesn't mean that they won't happen. And so particularly as we look to how are we showing up in allyship and that, you know, I mentioned it before, how I find love see no color as being very problematic. Um, because if we're pretending it doesn't exist, we're also pretending the challenges that people of color and particularly the darker you get, unfortunately, it, the harder it gets. Um, so how are we showing up for one another and making sure that, you know, yeah, I'm like, I'm anemic white. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and how, you know, how are we making sure of what can we do to diffuse situations, but also on the other hand, positively, proactively go into the conversation and say, hey, this is not okay. Are you aware of what you just did? Yeah. you know and that's do you part. see yourself <laughs> do you yeah. see yourself like seriously but it's that opportunity to you know unless people are talking about it in a constructive manner but also to say it can't just be the hate speech on the one hand that that gets out it also has to be that piece of how are we showing up how are we being brave towards one another and being allies where we need to be allies and using our privilege in a positive way and so that people can see yeah people are sticking up for me i have a value i have a worth and i am um, unfortunately being put into this box these people are helping me see that i don't have to stay in that box yeah well i mean there are like like two things on that Mm -hmm. um, I said this the other day in a session on allyship. I was like, so first and foremost, you have to love yourself up, right? So yeah. that when you go out, you yeah. are um, really radiating like serious love. And it would take exceptionally miserable individuals to combat that energy, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you show up like just in pure love for yourself, and then for everybody else, I mean, you can't help but have it for everybody else. Then it's just like, when I smile, I mean, and I think it's only happened maybe on two occasions where people will like actually look away because it's like, I don't know what's going on for them, but I'm like, I don't know who looks away from someone smiling. Like you could just smile back at the minimum. You don't have to say hi, but my goodness, you know? And then the other thing is just recognizing what is your privilege. And so that was a, a session I did the other day and um, letting people see, you know, what layers of privilege do you have? And, mm -hmm. and, you know, even for the white people in the room, white men, they were just like, oh, I didn't even realize I've got this other layer of privilege, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it's pretty obvious they've, they've pretty got a, a monopoly on privilege, but I mean, like, 
<laughs> um, like in this case, like a lot of their friend, their family members are Trump supporters, so they could actually show up yeah. in a Trump rally and just like collect lots of data. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so just being self-aware about, you know, your levels of privilege and, um, and being courageous for uh, other people <clears throat> and helping them in that way. That is, that is the only way we can um, change things, change the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also to Mel Melody Hobson, I, I just love mm -hmm. her TED talk. I, I think I posted yeah. the link a couple yeah. weeks ago. You have to be color brave, right? You cannot yeah. not see color because yeah. like color is so beautiful, like your beautiful rust orange that you have on today, my lovely turquoise, I don't even know what color this is. But you know, it's like, you gotta see color, not yeah. just with our clothes, but with human beings. And it's not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a beautiful thing if we allow it to be. I couldn't agree more. And that reminds me so much of what Lerato was saying of, you know, it's like, my, you know, how did I grow up? What were, what were my stories? What was I exposed to? What was my experience? And my experience and my purview doesn't take away from your experience or your point of view. And how are we allowing that? And I'm sorry, I use that word allowing. How are we seeing that that's completely valid and, and, and celebrating the fact that we do have these different perspectives, that we do have these different experiences and how can we build upon each other to gain a different perspective as to what can be. Um, so that, that aspect of how are we showing up in our own vulnerability or willing to go into areas where we're perhaps more vulnerable and seeing things out of a different lens is a huge opportunity for how are we being able to learn uh, to see those col colors braver, bravely um, and to show up for each other differently as well as for ourselves. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to present uh, slides. I didn't prepare slides for this, no, by good. the way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cool. I, I just thought it was such a human thing like it would take away from the humanity to have slides so yeah, yeah no perfect so what I wanted to talk about with you um, is you just came out with a new book okay mm. so yes um, so I'm very very proud of you I, uh, <laughs> Thank I you. completely and utterly respect this so um, talk me through a little bit about the book that you've been working on for um Oh, three years three years yes exactly so yeah how, what are you looking for in terms of what are the messages that you're conveying and why did you choose to um, write this book yeah thank you for that question I'm, I'm super proud of this book um, it's called detached love transforming your heart so that you can transform your mind mm -hmm. and um so three years ago, I was just like in a mastermind and I was talking and, you know, they asked, so what is it that you're trying to convey? And I said, well, that you can love in detachment. Yeah. And everyone in the room looked at me like I had 15 heads <laughs> and the facilitator was just like, no one's, that's not going to land for anyone ever. And I was like, okay. So that's what I did the next three years uh, between, you know, my workshops and one-on-one -on -one coaching and everything and just research about emotions mm -hmm. and how we process stress and stuff and living <laughs> right and just mm -hmm. living um because i knew i know just mm -hmm. from the things that we've been talking about earlier i can love in detachment right so it doesn't stop me from loving humanity or human beings in general the fact that I have to love myself up and kind of like prepare for a mm -hmm. boxing match to go to the grocery store, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm detached from whatever offenses that may come. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to love me and love humanity, yeah. right? Because I see that people um, are hurting, mm -hmm. you know, and we, and we are having, we are spiritual beings having a human experience but we most often don't recognize the spiritual side of us and it causes us pain. Yeah. And um, so, you know, 
in the book, I have, of course, uh, anecdotes, and then I have conceptual um, just information that people can process and try and implement and then activities that they can do to release and uh, what's expected and accepted mm -hmm. surrounding, you know, just the concept of, of love and is it okay to pour into yourself, right? I always talk about, I mean, my, my process, I call it replenish me, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a, this is another thing that it matters to be to love and detachment because otherwise you'll feel demonized, especially as a woman mm -hmm. um, to pour back into yourself. So. Yeah, exactly. Hi, Jim. Hi, how are you doing both you? Cordelia, fantastic. Been listening away in the background. Oof wonderful chat and uh, yeah sorry you came in a little late there um we're going to have to tie off i know martin's got to head out i've got to head out um we need to get the links to your book uh we need to get the links to toby's book earlier on today two two authors of books fantastic on the show um amazing everyone i think you know it's been a really great day of learning uh, i think it's been a day of of yeah, stepping back, um, mm. the privilege element you said, I think there's many things we all could take for granted in that, in that privilege mm -hmm. arena. Um, but I think, it's, uh, I think it's great talk, keep loving, keep sharing. Um, and everyone that has joined us today, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think Elizabeth Martin has made you the host as you had to fly away, I think. So we will, uh, we will stop the recording or do our usual little bit while we pause at the end so Martin can fantastically tie this all up in his editing skills, man of many skills, immersive skills, you could say. That's oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, I know. Nice. We've got these little, oh, the little, little same ways. Little this, yeah. There couldn't be a more perfect way to say this multi-generational. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, I couldn't agree more. So thank you so much, Cordelia. And I think, you know, we will continue this conversation. And as we, you know, today, um, it was a little brain hiccup from, um, from Jim saying, hey, we need to do something around, you know, diversity and inclusion that's different. And we went into a big discussion around allyship. And it, it, it is, as we continue to move forward as our circle and as a broader community, how are we bringing those different communities together of dog people and cat people and bird people? Um, so we had, we had a duck at our family. So, um, so I would just wanna say thank you to you as well to, as to all of our guests today. The conversations have been great and they will continue to carry forward. So you will see us on Twitter. Um, we're not orange in that aspect, we're, but we're orange in this aspect. Um, and we can't wait to see you as we continue in our circle. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Molly says bye as well. <laughs> bye. <laughs> And the doggy says bye. I love it. Yay. All right. Then I will stop the recording because I have the power. I love it. Okay. All but right. we're still live on YouTube. <laughs> I think. Yeah, there's a 20, 20 second delay. So we normally just, uh, yeah. <laughs> just sit here play with dogs. So one thing that you may not know about, um, about Jim is he was on Game of Thrones. Oh. <laughs> not with, not with, not with a dog. <laughs> not with the dog. Okay. Not That's with the, dog, the no. difference. Okay. <laughs> Didn't have hair, looked like the same as everybody else in the background, but yeah. One of those, one of those little things that you do. I don't talk about it that much. Honestly, <laughs> so there's a running joke like, you know, does Jim bring Resumo in or Game of Thrones? Does Martin talk about um, immersive? And I, for some reason, really am terrible about talking about transforming talent. I have to figure out how I, I remember to do those bombs. So, yeah. So if anyone wants to talk about total talent, universes, et cetera, how do we develop people? That's me. So, yeah. Yeah. So we've still got a, a thing that says live here on YouTube.